Book the Fifth, Chapter Five of The Fallen Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Fallen Leaves by Wilkie Collins. Book the Fifth, The Fatal Lecture. Chapter Five. Some men would have found it no easy task to console Phoebe under the circumstances. Jervy had the immense advantage of not feeling the slightest sympathy for her. He was in full command of his large resources of fluent assurance and ready flattery. In less than five minutes Phoebe's tears were dried, and her lover had his arm round her waist again, in the character of a cherished and forgiven man. "'Now, my angel,' he said. Phoebe sighed tenderly. He had never called her his angel before. "'Tell me all about it in confidence. Only let me know the facts, and I shall see my way to protecting you against any annoyance from Mrs. Sowler in the future. You have made a very extraordinary discovery. Come closer to me, my dear girl. Did it happen in Farnaby's house?' "'I heard it in the kitchen,' said Phoebe. Jervy started. "'Did anyone else hear it?' he asked. "'No. They were all in the housekeeper's room, looking at the Indian curiosities which her son in Canada had sent to her. I had left my bird on the dresser, and I ran into the kitchen to put the cage in a safe place, being afraid of the cat. One of the swinging windows in the skylight was open, and I heard voices in the back room above.' which is mrs farnaby's room whose voices did you hear mrs farnaby's voice and mr goldenhart's mrs farnaby jervy repeated in surprise are you sure it was mrs of course i am do you think i don't know that hard woman's voice she was saying a most extraordinary thing when i first heard her she was asking if there was anything wrong in showing her naked foot and a man answered, and the voice was Mr. Goldenhart's. You would have felt curious to hear more if you had been in my place, wouldn't you? I opened the second window in the kitchen, so as to make sure of not missing anything. And what do you think I heard her say? You mean Mrs. Farnaby? Yes, I heard her say. Look at my right foot. You see there's nothing the matter with it. And then, after a while, she said, Look at my left foot. Look between the third toe and the fourth. Did you ever hear of such an audacious thing for a married woman to say to a young man? Go on, go on. What did he say? Nothing. I suppose he was looking at her foot. Her left foot? Yes, her left foot was nothing to be proud of, I can tell you. By her own account, she has some horrid deformity in it, between the third toe and the fourth. No, I didn't hear her say what the deformity was. I only heard her call it so. And she said her poor darling was born with the same fault, and that was her defense against being imposed upon by rogues. I remember the very words. In the past days when I employed people to find her. Yes, she said her. I heard it plainly. And she talked afterwards of her poor lost daughter, who might be still living somewhere and wondering who her mother was. Naturally enough, when I heard that hateful old drunkard talking about a child given to her by Mr. Farnaby, I put two and two together. Dear me, how strangely you look! What's wrong with you? I'm only very much interested, that's all. But there's one thing I don't understand— what had Mr. Goldenhart to do with all this? Didn't I tell you? No. Well, then I'll tell you now. Mrs. Farnaby is not only a heartless wretch who turns a poor girl out of her situation and refuses to give her a character. She's a fool besides. That precious exhibition of her nasty foot was to inform Mr. Goldenhart of something she wanted him to know. If he happened to meet with a girl in his walks or his travels, and if he found that she had the same deformity and the same foot, then he might know for certain. All right, I understand, but why Mr. Goldenhart? 
because she had a dream that Mr. Goldenheart had found the lost girl, and because she thought there was one chance in a hundred that her dream might come true. Did you ever hear of such a fool before? From what I could make out, I believe she actually cried about it. And that same woman turns me into the street to be ruined, for all she knows or cares. Mind this! I would have kept her secret. It was no business of mine, after all, if she had behaved decently to me. As it is, I mean to be even with her, and what I heard down in the kitchen is more than enough to help me to it. I'll expose her somehow. I don't quite know how, but that will come with time. You will keep the secret, dear, I'm sure. We are soon to have all our secrets in common when we are man and wife, ain't we? Why, you're not listening to me. What is the matter with you? Jervy suddenly looked up. His soft, insinuating manner had vanished. He spoke roughly and impatiently. I want to know something. Has Farnaby's wife got money of her own? Phoebe's mind was still disturbed by the change in her lover. You speak as if you were angry with me, she said. Jervy recovered his insinuating tones with some difficulty. "'My dear girl, I love you. How can I be angry with you? You've set me thinking, and it bothers me a little, that's all. Do you happen to know if Mrs. Farnaby has got money of her own?' Phoebe answered this time. "'I've heard Miss Regina say that Mrs. Farnaby's father was a rich man,' she said. "'What was his name?' "'Ronald. Do you know when he died? No.' Jervy fell into thought again, biting his nails in great perplexity. After a moment or two, an idea came to him. "'The tombstone will tell me,' he exclaimed, speaking to himself. He turned to Phoebe before she could express her surprise, and asked if she knew where Mr. Ronald was buried. "'Yes,' said Phoebe, "'I've heard that, in Highgate Cemetery. But why do you want to know?' Jervy looked at his watch. "'It's getting late,' he said. "'I'll see you safe home. "'But I want to know. "'Put on your bonnet and wait till we are out in the street.' "'Jervy paid the bill with all needful remembrance of the waiter. "'He was generous, he was polite, "'but he was apparently in no hurry to favour Phoebe "'with the explanation that he had promised. "'They had left the tavern for some minutes, "'and he was still rude enough to remain absorbed "'in his own reflections. "'Phoebe's patience gave way.' "'I have told you everything,' she said reproachfully. "'I don't call it fair, dealing to keep me in the dark after that.' He roused himself directly. "'My dear girl, you entirely mistake me.' The reply was as ready as usual, but it was spoken rather absently. Only that moment he had decided on informing Phoebe, to some extent at least, of the purpose which he was then meditating." He would infinitely have preferred using Mrs. Sowler as his sole accomplice, but he knew the girl too well to run that risk. If he refused to satisfy her curiosity, she would be deterred by no scruples of delicacy from privately watching him, and she might say something, either by word of mouth or by writing, to the kind young mistress who was in correspondence with her, which might lead to disastrous results." It was of the last importance to him, so far to associate Phoebe with his projected enterprise, as to give her an interest of her own in keeping his secrets. "'I have not the least wish,' he resumed, "'to conceal anything from you. So far as I can see my way at present, you shall see it too.' Reserving in this dexterous manner the freedom of lying, whenever he found it necessary to depart from the truth, he smiled encouragingly and waited to be questioned." Phoebe repeated the inquiry she had made at the tavern. "'Why do you want to know where Mr. Ronald is buried?' she asked bluntly. "'Mr. Ronald's tombstone, my dear, will tell us the date of Mr. Ronald's death,' Jervy rejoined. "'When I have got the date, I shall go to a place near St. Paul's called Doctor's Commons. I shall pay a shilling fee, and I shall have the privilege of looking at Mr. Ronald's will.' "'And what good will that do you?' "'Very properly put, Phoebe. Even shillings are not to be wasted in our position. But my shilling will buy two sixpennyworths of information. 
I shall find out what sum of money Mr. Ronald has left to his daughter, and I shall know for certain whether Mrs. Farnaby's husband has any power over it or not. Well, said Phoebe, not much interested so far, and what then? Jervy looked about him. They were in a crowded thoroughfare at the time. He preserved a discreet silence until they had arrived at the first turning which led down a quiet street. "'What I have to tell you,' he said, "'must not be accidentally heard by anybody. "'Here, my dear, we are all but out of the world, "'and here I can speak to you safely. "'I promise you two good things. "'You shall bring Mrs. Farnaby to that day of reckoning, "'and we will find money enough to marry on comfortably "'as soon as you like.' "'Phoebe's languid interest in the subject began to revive. "'She insisted on having a clearer explanation than this.' "'Do you mean to get the money out of Mr. Farnaby?' she inquired. "'I will have nothing to do with Mr. Farnaby unless I find that his wife's money is not at her own disposal. What you heard in the kitchen has altered all my plans. Wait a minute and you will see what I am driving at. How much do you think Mrs. Farnaby would give me if I found that lost daughter of hers?' Phoebe suddenly stood still and looked at the sordid scoundrel who was tempting her in blank amazement. "'But nobody knows where the daughter is,' she objected. "'You and I know that the daughter has a deformity in her left foot,' Jervy replied, "'and you and I know exactly in what part of the foot it is. There is not only money to be made out of that knowledge, but money made easily without the slightest risk.' "'Suppose I manage the matter by correspondence, without appearing in it personally. "'Don't you think Mrs. Farnaby would open her purse beforehand, "'if I mentioned the exact position of that little deformity, "'as a proof that I was to be depended on?' "'Phoebe was unable or unwilling to draw the obvious conclusion even now. "'But what would you do,' she said, "'when Mrs. Farnaby insisted on seeing her daughter?' There was something in the girl's tone, half fearful, half suspicious, which warned Jervy that he was treading on dangerous ground. He knew perfectly well what he proposed to do, in the case that had been so plainly put him. It was the simplest thing in the world. He had only to make an appointment with Mrs. Farnaby for a meeting on a future day, and to take to flight in the interval, leaving a polite note behind him to say that it was all a mistake, and that he regretted being too poor to return the money. Having thus far acknowledged the design he had in view, could he still venture on answering his companion without reserve? Phoebe was vain, Phoebe was vindictive, and, more promising still, Phoebe was a fool. But she was not yet capable of consenting to an act of the vilest infamy in cold blood. Jervy looked at her, and saw that the foreseen necessity for lying had come at last. "'That's just the difficulty,' he said. "'That's just where I don't see my way plainly yet. Can you advise me?' Phoebe started and drew back from him. "'I advise you?' she exclaimed. "'It frightens me to think of it. If you make her believe she is going to see her daughter, and if she finds out that you have robbed and deceived her, I can tell you this. With her furious temper, you will drive her mad.' Jervy's reply was a model of well-acted indignation. "'Don't talk of anything so horrible!' he exclaimed. "'If you believe me capable of such cruelty as that, go to Mrs. Farnaby and warn her at once.' "'It's too bad to speak to me in that way,' Phoebe rejoined, with the frank impetuosity of an offended woman. "'You know I would die rather than get you into trouble.' "'Beg my pardon directly, or I won't walk another step with you.' Jervy made the necessary apologies with all possible humility. He had gained his end. He could now postpone any further discussion of the subject without arousing Phoebe's distrust. "'Let us say no more about it for the present,' he suggested. "'We will think it over and talk of pleasanter things in the meantime. "'Kiss me, my dear girl. There is nobody looking.' So he made peace with his sweetheart, and secured to himself at the same time the full liberty of future action of which he stood in need. 
If Phoebe asked any more questions, the necessary answer was obvious to the meanest capacity. He had merely to say, The matter is beset with difficulties which I didn't see at first. I have given it up. Their nearest way back to Phoebe's lodgings took them through the street which led to the Hampton Institution. Passing along the opposite side of the road, they saw the private door opened. Two men stepped out. A third man inside called after one of them. Mr. Goldenheart, you have left the statement of receipts in the waiting room. Never mind, Emilius answered. The night's receipts are so small that I would rather not be reminded of them again. In my country, a third voice remarked, if he had lectured as he has lectured to-night, I reckon I'd have given him three hundred dollars, gold, sixty pounds English currency, and have made my own profit by the transaction. The British nation has lost its taste, sir, for intellectual recreation. I wish you good evening. Jervie hurried Phoebe out of the way, just as the two gentlemen were crossing the street. He had not forgotten events at Tadmore, and he was by no means eager to renew his former acquaintance with Amelius. End of Book 5 Chapter 5book five the fatal lecture chapter six of the fallen leaves this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by rita boutros the fallen leaves by wilkie collins book five the fatal lecture chapter six Rufus and his young friend walked together silently as far as a large square. Here they stopped, having reached the point at which it was necessary to take different directions on their way home. "'I've a word of advice, my son, for your private ear,' said the New Englander. "'The barometer behind your waistcoat points to a downhearted state of the moral atmosphere. Come along to home with me. You want a whiskey cocktail badly.' "'No, thank you, my dear fellow,' Emilius answered a little sadly. "'I own I'm downhearted, as you say. "'You see, I expected this lecture to be a new opening for me. "'Personally, as you know, I don't care two straws about money. "'But my marriage depends on my adding to my income, "'and the first attempt I've made to do it has ended in a total failure. "'I'm all abroad again when I look to the future.' and I'm afraid I'm fool enough to let it weigh on my spirits. No, the cocktail isn't the right remedy for me. I don't get the exercise and fresh air here that I used to get at Tadmore. My head burns after all that talking tonight. A good long walk will put me right, and nothing else will. Rufus at once offered to accompany him. Emilius shook his head. Did you ever walk a mile in your life when you could ride? he asked good-humouredly. I mean to be on my legs for four or five hours. I should only have to send you home in a cab. Thank you, old fellow, for the brotherly interest you take in me. I'll breakfast with you tomorrow at your hotel. Good night. Some curious prevision of evil seemed to trouble the mind of the good New Englander. He held Amelia's fast by the hand. He said very earnestly, it goes against the grit with me to see you wandering off by yourself at this time of night. It does, I tell you. Do me a favor for once, my bright boy. Go right away to bed. Emilius laughed and released his hand. I shouldn't sleep if I did go to bed. Breakfast tomorrow at ten o'clock. Good night again. He started on his walk at a pace which set pursuit on the part of Rufus at defiance. The American stood watching him until he was lost to sight in the darkness. "'What a grip that young fellow has got on me, in no more than a few months,' Rufus thought, as he slowly turned away in the direction of his hotel. "'Lord send the poor boy may keep clear of mischief this night.' Meanwhile, Emilius walked on swiftly, straight before him, careless in what direction he turned his steps, so long as he felt the cool air and kept moving." His thoughts were not at first occupied with the doubtful question of his marriage. The lecture was still the uppermost subject in his mind. 
he had reserved for the conclusion of his address the justification of his view of the future afforded by the widespread and frightful poverty among the millions of the population of london alone on this melancholy theme he had spoken with the eloquence of true feeling and had produced a strong impression even on those members of the audience who were most resolutely opposed to the opinions which he advocated without any undue exercise of self-esteem he could look back on the close of his lecture with the conviction that he had really done justice to himself and to his cause the retrospect of the public discussion that had followed failed to give him the same pleasure his warm temper his vehemently sincere belief in the truth of his own convictions placed him at a serious disadvantage towards the more self-restrained speakers all older than himself who rose one after another to combat his views more than once he had lost his temper and had been obliged to make his apologies more than once he had been indebted to the ready help of rufus who had taken part in the battle of words with the generous purpose of covering his retreat no he thought to himself with bitter humility i'm not fit for public discussions if they put me into parliament to-morrow i should only get called to order and do nothing he reached the bank of the thames at the eastward end of the strand walking straight on as absently as ever he crossed waterloo bridge and followed the broad street that lay before him on the other side he was thinking of the future again regina was in his mind now the one prospect that he could see of a tranquil and happy life with duties as well as pleasures duties that might rouse him to find the vocation for which he was fit was the prospect of his marriage what was the obstacle that stood in his way the vile obstacle of money the contemptible spirit of ostentation which forbade him to live humbly on his own sufficient little income and insisted that he should purchase domestic happiness at the price of the tawdry splendor of a rich tradesman and his friends and regina who was free to follow her own better impulses regina whose heart acknowledged him as its master bowed before the golden image which was the tutelary deity of her uncle's household and said resignedly love must wait still walking blindly on he was roused on a sudden to a sense of passing events crossing a side street at the moment a man caught him roughly by the arm and saved him from being run over the man had a broom in his hand he was a crossing sweeper i think i've earned my penny sir he said amelius gave him half a crown the man shouldered his broom and tossed up the money in a transport of delight here's something to go home with he cried as he caught the half crown again have you got a family at home amelius asked only one sir said the man the others are all dead she's as good a girl and as pretty a girl as ever put on a petticoat though i say it that shouldn't thank you kindly sir good night amelius looked after the poor fellow happy at least for that night if i had only been lucky enough to fall in love with the crossing sweeper's daughter he thought bitterly she would have married me when i asked her he looked along the street it curved away in the distance with no visible limit to it arrived at the next side street on his left amelius turned down it weary of walking longer in the same direction whither it might lead him he neither knew nor cared in his present humour it was a pleasurable sensation to feel himself lost in london the short street suddenly widened a blaze of flaring gaslight dazzled his eyes he heard all round him the shouting of innumerable voices for the first time since he had been in london he found himself in one of the street markets of the poor on either side of the road the barrows of the costermongers the wandering tradesmen of the highway were drawn up in rows and every man was advertising his wares by means of the cheap publicity of his own voice fish and vegetables pottery and writing paper looking-glasses saucepans and colored prints 
all appealed together to the scantily filled purses of the crowds who thronged the pavement one lusty vagabond stood up in a rickety donkey cart knee-deep in apples selling a great wooden measure full for a penny and yelling louder than all the rest never was such apples sold in the public streets before sweet as flowers and sound as a bell who says the poor ain't looked after cried the fellow with ferocious irony when they can have such apple sauce as this to their loin of pork here's knobby apples here's a penorth for your money sold again hello you you look hungry catch there's an apple for nothing just to taste be in time be in time before they're all sold emilius moved forward a few steps and was half deafened by rival butchers shouting buy 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 to audiences of ragged women who fingered the meat doubtfully with longing eyes a little farther and there was a blind man selling stay-laces and singing a psalm and beyond him again a broken-down soldier playing god save the queen on a tin flageolet the one silent person in this sordid carnival was a lascar beggar with a printed placard round his neck addressed to the charitable public he held a tallow candle to illuminate the copious narrative of his misfortunes and the one reader he obtained was a fat man who scratched his head and remarked to emilius that he didn't like foreigners starving boys and girls lurked among the costermongers barrows and begged piteously on pretense of selling cigar lights and comic songs furious women stood at the doors of public houses and railed on their drunken husbands for spending the house money in gin a thicker crowd towards the middle of the street poured in and out at the door of a cookshop here the people presented a less terrible spectacle they were even touching to see these were the patient poor who bought hot morsels of sheep's heart and liver at a penny an ounce with lamentable little mouthfuls of peas pudding greens and potatoes at a halfpenny each pale children in corners supped on penny basins of soup and looked with hungry admiration at their enviable neighbors who could afford to buy stewed eels for twopence everywhere there was the same noble resignation to their hard fate in old and young alike no impatience no complaints in this wretched place the language of true gratitude was still to be heard thanking the good-natured cook for a little spoonful of gravy thrown in for nothing and here humble mercy that had its one superfluous halfpenny to spare gave that halfpenny to utter destitution and gave it with right goodwill Amelius spent all his shillings and sixpences in doubling and trebling the poor little pennyworths of food, and left the place with tears in his eyes. He was near the end of the street by this time. The sight of the misery about him, and the sense of his own utter inability to remedy it, weighed heavily on his spirits. He thought of the peaceful and prosperous life at Tadmore, were his happy brethren of the community and these miserable people about him creatures of the same all-merciful god the terrible doubts which come to all thinking men the doubts which are not to be stifled by crying oh fie in a pulpit rose darkly in his mind he quickened his pace let me get out of it he said to himself let me get out of it end of book five Chapter 6、Section 24, Book 6, Filia Dolorosa, Chapter 1, The Fallen Leaves by Wilkie Collins. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Chapter 1 Amelius found it no easy matter to pass quickly through the people loitering and gossiping about him. There was greater freedom for a rapid walker in the road. He was on the point of stepping off the pavement 
when a voice behind him, a sweet, soft voice, though it spoke very faintly, said, Are you good-natured, sir? He turned and found himself face to face with one of the saddest sisterhoods on earth, the sisterhood of the streets. His heart ached as he looked at her. She was so poor and so young. The lost creature had, to all appearance, barely passed the boundary between childhood and girlhood. She could hardly be more than fifteen or sixteen years old. Her eyes of the purest and loveliest blue rested on Emilius with a vacantly patient look, like the eyes of a suffering child. The soft oval outline of her face would have been perfect if the cheeks had been filled out. They were wasted and hollow and sadly pale. Her delicate lips had none of the rosy color of youth, and her finely modeled chin was disfigured by a piece of plaster covering some injury. She was little and thin. Her worn and scanty clothing showed her frail, youthful figure still waiting for its perfection of growth. Her pretty little bare hands were reddened by the raw night air. She trembled as Emilius looked at her in silence with compassionate wonder. But for the words in which she had accosted him, it would have been impossible to associate her with the lamentable life that she led. The appearance of the girl was artlessly virginal and innocent. She looked as if she had passed through the contamination of the streets without being touched by it, without fearing it, or feeling it, or understanding it. Robed in pure white, with her gentle blue eyes raised to heaven, a painter might have shown her on his canvas as a saint or an angel, and the critical world would have said, here is the true ideal. Raphael himself might have painted this. You look very pale, said Emilius. Are you ill? No, sir, only hungry. Her eyes half closed. She reeled from sheer weakness as she said the words. Emilius held her up and looked round him. They were close to a stall at which coffee and slices of bread and butter were sold. He ordered some coffee to be poured out and offered her the food. She thanked him and tried to eat. I can't help it, sir, she said faintly. The bread dropped from her hand. Her weary head sank on his shoulder. Two young women, older members of the sad sisterhood, were passing at the moment. She's too far gone, sir, to eat, said one of them. I know what would do her good if you don't mind going into a public house. Where is it, said Emilius, be quick. One of the women led the way. The other helped Emilius to support the girl. They entered the crowded public house. In less than a minute, the first woman had forced her way through the drunken customers at the bar and had returned with a glass of port wine and cloves. The girl revived as the stimulant passed her lips. She opened her innocent blue eyes again in vague surprise. I shan't die this time, she said quietly. A corner of the place was not occupied. A small empty cask stood there. Emilius made the poor creature sit down and rest a little. He had only gold in his purse, and when the woman had paid for the wine, he offered her some of the change. She declined to take it. I've got a shilling or two, sir, she said, and I can take care of myself. Give it to simple Sally. You'll save her a beating, sir, for one night at least, said the other woman. We call her simple Sally because she's a little soft, poor soul. Hasn't grown up, you know, in her mind since she was a child. Give her some of your change, sir, and you'll be doing a kind thing. All that is most unselfish, all that is most divinely compassionate and self-sacrificing in a woman's nature was as beautiful and as undefiled as ever in these women, the outcasts of the hard highway. Amelius turned to the girl. Her head had sunk on her bosom. She was half asleep. She looked up as he approached her. Would you have been beaten tonight, he asked, if you had not met with me? Father always beats me, sir, said simple Sally, if I don't bring money home. He threw a knife at me last night. It didn't hurt much. It only cut me here, said the girl, pointing to the plaster on her chin. One of the women touched Emilius on the shoulder and whispered to him, He's no more her father, sir, than I am. She's a helpless creature, and he takes advantage of her. If I only had a place to take her to, he should never set eyes on her again. Show the gentleman your bosom, Sally. 
She opened her poor, threadbare little shawl. Over the lovely girlish breast, still only growing to the rounded beauty of womanhood, there was a hideous blue-black bruise. Simple Sally smiled and said, That did hurt me, sir. I'd rather have the knife. Some of the nearest drinkers at the bar looked round and laughed. Amelius tenderly drew the shawl over the girl's cold bosom. For God's sake, let us get away from this place, he said. The influence of the cool night air completed simple Sally's recovery. She was able to eat now. Amelius proposed retracing his steps to the provision shop and giving her the best food that the place afforded. She preferred the bread and butter at the coffee stall. Those thick slices piled up on the plate tempted her as a luxury. On trying the luxury, one slice satisfied her. I thought I was hungry enough to eat the whole plateful, said the girl, turning away from the stall in the vacantly submissive manner which it saddened Amelius to see. He bought more of the bread and butter on the chance that her appetite might revive. While he was wrapping it in a morsel of paper, one of her elder companions touched him and whispered, There he is, sir. Amelius looked at her. The brute who calls himself her father, the woman explained impatiently. Amelius turned and saw simple Sally with her arm in the grasp of a half-drunken ruffian, one of the swarming wild beasts of low London, dirtied down from head to foot to the color of the street mud, the living danger and disgrace of English civilization. As Amelius eyed him, he drew the girl away a step or two. "'You've got a gentleman this time,' he said to her. "'I shall expect gold tonight, or else—' He finished the sentence by lifting his monstrous fist and shaking it in her face. Cautiously as he had lowered his tones in speaking, the words had reached the keenly sensitive ears of Amelius. Urged by his hot temper, he sprang forward. In another moment he would have knocked the brute down, but for the timely interference of the arm of the law, clad in a policeman's great coat. "'Don't get yourself into trouble, sir,' said the man good-humouredly. "'Now you, Hellfire, that's the nice name they know him by, sir, in these parts. Be off with you.' The wild beast on two legs cowered at the voice of authority, like the wild beast on four. He was lost to sight at the dark end of the street in a moment." "'I saw him threaten her with his fist,' said Amelius, his eyes still aflame with indignation. "'He has bruised her frightfully on the breast. Is there no protection for the poor creature?' "'Well, sir,' the policeman answered, "'you can summon him if you like. I dare say he'd get a month's hard labor. But don't you see it would be all the worse for her when he came out of prison?' The policeman's view of the girl's position was beyond dispute. Amelius turned to her gently. She was shivering with cold or terror, perhaps with both. Tell me, he said, is that man really your father? Lord bless you, sir, interposed the policeman, astonished at the gentleman's simplicity. Simple Sally hasn't got father or mother, have you, my girl? She paid no heed to the policeman. The sorrow and sympathy, plainly visible in Amelia, filled her with a childish interest and surprise. She dimly understood that it was sorrow and sympathy for her. The bare idea of distressing this new friend, so unimaginably kind and considerate, seemed to frighten her. "'Don't fret about me, sir,' she said timidly. "'I don't mind having no father or mother. I don't mind being beaten.' She appealed to the nearest of her two women friends. "'We get used to everything, don't we, Jenny?' Amelius could bear no more. It's enough to break one's heart to hear you and see you, he burst out, and suddenly turned his head aside. His generous nature was touched to the quick. He could only control himself by an effort of resolution that shook him body and soul. I can't and won't let that unfortunate creature go back to be beaten and starved, he said, passionately addressing himself to the policeman. Oh, look at her, how helpless and how young. The policeman stared. These were strange words to him. But all true emotion carries with it, among all true people, its own title to respect. He spoke to Amelius with marked respect. It's a hard case, sir, no doubt, he said. The girl's a quiet, well-disposed creature, and the other two there are the same. They're of the sort that keep to themselves and don't drink. They, all of them, do well enough as long as they don't let the liquor overcome them. 
Half the time it's the men's fault when they do drink. Perhaps the workhouse might take her in for the night. What's this you've got, girl, in your hand? Money? Emilius hastened to say that he had given her the money. The workhouse, he repeated, the very sound of it is horrible. Make your mind easy, sir, said the policeman. They won't take her in at the workhouse with money in her hand. In sheer despair, Emilius asked helplessly if there was no hotel near. The policeman pointed to Simple Sally's threadbare and scanty clothes and left them to answer the question for themselves. There's a place they call a coffee house, he said, with the air of a man who thought he had better provoke as little further inquiry on that subject as possible. Too completely preoccupied or too innocent in the ways of London to understand the man, Amelius decided on trying the coffee house. A suspicious old woman met them at the door and spied the policeman in the background. Without waiting for any inquiries, she said, All full for tonight, and shut the door in their faces. Is there no other place, said Amelius. There is a lodging house, the policeman answered more doubtfully than ever. It's getting late, sir, and I'm afraid you'll find them packed like herrings in a barrel. Come and see for yourself. He led the way into a wretchedly lighted by street and knocked with his foot on a trap door in the pavement. The door was pushed open from below by a sturdy boy with a dirty nightcap on his head. Any of them wanted tonight, sir? asked the sturdy boy the moment he saw the policeman. What does he mean? said Amelius. There's a sprinkling of thieves among them, sir, the policeman explained. Stand out of the way, Jacob, and let the gentleman look in. He produced his lantern and directed the light downward as he spoke. Emilius looked in. The policeman's figure of speech, likening the lodgers to herrings in a barrel, accurately described the scene. On the floor of a kitchen, men, women, and children lay all huddled together in closely packed rows. Ghastly faces rose terrified out of the seething obscurity when the light of the lantern fell on them. The stench drove Emilius back, sickened and shuddering. "'How's the sore place on your head, Jacob?' the policeman inquired. "'This is a civil boy,' he explained to Emilius, and I like to encourage him. "'I'm getting better, sir, as fast as I can,' said the boy. "'Good night, Jacob.' "'Good night, sir.' The trap door fell, and the lodging house disappeared like the vision of a frightful dream." There was a moment of silence among the little group on the pavement. It was not easy to solve the question of what to do next. There seems to be some difficulty, the policeman remarked, about housing this girl for the night. Why shouldn't we take her along with us, one of the women suggested. She won't mind sleeping three in a bed, I know. What are you thinking of, the other woman remonstrated. When he finds she don't come home, our place will be the first place he looks for her in. Emilius settled the difficulty in his own headlong way. I'll take care of her for the night, he said. Sally, will you trust yourself with me? She put her hand in his with the air of a child who was ready to go home. Her wan face brightened for the first time. Thank you, sir, she said. I'll go anywhere along with you. The policeman smiled. The two women looked thunderstruck. Before they had recovered themselves, Amelius forced them to take some money from him and cordially shook hands with them. You're good creatures, he said in his eager, hearty way. I'm sincerely sorry for you. Now, Mr. Policeman, show me where to find a cab and take that for the trouble I am giving you. You're a humane man and a credit to the force. In five minutes more, Amelius was on the way to his lodgings with simple Sally by his side. The act of reckless imprudence which he was committing was nothing but an act of Christian duty to his mind. Not the slightest misgiving troubled him. I shall provide for her in some way, he thought to himself cheerfully. He looked at her. The weary outcast was asleep already in her corner of the cab. From time to time she still shivered, even in her sleep. Amelius took off his great coat and covered her with it. How some of his friends at the club would have laughed if they had seen him at that moment. He was obliged to wake her when the cab stopped. His key admitted them to the house. He lit his candle in the hall and led her up the stairs. You'll soon be asleep again, Sally, he whispered. She looked round the little sitting room with drowsy admiration. What a pretty place to live in, she said. Are you hungry again? Emilius asked. 
She shook her head and took off her shabby bonnet. Her pretty light brown hair fell about her face and her shoulders. I think I'm too tired, sir, to be hungry. Might I take the sofa pillow and lay down on the hearth rug? Emilius opened the door of his bedroom. You are to pass the night more comfortably than that, he answered. There is a bed for you here. She followed him in and looked round the bedroom with renewed admiration of everything that she saw. At the sight of the hairbrushes and the comb, she clapped her hands in ecstasy. Oh, how different from mine, she exclaimed. Is the comb tortoise shell, sir, like one sees in the shop windows? The bath and the towels attracted her next. She stood looking at them with longing eyes, completely forgetful of the wonderful comb. I've often peeped into the ironmonger's shops, she said, and thought I should be the happiest girl in the world if I had such a bath as that. A little pitcher is all I have got of my own, and they swear at me when I want it filled more than once. In all my life I have never had as much water as I should like. She paused and thought for a moment. The forlorn, vacant look appeared again and dimmed the beauty of her blue eyes. It will be hard to go back after seeing all these pretty things, she said to herself, and sighed, with that inborn submission to her fate so melancholy to see in a creature so young. You shall never go back again to that dreadful life, Amelius interposed. Never speak of it, never think of it any more. Oh, don't look at me like that. She was listening with an expression of pain and with both her hands lifted to her head. There was something so wonderful in the idea which he had suggested to her that her mind was not able to take it all in at once. "'You make my head giddy,' she said. "'I'm such a poor, stupid girl. I feel out of myself, like when a gentleman like you sets me thinking of new things. Would you mind saying it again, sir?' "'I'll say it tomorrow morning,' Amelius rejoined kindly. "'You are tired, Sally. Go to rest.' She roused herself and looked at the bed. Is that your bed, sir? It's your bed tonight, said Amelius. I shall sleep on the sofa in the next room. Her eyes rested on him for a moment in speechless surprise. She looked back again at the bed. Are you going to leave me by myself, she asked wonderingly. Not the faintest suggestion of immodesty. Nothing that the most profligate man living could have interpreted impurely showed itself in her look or manner as she said those words. Emilius thought of what one of her women friends had told him. She hasn't grown up, you know, in her mind since she was a child. There were other senses in the poor victim that were still undeveloped, besides the mental sense. He was at a loss how to answer her, with the respect which was due to that all-atoning ignorance. His silence amazed and frightened her. Have I said anything to make you angry with me? she asked. Emilius hesitated no longer. My poor girl, he said, I pity you from the bottom of my heart. Sleep well, simple Sally, sleep well. He left her hurriedly and shut the door between them. She followed him as far as the closed door and stood there alone, trying to understand him and trying all in vain. After a while, she found courage enough to whisper through the door, If you please, sir. She stopped, startled by her own boldness. He never heard her. He was standing at the window, looking out thoughtfully at the night, feeling less confident of the future already. She still stood at the door, wretched, in the firm persuasion that she had offended him. Once she lifted her hand to knock at the door and let it drop again at her side. A second time she made the effort and desperately summoned the resolution to knock. He opened the door directly. I'm very sorry if I said anything wrong, she began faintly, her breath coming and going in quick, hysteric gasps. Please forgive me and wish me good night. Emilius took her hand. He said good night with the utmost gentleness, but he said it sorrowfully. She was not quite comforted yet. Would you mind, sir? She paused awkwardly, afraid to go on. There was something so completely childlike in the artless perplexity of her eyes that Emilius smiled. The change in his expression gave her back her courage in an instant. Her pale, delicate lips reflected his smile prettily. Would you mind giving me a kiss, sir, she said. Emilius kissed her. Let the man who can honestly say he would have done otherwise blame him. He shut the door between them once more. She was quite happy now. 
He heard her singing to herself as she got ready for bed. Once, in the wakeful watches of the night, she startled him. He heard a cry of pain or terror in the bedroom. "'What is it?' he asked through the door. "'What has frightened you?' There was no answer. After a minute or two, the cry was repeated. He opened the door and looked in. She was sleeping and dreaming as she slept. One little thin white arm was lifted in the air and waved restlessly to and fro over her head. "'Don't kill me,' she murmured in low moaning tones. "'Oh, don't kill me!' Amelius took her arm gently and laid it back on the coverlet of the bed. His touch seemed to exercise some calming influence over her. She sighed and turned her head on the pillow. A faint flush rose on her wasted cheeks and passed away again. She sank quietly into dreamless sleep. Amelius returned to his sofa and fell into a broken slumber. The hours of the night passed. The sad light of the November morning dawned mistily through the uncurtained window and woke him. He started up and looked at the bedroom door. Now what is to be done? That was his first thought on waking. He was beginning to feel his responsibilities at last. End of chapter 1book six chapter two of the fallen leaves this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by rita boutros the fallen leaves by wilkie collins book six chapter two the landlady of the lodgings decided what was to be done. "'You will be so good, sir, as to leave my apartments immediately,' she said to Amelius. "'I make no claim to the week's rent. In consideration of the short notice, this is a respectable house, and it shall be kept respectable at any sacrifice.' Amelius explained and protested. He appealed to the landlady's sense of justice and sense of duty as a Christian woman." The reasoning, which would have been irresistible at Tadmore, was reasoning completely thrown away in London. The landlady remained as impenetrable as the Egyptian sphinx. If that creature in the bedroom is not out of my house in an hour's time, I shall send for the police. Having answered her lodger's arguments in those terms, she left the room and banged the door after her. Thank you, sir, for being so kind to me. I'll go away directly, and then perhaps the lady will forgive you. Emilius looked round. Simple Sally had heard it all. She was dressed in her wretched clothes and was standing at the open bedroom door, crying. Wait a little, said Emilius, wiping her eyes with his own handkerchief, and we will go away together. I want to get you some better clothes, and I don't exactly know how to set about it. Don't cry, my dear, don't cry. The deaf maid of all work came in. As he spoke, she too was in tears. Emilius had been good to her in many little ways, and she was the guilty person who had led to the discovery in the bedroom. "'If you had only told me, sir,' she said penitently, "'I'd have kept it secret. But there I went in with your hot water as usual, and, oh, Lord, I was that startled I dropped the jug and run downstairs again.' Emilius stopped the further progress of the apology." "'I don't blame you, Maria,' he said. "'I'm in a difficulty. Help me out of it, and you will do me a kindness.' Maria partially heard him, and no more, afraid of reaching the landlady's ears, as well as the maid's ears, if he raised his voice. He asked if she could read writing. Yes, she could read writing, if it was plain. Amelius immediately reduced the expression of his necessities to writing in large text. Maria was delighted. She knew the nearest shop at which ready-made outer clothing for women could be obtained, and nothing was wanted, as a certain guide to an ignorant man, but two pieces of string. With one piece she measured simple Sally's height, and with the other she took the slender girth of the girl's waist, while Emilius opened his writing desk and supplied himself with the last sum of spare money that he possessed. He had just closed the desk again when the voice of the merciless landlady was heard, calling imperatively for Maria. 
the maid of all work handed the two indicative strings to Emilius. They'll help you at the shop, she said, and shuffled out of the room. Emilius turned to Simple Sally. I'm going to get you some new clothes, he began. The girl stopped him there. She was incapable of listening to a word more. Every trace of sorrow vanished from her face in an instant. She clapped her hands. Oh, she cried, new clothes, clean clothes, let me go with you. Even Amelia saw that it was impossible to take her out in the streets with him in broad daylight, dressed as she was then. No, no, he said, wait here till you get your new things. I won't be half an hour gone. Lock yourself in if you're afraid, and open the door to nobody till I come back. Sally hesitated. She began to look frightened. Think of the new dress and the pretty bonnet, suggested Emilius, speaking unconsciously in the tone in which he might have promised a toy to a child. He had taken the right way with her. Her face brightened again. I'll do anything you tell me, she said. He put the key in her hand and was out in the street directly. Emilius possessed one valuable moral quality which is exceedingly rare among Englishmen. He was not in the least ashamed of putting himself in a ridiculous position when he was conscious that his own motives justified him. The smiling and tittering of the shop women, when he stated the nature of his errand and produced his two pieces of string, failed to annoy him in the smallest degree. He laughed too. Funny, isn't it, he said, a man like me buying gowns and the rest of it. She can't come herself, and you'll advise me like good creatures, won't you? They advised their handsome young customer to such good purpose that he was in possession of a gray walking costume, a black cloth jacket, a plain lavender-colored bonnet, a pair of black gloves, and a paper of pins, in little more than ten minutes' time. The nearest trunk-maker supplied a traveling box to hold all these treasures, and a passing cab took Emilius back to his lodgings, just as the half-hour was out. But one event had happened during his absence. The landlady had knocked at the door, had called through it in a terrible voice, "'Half an hour more!' and had retired again without waiting for an answer. Emilius carried the box into the bedroom. "'Be as quick as you can, Sally,' he said, and left her alone to enjoy the full rapture of discovering the new clothes. When she opened the door and showed herself, the change was so wonderful that Emilius was literally unable to speak to her. Joy flushed her pale cheeks and diffused its tender radiance over her pure blue eyes. A more charming little creature in that momentary transfiguration of pride and delight no man's eyes ever looked on. She ran across the room to Emilius and threw her arms round his neck. "'Let me be your servant,' she cried. "'I want to live with you all my life. Jump me up, I'm wild. I want to fly through the window.' She caught sight of herself in the looking-glass, and suddenly became composed and serious. Oh, she said, with the quaintest mixture of awe and astonishment, was there ever such another bonnet as this? Do look at it. Do please look at it. Emilius good-naturedly approached to look at it. At the same moment the sitting-room door was opened, without any preliminary ceremony of knocking, and Rufus walked into the room. It's half after ten, he said, and the breakfast is spoiling as fast as it can. Before Emilius could make his excuses for having completely forgotten his engagement, Rufus discovered Sally. No woman, young or old, high in rank or low in rank, ever found the New Englander unprepared with his own characteristic acknowledgment of the debt of courtesy which he owed to the sex. With his customary vast strides, he marched up to Sally and insisted on shaking hands with her. "'How do you find yourself, miss? I take pleasure in making your acquaintance.' The girl turned to Emilius with wide-eyed wonder and doubt. "'Go into the next room, Sally, for a minute or two, he said. "'This gentleman is a friend of mine, and I have something to say to him.' "'That's an active little girl,' said Rufus, looking after her as she ran to the friendly shelter of the bedroom. "'Reminds me of one of our girls at Cool Spring, she does. "'Well, now, and who may Sally be?' Emilius answered the question, as usual, without the slightest reserve. Rufus waited in impenetrable silence until he had completed his narrative, then took him gently by the arm and led him to the window. With his hands in his pockets and his long legs planted wide apart on his big feet, the American carefully studied the face of his young friend under the strongest light that could fall on it. 
no said rufus speaking quietly to himself the boy is not raving mad as far as i can see he has every appearance on him of meaning what he says and this is what comes of the community of tadmor is it well civil and religious liberty is dearly purchased sometimes in the united states and that's a fact amelius turned away to pack his portmanteau i don't understand you he said i don't suppose you do rufus remarked i am at a similar loss myself to understand you my store of sensible remarks is copious on most occasions but i'm darned if i ain't dried up in the face of this might i venture to ask what that venerable chief christian at tadmor would say to the predicament in which i find my young socialist this morning what would he say emilius repeated just what he said when Mellicent first came among us ah dear me another of the fallen leaves i wish i had the dear old man here to help me he would know how to restore that poor starved outraged beaten creature to the happy place on god's earth which god intended her to fill rufus abruptly took him by the hand you mean that he said what else could i mean amelius rejoined sharply "'Bring her right away to breakfast at the hotel,' cried Rufus, with every appearance of feeling infinitely relieved. "'I don't say I can supply you with the venerable chief Christian, but I can find a woman to fix you, who is as nigh to being an angel, barring the wings, as any she-creature since the time of Mother Eve.' He knocked at the bedroom door, turning a deaf ear to every appeal for further information which Emilius could address to him. "'Breakfast is waiting, miss,' he called out, "'and I'm bound to tell you that the temper of the cook at our hotel "'is a long way on the wrong side of uncertain. "'Well, Emilius, this is the age of exhibition, "'if there is ever an exhibition of, of ignorance "'in the business of packing a portmanteau, "'you run for the gold medal, "'and a unanimous jury will vote it, I reckon, "'to a young man from Tadmor. "'Clear out, will you, and leave it to me.' He pulled off his coat, and conquered the difficulties of packing in a hurry, as if he had done nothing else all his life. The landlady herself, appearing with pitiless punctuality, exactly at the expiration of the hour, smoothed her hard front in the polite and placable presence of Rufus. He insisted on shaking hands with her. He took pleasure in making her acquaintance. She reminded him, he did assure her, of the lady of the Captain General of the Cool Spring Branch of the St. Vitus Commandery, and he would take the liberty to inquire whether they were related or not under cover of this fashionable conversation simple sally was taken out of the room by emilius without attracting notice she insisted on carrying her threadbare old clothes away with her in the box which had contained the new dress i want to look at them sometimes she said and think how much better off i am now rufus was the last to take his departure he persisted in talking to the landlady all the way down the stairs and out to the street door while Emilius was waiting for his friend on the house steps, a young man driving by in a cab leaned out and looked at him. The young man was Jervy, on his way from Mr. Ronald's tombstone to Doctor's Commons. End of Book 6 Chapter 2「私は私の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族の家族 With a rapid succession of events, the day went on. The breakfast being over, rooms at the hotel were engaged by Rufus for his two young friends. After this, the next thing to be done was to provide Simple Sally with certain necessary but invisible articles of clothing, which Emilius had never thought of. A note to the nearest shop produced the speedy arrival of a smart lady. Accompanied by a boy and a large basket, there was some difficulty in persuading Sally to trust herself alone in her room with the stranger. She was afraid, poor soul, of everybody but Emilius. 
Even the good American failed to win her confidence. The distrust implanted in her feeble mind by the terrible life that she had led was the instinctive distrust of a wild animal. Why must I go among other people? She whispered piteously to Emilius. I only want to be with you. It was as completely useless to reason with her as it would have been to explain the advantages of a comfortable cage to a newly caught bird. There was but one way of inducing her to submit to the most gently exerted interference. Emilius had only to say, Do it, Sally, to please me. And Sally sighed and did it. In her absence, Emilius reiterated his inquiries in relation to that unknown friend whom Rufus had not scrupled to describe as an angel barring the wings. The lady in question, the American briefly explained, was an Englishwoman, the wife of one of his countrymen, established in London as a merchant. He had known them both intimately before their departure from the United States, and the old friendship had been cordially renewed on his arrival in England. Associated with many other charitable institutions, Mrs. Payson was one of the managing committee of a home for friendless women, especially adapted to receive poor girls in Sally's melancholy position. Rufus offered to write a note to Mrs. Payson, inquiring at what hour she could receive his friend and himself, and obtain permission for them to see the home. Amelius, after some hesitation, accepted the proposal. The messenger had not been long dispatched with the note before the smart person from the shop made her appearance once more, reporting that the young lady's outfit had been perfectly arranged and presenting the inevitable result in the shape of a bill. The last farthing of ready money in the possession of Emilius proved to be insufficient to discharge the debt. He accepted a loan from Rufus, until he could give his bankers the necessary order to sell out some of his money invested in the funds. His answer, when Rufus protested against this course, was characteristic of the teaching which he owed to the community. My dear fellow, I am bound to return the money you have lent to me, in the interests of our poor brethren. The next friend who borrows of you may not have the means of paying you back. After waiting for the return of simple Sally and waiting in vain, Amelia sent a chambermaid to her room with a message to her. Rufus disapproved of this hasty proceeding. Why disturb the girl at her looking-glass? asked the old bachelor with his quaintly humorous smile. Sally came in with no bright pleasure in her eyes this time. The girl looked worn and haggard. She drew Amelia away into a corner and whispered to him. I get a pain sometimes where the bruise is, she said, and I've got it bad now. She glanced with an odd furtive jealousy at Rufus. I kept away from you, she explained, because I didn't want him to know. She stopped and put her hand on her bosom and clenched her teeth fast. Never mind, she said cheerfully, as the pang passed away again. I can bear it. Emilius, acting on impulse, as usual, instantly ordered the most comfortable carriage that the hotel possessed. He had heard terrible stories of the possible result of an injury to a woman's bosom. "'I shall take her to the best doctor in London,' he announced. Sally whispered to him again, still with her eye on Rufus. "'Is he going with us?' she asked. "'No,' said Emilius. "'One of us must stay here to receive a message.' Rufus looked after them very gravely as the two left the room together. Applying for information to the mistress of the hotel, Emilius obtained the address of a consulting surgeon of great celebrity while Sally was getting ready to go out. "'Why don't you like my good friend upstairs?' he said to the girl as they drove away from the house. The answer came swift and straight from the heart of the daughter of Eve, 
"'Because you like him.' Amelius changed the subject. He asked if she was still in pain. She shook her head impatiently. Pain or no pain, the uppermost idea in her mind was still that idea of being his servant, which had already found expression in words before they left the lodgings. "'Will you let me keep my beautiful new dress for going out on Sundays?' she asked. "'The shabby old things will do when I am your servant. I can black your boots and brush your clothes and keep your room tidy, and I will try hard to learn if you will have me taught to cook.' Amelius attempted to change the subject again. He might as well have talked to her in an unknown tongue. The glorious prospect of being his servant absorbed the whole of her attention. "'I'm little and I'm stupid,' she went on, "'but I do think I could learn to cook if I knew I was doing it for you.' She paused and looked at him anxiously. "'Do let me try,' she pleaded. "'I haven't had much pleasure in my life, and I should like it so.' It was impossible to resist this. You shall be as happy as I can make you, Sally, Amelius answered. God knows it isn't much you ask for. Something in those compassionate words set her thinking in another direction. It was sad to see how slowly and painfully she realized the idea that had been suggested to her. I wonder whether you can make me happy, she said. I suppose I have been happy before, but I don't know when. I don't remember a time when I was not hungry or cold. Wait a bit. I do think I was happy once. It was a long while ago, and it took me a weary time to do it. But I did learn at last to play a tune on the fiddle. The old man and his wife took it in turns to teach me. Somebody gave me to the old man and his wife. I don't know who it was, and I don't remember their names. They were musicians. In the fine streets they sang hymns, and in the poor streets they sang comic songs. It was cold, to be sure, standing barefoot on the pavement, but I got plenty of halfpence. The people said I was so little it was a shame to send me out, and so I got halfpence. I had bread and apples for supper, and a nice little corner under the staircase to sleep in. Do you know, I do think I did enjoy myself at that time, she concluded, still a little doubtful whether those faint and far-off remembrances were really to be relied on. Amelius tried to lead her to other recollections. He asked her how old she was when she played the fiddle. I don't know, she answered. I don't know how old I am now. I don't remember anything before the fiddle. I can't call to mind how long it was first, but... There came a time when the old man and his wife got into trouble. They went to prison, and I never saw them afterwards. I ran away with the fiddle, to get the halfpence, you know, all to myself. I think I should have got a deal of money, if it hadn't been for the boys. They're so cruel, the boys are. They broke my fiddle. I tried selling pencils after that, but people didn't seem to want pencils. They found me out begging. I got took up and brought before the, what do you call him, the gentleman who sits in a high place, you know, behind a desk. Oh, but I was frightened when they took me before the gentleman. He looked very much puzzled. He says, bring her up here. She's so small I can hardly see her. He says, good God, what am I to do with this unfortunate child? There was plenty of people about. One of them says, the workhouse ought to take her. And a lady came in, and she says, I'll take her, sir, if you'll let me. And he knew her, and he let her. She took me to a place they call a refuge, for wandering children, you know. It was very strict at the refuge. They did give us plenty to eat, to be sure, and they taught us lessons. They told us about our father up in heaven. I said a wrong thing. I said, I don't want him up in heaven. I want him down here. They were very much ashamed of me when I said that. I was a bad girl. I turned ungrateful. After a time, I ran away. You see, it was so strict, and I was so used to the streets. I met with a Scotchman in the streets. He wore a kilt and played the pipes. He taught me to dance and dressed me up like a Scotch girl. He had a curious wife, a sort of half-black woman. She used to dance, too. 
on a bit of carpet, you know, so as not to spoil her fine shoes. They taught me songs. He taught me a Scotch song. And one day his wife said she was English. I don't know how that was, being a half-black woman. And I should learn an English song. And they quarreled about it. And she had her way. She taught me Sally in our alley. That's how I come to be called Sally. I hadn't any name of my own. I always had nicknames. Sally was the last of them, and Sally has stuck to me. I hope it isn't too common a name to please you. Oh, what a fine house. Are we really going in? Will they let me in? How stupid I am. I forgot my beautiful clothes. You won't tell them, will you, if they take me for a lady? The carriage had stopped at the great surgeon's house. The waiting room was full of patients. Some of them were trying to read the books and newspapers on the table, and some of them were looking at each other, not only without the slightest sympathy, but occasionally even with downright distrust and dislike. Amelius took up a newspaper and gave Sally an illustrated book to amuse her while they waited to see the surgeon in their turn. Two long hours passed before the sermon summoned Amelius to the consulting room. Sally was wearily asleep in her chair. He left her undisturbed, having questions to put relating to the imperfectly developed state of her mind, which could not be asked in her presence. The surgeon listened, with no ordinary interest, to the young stranger's simple and straightforward narrative of what had happened on the previous night. "'You are very unlike other young men,' he said. "'May I ask how you have been brought up?' The reply surprised him. "'This opens quite a new view of socialism,' he said. "'I thought your conduct highly imprudent at first. "'It seems to be the natural result of your teaching now. "'Let me see what I can do to help you.' He was very grave and very gentle when Sally was presented to him. His opinion of the injury to her bosom relieved the anxiety of Amelius. There might be pain for some little time to come, but there were no serious consequences to fear. Having written his prescription, and having put several questions to Sally, the surgeon sent her back with marked kindness of manner to wait for Amelius in the patient's room. I have young daughters of my own, he said, when the door was closed, and I cannot but feel for that unhappy creature when I contrast her life with theirs. So far as I can see it, the natural growth of her senses, her higher and her lower senses alike, has been stunted, like the natural growth of her body, by starvation, terror, exposure to cold, and other influences inherent in the life that she has led. With nourishing food, pure air, and above all, kind and careful treatment, I see no reason at her age why she should not develop into an intelligent and healthy young woman. Pardon me if I venture on giving you a word of advice. At your time of life, you will do well to place her at once under competent and proper care. You may live to regret it if you are too confident in your own good motives in such a case as this. Come to me again, if I can be of any use to you. No, he continued, refusing to take his fee. My help to that poor lost girl is help given freely. He shook hands with Amelius, a worthy member of the noble order to which he belonged. The surgeon's parting advice, following on the quaint protest of Rufus, had its effect on Amelius. He was silent and thoughtful when he got into the carriage again. Simple Sally looked at him with a vague sense of alarm. Her heart beat fast under the perpetually recurring fear that she had done something or said something to offend him. Was it bad behavior in me, she asked, to fall asleep in the chair? Reassured so far, she was still as anxious as ever to get at the truth. After a long hesitation and long previous thought, she ventured to try another question. The gentleman sent me out of the room. Did he say anything to set you against me? The gentleman said everything that was kind of you, Amelius replied, and everything to make me hope that you will live to be a happy girl. She said nothing to that, 
Vague assurances were no assurances to her. She only looked at him with the dumb fidelity of a dog. Suddenly she dropped on her knees in the carriage, hid her face in her hands, and cried silently. Surprised and distressed, he attempted to raise her and console her. No, she said obstinately, something has happened to vex you, and you won't tell me what it is. Do, do, do tell me what it is. My dear child, said Amelius, I was only thinking anxiously about you in the time to come. She looked up at him quickly. What? Have you forgotten already? she exclaimed. I'm to be your servant in the time to come. She dried her eyes and took her place again joyously by his side. You did frighten me, she said, and all for nothing. But you didn't mean it, did you? An older man might have had the courage to undeceive her. Amelius shrank from it. He tried to lead her back to the melancholy story, so common and so terrible, so pitiable in its utter absence of sentiment or romance, the story of her past life. No, she answered with that quick insight where her feelings were concerned, which was the only quick insight that she possessed. I don't like making you sorry, and you did look sorry, you did, when I talked about it before. The streets, the streets, the streets, little girl or big girl, it's only the streets, and always being hungry or cold, and cruel men when it isn't cruel boys. I want to be happy. I want to enjoy my new clothes. You tell me about your own self. What makes you so kind? I can't make it out. Try as I may, I can't make it out. Some time elapsed before they got back to the hotel. Amelius drove as far as the city to give the necessary instructions to his bankers. On returning to the sitting room at last, he discovered that his American friend was not alone. A gray-haired lady with a bright, benevolent face was talking earnestly to Rufus. The instant Sally discovered the stranger, she started back, fled to the shelter of her bedchamber, and locked herself in. Amelius, entering the room after a little hesitation, was presented to Mrs. Payson. "'There was something in my old friend's note,' said the lady, smiling and turning to Rufus, which suggested to me that I should do well to answer it personally. I am not too old yet to follow the impulse of the moment, sometimes, and I am very glad that I did so. I have heard what is to me a very interesting story. Mr. Goldenheart, I respect you, and I will prove it by helping you, with all my heart and soul, to save that poor little girl who has just run away from me. Pray, don't make excuses for her. I should have run away, too, at her age. We have arranged, she continued, looking again at Rufus, that I shall take you both to the home this afternoon. If we can prevail on Sally to go with us, one serious obstacle in our way will be overcome. Tell me the number of her room. I want to try, if I can't make friends with her. I have had some experience, and I don't despair of bringing her back here hand in hand, with the terrible person who has frightened her. The two men were left together. Amelius attempted to speak. Keep it down, said Rufus. No premature outbreak of opinion, if you please, yet a while. Wait till she has fixed Sally and shown us the paradise of the poor girls. It's within the London Postal District, and that's all I know about it. Well, now, and did you go to the doctor? Thunder, what's come to the boy? Seems as though he has left his complexion in the carriage. He looks, I do declare, as if he wanted medical tinkering himself. Amelius explained that his past night had been a wakeful one, and that the events of the day had not allowed him any opportunities of repose. Since the morning, he said, things have hurried so, one on the top of the other, that I am beginning to feel a little dazed and weary. Without a word of remark, Rufus produced the remedy. The materials were ready on the sideboard. He made a cocktail. Another? asked the New Englander, after a reasonable lapse of time. Amelius declined taking another. He stretched himself on the sofa. His good friend considerately took up a newspaper. For the first time that day, he had now the prospect of a quiet interval for rest and thought. In less than a minute, the delusive prospect vanished. 
He started to his feet again, disturbed by a new anxiety. Having leisure to think, he had thought of Regina. "'Good heavens!' he exclaimed. "'She's waiting to see me, and I never remembered it till this moment.' He looked at his watch. It was five o'clock. "'What am I to do?' he said helplessly. Rufus laid down the newspaper and considered the new difficulty in its various aspects. "'We are bound to go with Mrs. Payson to the home,' he said. "'And, I tell you this, Amelius, the matter of Sally is not a matter to be played with. It's a thing that's got to be done. In your place, I should write politely to Miss Regina and put it off till tomorrow.' In ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, a man who took Rufus for his counselor was a man who acted wisely in every sense of the word. Events, however, of which Amelius and his friend were both ignorant alike, had so ordered it that the American's well-meant advice, in this one exceptional case, was the very worst advice that could have been given. In an hour more, Jervy and Mrs. Sowler were to meet at the tavern door. The one last hope of protecting Mrs. Farnaby from the abominable conspiracy of which she was the destined victim rested solely on the fulfillment by Emilius of his engagement with Regina for that day. Always ready to interfere with the progress of the courtship, Mrs. Farnaby would be especially eager to seize the first opportunity of speaking to her young socialist friend on the subject of his lecture. In the course of the talk between them, the idea which, in the present disturbed state of his mind, had not struck him yet, the idea that the outcast of the streets might, by the barest conceivable possibility, be identified with the lost daughter, would, in one way or another, be almost infallibly suggested to Amelius, and, at the eleventh hour, the conspiracy would be foiled, if, on the other hand, the American's fatal advice was followed, the next morning's post might bring a letter from Jervy to Mrs. Farnaby with this disastrous result. At the first words spoken by Amelius, she would put an end to all further interest in the subject on his part by telling him that the lost girl had been found and found by another person. Rufus pointed to the writing materials on a side table, which he had himself used earlier in the day. The needful excuse was, unhappily, quite easy to find. A misunderstanding with his lady had obliged Amelius to leave his lodgings at an hour's notice, and had occupied him in trying to find a new residence for the rest of the day. The note was written. Rufus, who was nearest to the bell, stretched out his hand to ring for the messenger. Amelius suddenly stopped him. She doesn't like me to disappoint her, he said. I needn't stay long. I might get there and back in half an hour in a fast cab. His conscience was not quite easy. The sense of having forgotten Regina, no matter how naturally and excusably, oppressed him with a feeling of self-reproach. Rufus raised no objection. The hesitation of Amelius was unquestionably creditable to him. If you must do it, my son, he said, do it right away, and we'll wait for you. Amelius took up his hat. The door opened as he approached it, and Mrs. Payson entered the room, leading simple Sally by the hand. We are all going together, said the genial old lady, to see my large family of daughters at the home. We can have our talk in the carriage. It's an hour's drive from this place, and I must be back again to dinner at half-past seven. Amelius and Rufus looked at each other. Amelius thought of pleading an engagement and asking to be excused. Under the circumstances, it was assuredly not a very gracious thing to do. Before he could make up his mind one way or the other, Sally stole to his side and put her hand on his arm. Mrs. Payson had done wonders in conquering the girl's inveterate distrust of strangers and, to a certain extent at least, winning her confidence but no early influence could shake Sally's dog-like devotion to Amelia's. Her jealous instinct discovered something suspicious in his sudden silence. "'You must go with us,' she said. "'I won't go without you.' "'Certainly not,' Mrs. Payson added. "'I promised her that, of course, beforehand.' Rufus rang the bell and dispatched the messenger to Regina. "'That's the one way out of it, my son,' he whispered to Amelia's 
as they followed Mrs. Payson and Sally down the stairs of the hotel. They had just driven up to the gates of the home when Jervie and his accomplice met at the tavern and entered on their consultation in a private room. In spite of her poverty-stricken appearance, Mrs. Sowler was not absolutely destitute. In various underhand and wicked ways, she contrived to put a few shillings in her pocket from week to week. If she was half-starved, it was for the very ordinary reason, among persons of her vicious class, that she preferred spending her money on drink. Stating his business with her as reservedly and as cunningly as usual, Jervy found to his astonishment that even this squalid old creature presumed to bargain with him. The two wretches were on the point of a quarrel which might have delayed the execution of the plot against Mrs. Farnaby, but for the vile self-control which made Jervy one of the most formidable criminals living. He gave way on the question of money, and from that moment he had Mrs. Sowler absolutely at his disposal. "'Meet me tomorrow morning to receive your instructions,' he said. "'The time is ten sharp, and the place is the powder magazine in Hyde Park. "'And mind this. You must be decently dressed. "'You know where to hire the things. "'If I smell you of spirits tomorrow morning, I shall employ somebody else. "'No, not a farthing now. You will have your money. first installment only, mind, tomorrow at ten. "'Left by himself,' Jervy sent for pen, ink, and paper. Using his left hand, which was just as serviceable to him as his right, he traced these lines. You are informed by an unknown friend that a certain lost young lady is now living in a foreign country and may be restored to her afflicted mother on receipt of a sufficient sum to pay expenses and to reward the writer of this letter who is undeservedly in distressed circumstances. Are you, madam, the mother? I ask the question in the strictest confidence, knowing nothing certainly but that your husband was the person who put the young lady out to nurse in her infancy. I don't address your husband, because his inhuman desertion of the poor baby does not incline me to trust him. I run the risk of trusting you, to a certain extent, at starting. Shall I drop a hint which may help you to identify the child in your own mind? It would be inexcusably foolish on my part to speak too plainly just yet. The hint must be a vague one. Suppose I use a poetical expression and say that the young lady is enveloped in mystery from head to foot, especially the foot. In the event of my addressing the right person, I beg to offer a suggestion for a preliminary interview. If you will take a walk on the bridge over the Serpentine River on Kensington Gardens side at half past ten o'clock tomorrow morning, holding a white handkerchief in your left hand, you will meet the much injured woman who is deceived into taking charge of the infant child at Ramsgate, and will be satisfied so far that you are giving your confidence to persons who really deserve it. Jervy addressed this infamous letter to Mrs. Farnaby in an ordinary envelope marked private. He posted it that night with his own hand. End of Book Six, Chapter Three Book Six, Filia Dolorosa, Chapter Four of The Fallen Leaves this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Fallen Leaves by Wilkie Collins. Book Six. Chapter Four. Rufus, I don't quite like the way you look at me. You seem to think... Give it tongue, my son. What do I seem to think? You think I'm forgetting Regina. You don't believe I'm just as fond of her as ever. The fact is, you're an old bachelor. That is so. Where's the harm, Emilius? I don't understand. You're out there, my bright boy. I reckon I understand more than you think for. 
The wisest thing you ever did in your life is what you did this evening, when you committed Sally to the care of those ladies at the home. Good night, Rufus. We shall quarrel if I stay here any longer. Good night, Emilius. We shan't quarrel. Stay here as long as you like. The good deed had been done. The sacrifice, already a painful sacrifice, had been made. Mrs. Payson was old enough to speak plainly as well as seriously to Emilius of the absolute necessity of separating himself from simple Sally without any needless delay. "'You have seen for yourself,' she said, "'that the plan on which this little household is ruled "'is the unvarying plan of patience and kindness. "'So far as Sally is concerned, "'you can be quite sure that she will never hear a harsh word, "'never meet with a hard look while she is under our care. "'The lamentable neglect under which the poor creature has suffered "'will be tenderly remembered and atoned for here.' If we can't make her happy among us, I promise that she shall leave the home, if she wishes it, in six weeks' time. As to yourself, consider your position if you persist in taking her back with you. Our good friend Rufus has told me that you are engaged to be married. Think of the misinterpretations, to say the least of it, to which you would subject yourself. Think of the reports which would sooner or later find their way to the young lady's ears, and of the deplorable consequences that would follow. I believe implicitly in the purity of your motives, but remember who taught us to pray that we may not be led into temptation, and complete the good work that you have begun by leaving Sally among friends and sisters in this house. To any honorable man, these were unanswerable words, coming after what Rufus and the surgeon had already said to him, they left Emilius no alternative but to yield. He pleaded for leave to write to Sally and to see her, at a later interval, when she might be reconciled to her new life. Mrs. Payson had just consented to both requests. Rufus had just heartily congratulated him on his decision, when the door was thrown violently open. Simple Sally ran into the room, followed by one of the women attendants in a state of breathless surprise. "'She showed me a bedroom,' cried Sally, pointing indignantly to the woman, "'and she asked if I should like to sleep there.' She turned to Emilius and caught him by the hand to lead him away. The ineradicable instinct of distrust had been once more aroused in her by the too zealous attendant. "'I'm not going to stay here,' she said. "'I'm going away with you.' Emilius glanced at Mrs. Payson. Sally tried to drag him to the door. He did his best to reassure her by a smile. He spoke confusedly some composing words. But his honest face, always accustomed to tell the truth, told the truth now. The poor lost creature, whose feeble intelligence was so slow to discern, so inapt to reflect, looked at him with the heart's instantaneous perception and saw her doom. She let go of his hand. Her head sank. Without word or cry, she dropped at the floor at his feet. The attendant instantly raised her and placed her on a sofa. Mrs. Payson saw how resolutely Amelia struggled to control himself and felt for him with all her heart. Turning aside for a moment, she hastily wrote a few lines and returned to him. "'Go, before we revive her,' she whispered, "'and give what I have written to the coachman. "'You shall suffer no anxiety that I can spare you,' said the excellent woman. "'I will stay here myself to-night and reconcile her to the new life.' She held out her hand. Amelius kissed it in silence. Rufus led him out. Not a word dropped from his lips on the long drive back to London." His mind was disturbed by other subjects, besides the subject of Sally. He thought of his future, darkened by the doubtful marriage engagement that was before him. Alone with Rufus for the rest of the evening, he petulantly misunderstood the sympathy with which the kindly American regarded him. Their bedrooms were next to each other. Rufus heard him walking restlessly to and fro, and now and then talking to himself. After a while, these sounds ceased. He was evidently worn out, and was getting the rest that he needed at last. 
The next morning he received a few lines from Mrs. Payson, giving a favorable account of Sally, and promising further particulars in a day or two. Encouraged by this good news, revived by a long night's sleep, he went towards noon to pay his postponed visit to Regina. At that early hour he could feel sure that his interview with her would not be interrupted by visitors. She received him quietly and seriously, pressing his hand with a warmer fondness than usual. He had anticipated some complaint of his absence on the previous day, and some severe allusion to his appearance in the capacity of a socialist lecturer. Regina's indulgence, or Regina's interest in circumstances of more pressing importance, preserved a merciful silence on both subjects. "'It is a comfort to me to seal you, Amelius,' she said. "'I am in trouble about my uncle, and I am weary of my own anxious thoughts. "'Something unpleasant has happened in Mr. Farnaby's business. "'He goes to the city earlier, and he returns much later than usual. "'When he does come back, he doesn't speak to me. "'He locks himself into his room, and he looks worn and haggard "'when I make his breakfast for him in the morning.' "'You know that he is one of the directors of the new bank? "'There was something about the bank in the newspaper yesterday "'which upset him dreadfully. "'He put down his cup of coffee "'and went away to the city without eating his breakfast. "'I don't like to worry you about it, Amelius, "'but my aunt seems to take no interest in her husband's affairs, "'and it is really a relief to me to talk of my troubles to you. "'I have kept the newspaper.' "'Do look at what it says about the bank, and tell me if you understand it.' Amelius read the passage pointed out to him. He knew as little of banking business as Regina. "'So far I can make it out,' he said. "'They're paying away money to their shareholders, which they haven't earned. "'How do they do that, I wonder?' Regina changed the subject in despair. She asked Amelius if he had found new lodgings. Hearing that he had not yet succeeded in the search for a residence, she opened a drawer of her work-table and took out a card. "'The brother of one of my schoolfellows is going to be married,' she said. "'He has a pretty bachelor cottage in the neighborhood of the Regent's Park, and he wants to sell it with the furniture just as it is. I don't know whether you care to encumber yourself with a little house of your own.' His sister has asked me to distribute some of his cards with the address and the particulars. It might be worth your while, perhaps, to look at the cottage when you pass that way. Amelius took the card. The small feminine restraints and gentlenesses of Regina, her quiet, even voice, her serene grace of movement, had a pleasantly soothing effect on his mind after the anxieties of the last four and twenty hours. He looked at her, bending over her embroidery, deftly and gracefully industrious, and drew his chair closer to her. She smiled softly over her work, conscious that he was admiring her, and placidly pleased to receive the tribute. "'I would buy the cottage at once,' said Amelius, "'if I thought you would come and live in it with me.' She looked up gravely, with her needle suspended in her hand. "'Don't let us return to that,' she answered, and went on again with her embroidery." "'Why not?' Amelius asked. She persisted in working as industriously as if she had been a poor needlewoman, with serious reasons for being eager to get her money. "'It is useless,' she replied, "'to speak of what cannot be for some time to come.' Amelius stopped the progress of the embroidery by taking her hand. Her devotion to her work irritated him. "'Look at me, Regina,' he said, steadily controlling himself. "'I want to propose that we shall give way a little on both sides. "'I won't hurry you. I will wait a reasonable time. "'If I promise that, surely you may yield a little in return. "'Money seems to be a hard taskmaster, my darling, "'after what you have told me about your uncle. "'See how he suffers because he is bent on being rich, "'and ask yourself if it isn't a warning to us "'not to follow his example.' "'Would you like to see me too wretched to speak to you, or to eat my breakfast, and all for the sake of a little outward show? Come, come, let us think of ourselves. Why should we waste the best days of our life apart, when we are both free to be happy together? I have another good friend besides Rufus, the good friend of my father before me. He knows all sorts of great people, and he will help me to some employment.' 
In six months' time I might have a little salary to add to my income. Say the sweetest words, my darling, that ever fell from your lips. Say you will marry me in six months. It was not in a woman's nature to be insensible to such pleading as this. She all but yielded. I should like to say it, dear, she answered with a little fluttering sigh. Say it then, Amelia suggested tenderly. She took refuge again in her embroidery. If you would only give me a little time, she suggested, I might say it. Time for what, my own love? Time to wait, dear, till my uncle is not quite so anxious as he is now. Don't talk of your uncle, Regina. You know as well as I do what he would say. Good heavens, why can't you decide for yourself? No, I don't want to hear over again about what you owe to Mr. Farnaby. I heard enough of it on that day in the shrubbery. Oh, my dear girl, do have some feeling for me. Do for once have a will of your own. Those last words were an offense to her self-esteem. I think it's very rude to tell me I have no will of my own, she said, and very hard to press in this way when you know I am in trouble. The inevitable handkerchief appeared, adding emphasis to the protest, and the becoming tears showed themselves modestly in Regina's magnificent eyes. Amelius started out of his chair and walked away to the window. That last reference to Mr. Farnaby's pecuniary cares was more than he had patience to endure. She can't even forget her uncle and his bank, he thought, when I am speaking to her of our marriage. He kept his face hidden from her at the window. By some subtle process of association, which he was unable to trace, the image of simple Sally rose in his mind. An irresistible influence forced him to think of her, not as the poor, starved, degraded, half-witted creature of the streets, but as the grateful girl who had asked for no happier future than to be his servant, who had dropped senseless at his feet at the bare prospect of parting with him. His sense of self-respect, his loyalty to his betrothed wife, resolutely resisted the unworthy conclusion to which his own thoughts were leading him. He turned back again to Regina. He spoke so loudly and so vehemently that the gathering flow of her tears was suspended in surprise. "'You're right. You're quite right, my dear. I ought to give you time, of course. I try to control my hasty temper, but I don't always succeed, just at first. Pray forgive me. It shall be exactly as you wish.' Regina forgave him, with a gentle and ladylike astonishment at the excitable manner in which he made his excuses. She even neglected her embroidery and put her face up to him to be kissed. "'You are so nice, dear,' she said, when you are not violent and unreasonable. "'It is such a pity you were brought up in America. Won't you stay to lunch?' Happily for Amelius, the footman appeared at this critical moment with a message— my mistress wishes particularly to see you, sir, before you go. This was the first occasion in the experience of the lovers on which Mrs. Farnaby had expressed her wishes through the medium of a servant instead of appearing personally. The curiosity of Regina was mildly excited. What a very odd message, she said. What does it mean? My aunt went out earlier than usual this morning, and I have not seen her since. I wonder whether she is going to consult you about my uncle's affairs. I'll go and see, said Amelius. And stay to lunch, Regina reiterated. Not today, my dear. Tomorrow, then? Yes, tomorrow. So he escaped. As he opened the door, he looked back and kissed his hand. Regina raised her head for a moment and smiled charmingly. She was hard at work again over her embroidery. End of Book Six, Chapter Four. Book Six, Chapter Five. The Fallen Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. THE FALLEN LEAVES by Wilkie Collins Book 6, Chapter 5 The door of Mrs. Farnaby's ground-floor room at the back of the house was partially open. She was on the watch for Amelius. 
Come in, she cried, the moment he appeared in the hall. She pulled him into the room and shut the door with a bang. Her face was flushed. Her eyes were wild. I have something to tell you, my dear good fellow, she burst out excitedly. Something in confidence between you and me. She paused and looked at him with sudden anxiety and alarm. What's the matter with you, she asked. The sight of the room, the reference to a secret, the prospect of another private conference, forced back the mind of Emilius in one breathless instant to his first memorable interview with Mrs. Farnaby. The mother's piteously hopeful words, in speaking of her lost daughter, rang in his ears again, as if they had just fallen from her lips. She may be lost in the labyrinth of London. Tomorrow, or ten years hence, you might meet with her. There were a hundred chances against it, a thousand, ten thousand chances against it. The startling possibility flashed across his brain, nevertheless, like a sudden flow of daylight across the dark. Have I met with her at the first chance? Wait, he cried. I have something to say before you speak to me. Don't deceive yourself with vain hopes. Promise me that before I begin. She waved her hand derisively. Hopes, she repeated. I have done with hopes. I have done with fears. I have got to certainties at last. He was too eager to heed anything that she said to him. His whole soul was absorbed in the coming disclosure. Two nights since, he went on, I was wandering about London, and I met... She burst out laughing. Go on, she cried, with a wild, derisive gaiety. Amelia stopped, perplexed and startled. What are you laughing at? he asked. Go on, she repeated. I defy you to surprise me. Out with it. Whom did you meet? Amelia's proceeded doubtfully, by a word at a time. I met a poor girl in the streets, he said, steadily watching her. She changed completely at those words. She looked at him with an aspect of stern reproach. No more of it, she interposed. I have not waited all these miserable years for such a horrible end as that. Her face suddenly brightened. A radiant effusion of tenderness and triumph flowed over it, and made it young and happy again. Amelia, she said, listen to this. My dream has come true. My girl is found. Thanks to you, though you don't know it. Amelius looked at her. Was she speaking of something that had really happened, or had she been dreaming again? Absorbed in her own happiness, she made no remark on his silence. I have seen the woman, she went on. This bright, blessed morning I have seen the woman who took her away in the first days of her poor little life. The wretch swears she was not to blame. I tried to forgive her. Perhaps I almost did forgive her, in the joy of hearing what she had to tell me. I should never have heard it, Emilius, if you had not given that glorious lecture. The woman was one of your audience. She would never have spoken of those past days. She would never have thought of me. At those words, Mrs. Farnaby abruptly stopped and turned her face away from Emilius. After waiting a little, finding her still silent, still immovable, he ventured on putting a question. "'Are you sure you are not deceived?' he asked. "'I remember you told me that rogues had tried to impose on you "'in past times when you employed people to find her.' "'I have proof that I am not being imposed upon,' Mrs. Farnaby answered, "'still keeping her face hidden from him. "'One of them knows of the fault in her foot.' "'One of them?' Amelius repeated. "'How many of them are there?' Two, the old woman and a young man. "'What are their names?' They won't tell me their names yet. Isn't that a little suspicious? One of them knows, Mrs. Farnaby reiterated, of the fault in her foot. May I ask which of them knows? The old woman, I suppose. No, the young man. That's strange, isn't it? Have you seen the young man? I know nothing of him, except the little that the woman told me. He has written me a letter. May I look at it? I daren't let you look at it. Amelius said no more. If he had felt the smallest suspicion that the disclosure volunteered by Mrs. Farnaby at their first interview had been overheard by the unknown person who had opened the swinging window in the kitchen, he might have recalled Phoebe's vindictive language at his lodgings, and the doubts suggested to him by his discovery of the vagabond waiting for her in the street. As it was, he was simply puzzled. The one plain conclusion to his mind was, unhappily, the natural conclusion after what he had heard, 
that Mrs. Farnaby had no sort of interest in the discovery of Simple Sally, and that he need trouble himself with no further anxiety in that matter. Strange as Mrs. Farnaby's mysterious revelation seemed, her correspondent's knowledge of the fault in the foot was circumstance in his favor beyond dispute. Amelia still wondered inwardly how it was that the woman who had taken charge of the child had failed to discover what appeared to be known to another person. If he had been aware that Mrs. Sowler's occupation at the time was the occupation of a baby farmer, and that she had many other deserted children pining under her charge, he might have easily understood that she was the last person in the world to trouble herself with a minute examination of any one of the unfortunate little creatures abandoned to her drunken and merciless neglect." Jervy had satisfied himself, before he trusted her with his instructions, that she knew no more than the veriest stranger of any peculiarity in one or the other of the child's feet. Interpreting Mrs. Farnaby's last reply to him as an intimation that their interview was at an end, Emilius took up his hat to go. I hope with all my heart, he said, that what has begun so well will end well, if there is any service that I can do for you. She drew nearer to him, and put her hand gently on his shoulder. Don't think that I distrust you, she said very earnestly. I am unwilling to shock you, that is all. Even this great joy has a dark side to it. My miserable married life casts its shadow on everything that happens to me. Keep secret from everybody the little that I have told you. You will ruin me if you say one word of it to any living creature. I ought not to have opened my heart to you, but how could I help it, when the happiness that is coming to me has come through you? When you say good-bye to me today, Emilius, you say good-bye to me for the last time in this house. I am going away. Don't ask me why. That is one more among the things which I daren't tell you. You shall hear from me or see me, I promise that. Give me some safe address to write to, some place where there are no inquisitive women who may open my letter in your absence. She handed him her pocket-book. Amelius wrote down in it the address of his club. She took his hand. Think of me kindly, she said, and once more don't be afraid of my being deceived. There is a hard part of me still left which keeps me on my guard. The old woman tried this morning to make me talk to her about that little fault we know of in my child's foot. But I thought to myself, if you had taken a proper interest in my poor baby while she was with you, you must sooner or later have found it out. Not a word passed my lips. No, no, don't be anxious when you think of me. I am as sharp as they are. I mean to find out how the man who wrote to me discovered what he knows. He shall satisfy me, I promise you, when I see him or hear from him next. All this is between ourselves strictly, sacredly between ourselves. Say nothing. I know I can trust you. Good-bye, and forgive me for having been so often in your way with Regina. I shall never be in your way again. Marry her, if you think she is good enough for you. I have no more interest now in your being a roving bachelor, meeting with girls here, there, and everywhere. You shall know how it goes on. Oh, I am so happy. She burst into tears and signed to Amelius with a wild gesture of treaty to leave her. He pressed her hand in silence and went out. Almost as the door closed on him, the variable woman changed again, for a while she walked rapidly to and fro, talking to herself. The course of her tears ceased. Her lips closed firmly, her eyes assumed an expression of savage resolve. She sat down at the table and opened her desk. I'll read it once more, she said to herself, before I seal it up. She took from her desk a letter of her own writing and spread it out before her. With her elbows on the table, and her hands clasped fiercely in her hair, she read those lines addressed to her husband. "'John Farnaby, I have always suspected that you had something to do with the disappearance of our child. I know for certain now that you deliberately cast your infant daughter on the mercy of the world and condemned your wife to a life of wretchedness.' Don't suppose that I have been deceived. I have spoken with the woman who waited by the garden paling at Ramsgate, and who took the child from your hands. She saw you with me at the lecture, and she is absolutely sure that you are the man. 
Thanks to the meeting at the lecture hall, I am at last on the trace of my lost daughter. This morning I heard the woman's story. She kept the child, on the chance of its being reclaimed, until she could afford to keep it no longer. She met with a person who was willing to adopt it, and who took it away with her to a foreign country not mentioned to me yet. In that country my daughter is still living, and will be restored to me on conditions which will be communicated in a few days' time. Some of this story may be true, and some of it may be false. The woman may be lying to serve her own interests with me. Of one thing I am sure, my girl is identified by means known to me of which there can be no doubt, and she must be still living, because the interest of the person's treating with me is an interest in her life. When you receive this letter, on your return from business to-night, I shall have left you, and left you forever. The bare thought of even looking at you again fills me with horror. I have my own income, and I mean to take my own way. In your best interests, I warn you, make no attempt to trace me. I declare solemnly that rather than let your deserted daughter be polluted by the sight of you, I would kill you with my own hand and die for it on the scaffold. If she ever asks for her father, I will do you one service. For the honor of human nature, I will tell her that her father is dead. It will not be all a falsehood. I repudiate you and your name. You are dead to me from this time forth. I sign myself by my father's name. Emma Ronald She had said herself that she was unwilling to shock Amelius. This was the reason. After thinking a little, she sealed and directed the letter. This done, she unlocked the wooden press which had once contained the baby's frock and cap, and those other memorials of the past which she called her dead consolations. After satisfying herself that the press was empty, she wrote on a card, to be called for by a messenger from my bankers, and tied the card to a tin box in a corner secured by a padlock. She lifted the box and placed it in front of the press, so that it might be easily visible to anyone entering the room. The safekeeping of her treasures provided for, she took the sealed letter, and ascending the stairs, placed it on the table in her husband's dressing room. She hurried out again the instant after, as if the sight of the place were intolerable to her. Passing to the other end of the corridor, she entered her own bedchamber, and put on her bonnet and cloak. A leather handbag was on the bed. She took it up, and looked round the large, luxurious room with a shudder of disgust. What she had suffered within those four walls, no human creature knew but herself. She hurried out, as she had hurried out of her husband's dressing-room. Her niece was still in the drawing-room. As she reached the door, she hesitated and stopped. The girl was a good girl, in her own dull, placid way, and her sister's daughter, too. A last little act of kindness would perhaps be a welcome act to remember. She opened the door so suddenly that Regina started with a small cry of alarm. Oh, aunt, how you frighten one! Are you going out? Yes, I'm going out, was the short answer. Come here, give me a kiss. Regina looked up in wide-eyed astonishment. Mrs. Farnaby stamped impatiently on the floor. Regina rose gracefully bewildered. "'My dear aunt, how very odd,' she said, and gave the kiss demanded, with a serenely surprised elevation of her finely shaped eyebrows. "'Yes,' said Mrs. Farnaby, "'that's it, one of my oddities. Go back to your work. Good-bye.' She left the room as abruptly as she had entered it. With her firm, heavy step, she descended to the hall, passed out at the house door, and closed it behind her, never to return to it again." End of Book 6, Chapter 5。Book 6, Chapter 6 。The Fallen Leaves。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Fallen Leaves by Wilkie Collins Book 6, Filia Dolorosa, Chapter 6 
Amelius left Mrs. Farnaby troubled by emotions of confusion and alarm, which he was the last man living to endure patiently. Her extraordinary story of the discovered daughter, the still more startling assertion of her solution to leave the house, the absence of any plain explanation, the burden of secrecy imposed on him, all combined together to irritate his sensitive nerves. I hate mysteries, he thought, and ever since I landed in England I seem fated to be mixed up in them. Does she really mean to leave her husband and her niece? What will Farnaby do? What will become of Regina? To think of Regina was to think of the new repulse of which he had been made the subject. Again he had appealed to her love for him, and again she had refused to marry him at his own time. He was especially perplexed and angry when he reflected on the unassailably strong influence which her uncle appeared to have over her. All Regina's sympathy was with Mr. Farnaby and his troubles. Amelius might have understood her a little better if she had told him what had passed between her uncle and herself on the night of Mr. Farnaby's return in a state of indignation from the lecture. In terror of the engagement being broken off, she had been forced to confess that she was too fond of Amelius to prevail on herself to part with him. If he attempted a second exposition of his socialist principles on the platform, she owned that it might be impossible to receive him again as a suitor. But she pleaded hard for the granting of a pardon to the first offence in the interests of her own tranquillity, if not in mercy, to Amelius. Mr. Farnaby, already troubled by his commercial anxieties, had listened more amiably, and also more absently than usual, and had granted her petition with the ready indulgence of a preoccupied man. It had been decided between them that the offence of the lecture should be passed over in discreet silence. Regina's gratitude for this concession inspired her sympathy with her uncle in his present state of suspense. She had been sorely tempted to tell Amelius what had happened, but the natural reserve of her character, fortified in this instance by the defensive pride which makes a woman unwilling before marriage to confess her weakness unreservedly to the man who has caused it, had sealed her lips. When he is a little less violent and a little more humble, she thought, perhaps I may tell him. So it fell out that Amelius took his way through the streets, a mystified and an angry man. Arrived in sight of the hotel, he stopped and looked about him. It was impossible to disguise from himself that a lurking sense of regret was making itself felt in his present frame of mind when he thought of simple Sally. In all probability, he would have quarreled with any man who had accused him of actually lamenting the girl's absence and wanting her back again. He happened to recollect her artless blue eyes with their vague, patient look, and her quaint, childish questions put so openly, in so sweet a voice, and that was all. Was there anything reprehensible, if you please, in an act of remembrance? Comforting himself with these considerations, he moved on again a step or two, and stopped once more. In his present humor he shrank from facing Rufus. The American read him like a book. The American would ask irritating questions. He turned his back on the hotel and looked at his watch. As he took it out, his finger and thumb touched something else in his waistcoat pocket. It was the card that Regina had given to him, the card of the cottage to let. He had nothing to do and nowhere to go. Why not look at the cottage? If it proved to be not worth seeing, the zoological gardens were in the neighborhood, and there are periods in a man's life when he finds the society that walks on four feet a welcome relief from the society that walks on two. It was a fairly fine day. He turned northward towards the Regent's Park. The cottage was in a by-road, just outside the park, a cottage in the strictest sense of the word, a sitting-room, a library, and a bedroom, all of small proportions, and under them a kitchen and two more rooms represented the whole of the little dwelling from top to bottom. It was simply and prettily furnished, and it was completely surrounded by its own tiny plot of garden ground. The library especially was a perfect little retreat, looking out on the back garden, peaceful and shady, and adorned with bookcases of old carved oak. Amelius had hardly looked around the room before his inflammable brain was on fire with a new idea. 
Other idle men in trouble had found the solace and the occupation of their lives in books. Why should he not be one of them? Why not plunge into study in this delightful retirement, and perhaps one day astonish Regina and Mr. Farnaby by bursting on the world as the writer of a famous book? Exactly as Emilius, two days since, had seen himself in the future a public lecturer in receipt of glorious fees, so he now saw himself the celebrated scholar and writer of a new era to come. The woman who showed the cottage happened to mention that a gentleman had already looked over it that morning and had seemed to like it. Emilius instantly gave her a shilling and said, I take it on the spot. The wondering woman referred him to the house agent's address and kept at a safe distance from the excitable stranger as she let him out. In less than another hour, Emilius had taken the cottage and had returned to the hotel with a new interest in life and a new surprise for Rufus. As usual, in cases of emergency, the American wasted no time in talking. He went out at once to see the cottage and to make his own inquiries of the agent. The result amply proved that Emilius had not been imposed upon. If he repented of his bargain, the gentleman who had first seen the cottage was ready to take it off his hands at a moment's notice. Going back to the hotel, Rufus found Emilius resolute to move into his new abode and eager for the coming life of study and retirement. Knowing perfectly well beforehand how this latter project would end, the American tried the efficacy of a little worldly temptation. He had arranged, he said, to have a good time of it in Paris, and he proposed that Emilius should be his companion. The suggestion produced not the slightest effect. Emilius talked as if he were a confirmed recluse in the decline of life. Thank you, he said, with the most amazing gravity. I prefer the company of my books and the seclusion of my study. This declaration was followed by more selling out of money in the funds, and by a visit to a bookseller, which left a handsome pecuniary result inscribed on the right side of the ledger. On the next day, Emilius presented himself towards two o'clock at Mr. Farnaby's house. He was not so selfishly absorbed in his own projects as to forget Mrs. Farnaby. On the contrary, he was honestly anxious for news of her. A certain middle-aged man of business has been briefly referred to in these pages as one of Regina's faithful admirers, patiently submitting to the triumph of his favored young rival. This gentleman, issuing from his carriage with his card-case ready in his hand, met Emilius at the door, with a face which announced plainly that a catastrophe had happened. "'You have heard the sad news, no doubt,' he said, in a rich bass voice attuned to sadly courteous tones. The servant opened the door before Emilius could answer. After a contest of politeness, the middle-aged gentleman consented to make his inquiries first. "'How is Mr. Farnaby? No better?' And Miss Regina? Very poorly, oh, dear, dear me. Say I called, if you please. He handed in two cards, with a severe enjoyment of the melancholy occasion and the rich bass sounds of his own voice. Very sad, is it not, he said, addressing his youthful rival with an air of paternal indulgence. Good morning. He bowed with melancholy grace and got into his carriage. Emilius looked after the prosperous merchant as the prancing horses drew him away. After all, he thought bitterly, she might be happier with that rich prig than she could be with me. He stepped into the hall and spoke to the servant. The man had his message ready. Miss Regina would see Mr. Goldenheart if he would be so good as to wait in the dining room. Regina appeared, pale and scared, her eyes inflamed with weeping. "'Oh, Emilius, can you tell me what this dreadful misfortune means?' Why has she left us? When she sent for you yesterday, what did she say? In his position, Emilius could make but one answer. Your aunt said she thought of going away, but, he added with perfect truth, she refused to tell me why or where she was going. I am quite as much at a loss to understand her as you are. What does your uncle propose to do? Mr. Farnaby's conduct, as described by Regina, thickened the mystery. He proposed to do nothing. He had been found on the hearth rug in his dressing room, having apparently been seized with a fit in the act of burning some paper. The ashes were discovered close by him, just inside the fender. On his recovery, his first anxiety was to know if a letter had been burnt. 
Satisfied on this point, he had ordered the servants to assemble round his bed, and had peremptorily forbidden them to open the door to their mistress, if she ever returned at any future time to the house. Regina's questions and remonstrances, when she was left alone with him, were answered, once for all, in these pitiless terms. If you wish to deserve the fatherly interest that I take in you, do as I do. Forget that such a person as your aunt ever existed." We shall quarrel if you ever mention her name in my hearing again. This said, he had instantly changed the subject, instructing Regina to write an excuse to Mr. Melton, otherwise the middle-aged rival, with whom he had been engaged to dine that evening. Relating this latter event, Regina's ever-ready gratitude overflowed in the direction of Mr. Melton. He was so kind, he left his guests in the evening and came and sat with my uncle for nearly an hour. Emilius made no remark on this. He led the conversation back to the subject of Mrs. Farnaby. She once spoke to me of her lawyers, he said. Do they know nothing about her? The answer to this question showed that the sternly final decision of Mr. Farnaby was matched by equal resolution on the part of his wife. One of the partners in the legal firm had called that morning to see Regina on a matter of business. Mrs. Farnaby had appeared at the office on the previous day, and had briefly expressed her wish to make a small annual provision for her niece, in case of future need. Declining to enter into any explanation, she had waited until the necessary document had been drawn out, had requested that Regina might be informed of the circumstance, and had then taken her departure in absolute silence. Hearing that she had left her husband, the lawyer, like everyone else, was completely at a loss to understand what it meant. "'And what does the doctor say?' Emilius asked next. "'My uncle is to be kept perfectly quiet,' Regina answered, "'and is not to return to business for some time to come. Mr. Melton, with his usual kindness, has undertaken to look after his affairs for him.' Otherwise, my uncle, in his present state of anxiety about the bank, would never have consented to obey the doctor's orders. When he can safely travel, he is recommended to go abroad for the winter and get well again in some warmer climate. He refuses to leave his business, and the doctor refuses to take the responsibility. There is to be a consultation of physicians tomorrow. Oh, Emilius, I was really fond of my aunt. I am heartbroken at this dreadful change. There was a momentary silence. If Mr. Melton had been present, he would have said a few neatly sympathetic words. Amelius knew no more than a savage of the art of conventional consolation. Tadmore had made him familiar with the social and political questions of the time, and had taught him to speak in public. But Tadmore, rich in books and newspapers, was a powerless training institution in the matter of small talk. "'Suppose Mr. Farnaby is obliged to go abroad,' he suggested, after waiting a little. "'What will you do?' Regina looked at him, with an air of melancholy surprise. "'I shall do my duty, of course,' she answered gravely. "'I shall accompany my dear uncle if he wishes it.' She glanced at the clock on the mantelpiece. "'It is time he took his medicine,' she resumed. "'You will excuse me, I am sure.' She shook hands, not very warmly, and hastened out of the room." Amelius left the house with a conviction which disheartened him, the conviction that he had never understood Regina, and that he was not likely to understand her in the future. He turned for relief to the consideration of Mr. Farnaby's strange conduct, under the domestic disaster which had befallen him. Recalling what he had observed for himself, and what he had heard from Mrs. Farnaby when she had first taken him into her confidence, he inferred that the subject of the lost child had not only been a subject of estrangement between the husband and wife, but that the husband was in some way the person blamable for it. Assuming this theory to be the right one, there would be serious obstacles to the meeting of the mother and child in the mother's home. The departure of Mrs. Farnaby was, in that case, no longer unintelligible, and Mr. Farnaby's otherwise inexplicable conduct had the light of a motive thrown on it, which might not unnaturally influence a hard-hearted man, weary alike of his wife and his wife's troubles. Arriving at this conclusion by a far shorter process than is here indicated, Amelius pursued the subject no further. At the time when he had first visited the Farnabys, Rufus had advised him to withdraw from closer intercourse with them while he had the chance. 
in his present mood he was almost in danger of acknowledging to himself that rufus had proved to be right he lunched with his american friend at the hotel before the meal was over mrs payson called to say a few cheering words about sally it was not to be denied that the girl remained persistently silent and reserved in other respects the report was highly favorable she was obedient to the rules of the house she was always ready with any little services that she could render to her companions and she was so eager to improve herself by means of her reading lessons and writing lessons that it was not easy to induce her to lay aside her book and her slate when the teacher offered her some small reward for her good conduct and asked what she would like the sad little face brightened and the faithful creature's answer was always the same i should like to know what he is doing now alas for sally he meant amelius you must wait a little longer before you write to her mrs payson concluded and you must not think of seeing her for some time to come i know you will help us by consenting to this for sally's sake amelius bowed in silence he would not have confessed what he felt at that moment to any living soul it is doubtful if he even confessed it to himself. Mrs. Payson, observing him with a woman's keen sympathy, relented a little. I might give her a message, the good lady suggested, just to say you are glad to hear she is behaving so well. Will you give her this? Amelius asked. He took from his pocket a little photograph of the cottage, which he had noticed on the house agent's desk and had taken away with him. It is my cottage now, he explained, in tones that faltered a little. I am going to live there. Sally might like to see it. Sally shall see it, Mrs. Grayson agreed, if you will only let me take this away first. She pointed to the address of the cottage printed under the photograph. Past experience in the home made her reluctant to trust Sally with the address in London at which Amelius was to be found. Rufus produced a huge, complex knife, out of the depth of which a pair of scissors burst on touching a spring. Mrs. Payson cut off the address and placed the photograph in her pocket book. Now, she said, Sally will be happy, and no harm can come of it. I've known you, ma'am, nigh on twenty years, Rufus remarked. I do assure you, that's the first rash observation I ever heard from your lips. End of Book Six Chapter 6 Book 7 Chapter 1 The Vanishing Hopes of The Fallen Leaves This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros the Fallen Leaves by Wilkie Collins Book 7, Chapter 1 Two days later, Emilius moved into his cottage. He had provided himself with a new servant as easily as he had provided himself with a new abode. A foreign waiter at the hotel, a gray-haired Frenchman of the old school, reputed to be the most ill-tempered servant in the house, had felt the genial influence of Emilius with the receptive readiness of his race. Here was a young Englishman who spoke to him as easily and pleasantly as if he was speaking to a friend, who heard him relate his little grievances, and never took advantage of that circumstance to turn him into ridicule, who said kindly, I hope you don't mind my calling you by your nickname, when he ventured to explain that his Christian name was Theophil, and that his English fellow-servants had facetiously altered and shortened it to Toff, to suit their insular convenience. For the first time, sir, he had hastened to add, I feel it an honor to be Toff when you speak to me. Asking everybody whom he met if they could recommend a servant to him, Emilius had put the question when Toff came in one morning with the hot water. The old Frenchman made a low bow, expressive of devotion. I know of but one man, sir, whom I can safely recommend, he answered, take me. Emilius was delighted. He had only one objection to make. I don't want to keep two servants, he said, while Toff was helping him on with his dressing gown. 
"'Why should you keep two servants, sir?' the Frenchman inquired. Amelius answered, "'I can't ask you to make the beds.' "'Why not?' said Toff, and made the bed then and there in five minutes. He ran out of the room and came back with one of the chambermaid's brooms. "'Judge for yourself, sir. Can I sweep a carpet?' He placed a chair for Amelius. "'Permit me to save you the trouble of shaving yourself. Are you satisfied?' very good i am equally capable of cutting your hair and attending to your corns if you suffer sir from that inconvenience will you allow me to propose something which you have not had yet for your breakfast in half an hour more he brought in the new dish oeufs a la tripe an elementary specimen sir of what i can do for you as a cook be pleased to taste it emilius ate it all up on the spot and Toff applied the moral, with the neatest choice of language. Thank you, sir, for a gratifying expression of approval. One more specimen of my poor capabilities, and I have done. It is barely possible, God forbid, that you may fall ill. Honor me by reading that document. He handed a written paper to Amelius, dated some years since in Paris, and signed in an English name, I testify with gratitude and pleasure that Théophile Le Blond has nursed me through a long illness with an intelligence and devotion which I cannot too highly praise. May you never employ me, sir, in that capacity, said Toff. I have only to add that I am not so old as I look, and that my political opinions have changed in later life from red Republican to moderate liberal. I also confess, if necessary, that I still have an ardent admiration for the fair sex. He laid his hand on his heart and waited to be engaged. So the household at the cottage was modestly limited to Emilius and Toff. Rufus remained for another week in London to watch the new experiment. He had made careful inquiries into the Frenchman's character, and had found that the complaints of his temper really amounted to this, that he gave himself the airs of a gentleman, and didn't understand a joke. On the question of honesty and sobriety, the testimony of the proprietor of the hotel left Rufus nothing to desire. Greatly to his surprise, Amelius showed no disposition to grow weary of his quiet life, or to take refuge in perilous amusements from the sober society of his books. He was regular in his inquiries at Mr. Farnaby's house. He took long walks by himself. He never mentioned Sally's name. He lost his interest in going to the theatre, and he never appeared in the smoking-room of the club. Some men, observing the remarkable change which had passed over his excitable temperament, would have hailed it as a good sign for the future. The New Englander looked below the surface and was not so easily deceived. My bright boy's soul is discouraged and cast down, was the conclusion that he drew. There's darkness in him where there once was light. And what's worse than all, he caves in and keeps it to himself. After vainly trying to induce Amelius to open his heart, Rufus at last went to Paris with a mind that was ill at ease. On the day of the American's departure, the march of events was resumed, and the unnaturally quiet life of Emilius began to be disturbed again. Making his customary inquiries in the forenoon at Mr. Farnaby's door, he found the household in a state of agitation. A second council of physicians had been held, in consequence of the appearance of some alarming symptoms in the case of the patient. On this occasion, the medical man told him plainly that he would sacrifice his life to his obstinacy if he persisted in remaining in London and returning to his business. By good fortune, the affairs of the bank had greatly benefited through the powerful interposition of Mr. Melton. With the improved prospects, Mr. Farnaby, at his niece's entreaty, submitted to the doctor's advice. He was to start on the first stage of his journey the next morning, and, at his own earnest desire, Regina was to go with him. I hate strangers and foreigners, and I don't like being alone. If you don't go with me, I shall stay where I am and die. 
so mr farnaby put it to his adopted daughter in his rasping voice and with his hard frown i am grieved dear amelius to go away from you regina said but what can i do it would have been so nice if you could have gone with us i did hint something of the sort but her downcast face finished the sentence Amelius felt the bare idea of being Mr. Farnaby's travelling companion make his blood run cold, and Mr. Farnaby on his side reciprocated the sentiment. "'I will write constantly, dear,' Regina resumed, "'and you will write back, won't you? Say you love me, and promise to come to-morrow morning before we go.' She kissed him affectionately, and the instant after checked the responsive outburst of tenderness in Amelius by that utter want of tact which, in spite of the popular delusion to the contrary, is so much more common in women than in men. "'My uncle is so particular about packing his linen,' she said. "'Nobody can please him but me. I must ask you to let me run upstairs again.' Amelius went out into the street with his head down and his lips fast closed. He was not far from Mrs. Payson's house. Why shouldn't I call, he thought to himself. His conscience added, and hear some news of Sally. There was good news. The girl was brightening mentally and physically. She was in a fair way, if she only remained in the home to be simple Sally no longer. Amelius asked her if she had got the photograph of the cottage. Mrs. Payson laughed. "'Sleeps with it under her pillow, poor child,' she said, "'and looks at it fifty times a day.' Thirty years since, with infinitely less experience to guide her, the worthy matron would have followed her instincts and would have hesitated to tell Amelius quite so much about the photograph." but some of the woman's finer sensibilities do get blunted with the advance of age and the accumulation of wisdom. Instead of pursuing the subject of Sally's progress, Amelius, to Mrs. Payson's surprise, made a clumsy excuse and abruptly took his leave. He felt the need of being alone. He was conscious of a vague distrust of himself which degraded him in his own estimation. Was he, like characters he had read of in books, the victim of a fatality? The slightest circumstances conspired to heighten his interest in Sally, just at the time when Regina had once more disappointed him. He was as firmly convinced, as if he had been the strictest moralist living, that it was an insult to Regina, and an insult to his own self-respect, to set the lost creature whom he had rescued in any light of comparison with the young lady who was one day to be his wife. And yet, try as he might to drive her out, Sally kept her place in his thoughts." there was apparently some innate depravity in him if a looking-glass had been handed to him at that moment he would have been ashamed to look himself in the face after walking until he was weary he went to his club the porter gave him a letter as he crossed the hall mrs farnaby had kept her promise and had written to him the smoking-room was deserted at that time of day he opened his letter in solitude looked at it crumpled it up impatiently, and put it into his pocket. Not even Mrs. Farnaby could interest him at that critical moment. His own affairs absorbed him. The one idea in his mind, after what he had heard about Sally, was the idea of making a last effort to hasten the date of his marriage before Mr. Farnaby left England. If I can only feel sure of Regina. His thoughts went no further than that. He walked up and down the empty smoking-room, anxious and irritable, dissatisfied with himself, despairing of the future. I can but try it, he suddenly decided, and turned at once to the table to write a letter. Death had been busy with the members of his family in the long interval that had passed since he and his father left England. His nearest surviving relative was his uncle, his father's younger brother, who occupied a post of high importance in the foreign office. To this gentleman, he now wrote, announcing his arrival in England, and his anxiety to qualify himself for employment in a government office. Be so good as to grant me an interview, he concluded, and I hope to satisfy you that I am not unworthy of your kindness, if you will exert your influence in my favor. 
he sent away his letter at once by a private messenger with instructions to wait for an answer it was not without doubt and even pain that he had opened communication with a man whose harsh treatment of his father it was impossible for him to forget what could the son expect there was but one hope time might have inclined the younger brother to make atonement to the memory of the elder by a favorable reception of his nephew's request his father's last words of caution his own boyish promise not to claim kindred with his relations in england were vividly present to the mind of emilius while he waited for the return of the messenger his one justification was in the motives that animated him circumstances which his father had never anticipated rendered it an act of duty towards himself to make the trial at least of what his family interest could do for him there could be no sort of doubt that a man of mr farnaby's character would yield if emilius could announce that he had the promise of an appointment under government with the powerful influence of a near relation to accelerate his promotion he sat idly drawing lines on the blotting paper at one moment regretting that he had sent his letter at another comforting himself in the belief that if his father had been living to advise him his father would have approved of the course that he had taken the messenger returned with these lines of reply under any ordinary circumstances i should have used my influence to help you on in the world but when you not only hold the most abominable political opinions but actually proclaim those opinions in public i am amazed at your audacity in writing to me there must be no more communication between us while you are a socialist you are a stranger to me emilius accepted this new rebuff with ominous composure he sat quietly smoking in the deserted room with his uncle's letter in his hand among the other disastrous results of the lecture some of the newspapers had briefly reported it preoccupied by his anxieties emilius had forgotten this when he wrote to his relative just like me he thought as he threw the letter into the fire his last hopes floated up the chimney with the tiny puff of smoke from the burnt paper there was now no other chance of shortening the marriage engagement left to try he had already applied to the good friend whom he had mentioned to regina the answer kindly written in this case had not been very encouraging i have other claims to consider all that i can do i will do don't be disheartened i only ask you to wait emilius rose to go home and sat down again his natural energy seemed to have deserted him it required an effort to leave the club he took up the newspapers and threw them aside one after another not one of the unfortunate writers and reporters could please him on that inauspicious day it was only while he was lighting his second cigar that he remembered mrs farnaby's unread letter to him by this time he was more than weary of his own affairs he read the letter i find the people who have my happiness at their mercy both dilatory and greedy mrs farnaby wrote but the little that i can persuade them to tell me is very favorable to my hopes i am still to my annoyance only in personal communication with the hateful old woman the young man either sends messages or writes to me through the post by this latter means he has accurately described not only in which of my child's feet the fault exists but the exact position which it occupies here you will agree with me is positive evidence that he is speaking the truth whoever he is but for this reassuring circumstance i should feel inclined to be suspicious of some things of the obstinate manner for instance in which the young man keeps himself concealed also of his privately warning me not to trust the woman who is his own messenger and not to tell her on any account of the information which his letters convey to me i feel that i ought to be cautious with him on the question of money and yet in my eagerness to see my darling i am ready to give him all that he asks for in this uncertain state of mind i am restrained strangely enough by the old woman herself 
she warns me that he is the sort of man if he once gets the money to spare himself the trouble of earning it it is the one hold i have over him she says so i control the burning impatience that consumes me as well as i can no i must not attempt to describe my own state of mind when i tell you that i am actually afraid of dying before i can give my sweet love the first kiss you will understand and pity me when night comes i feel sometimes half mad i send you my present address in the hope that you will write and cheer me a little i must not ask you to come and see me yet i am not fit for it and besides i am under a promise in the present state of the negotiations to shut the door on my friends it is easy enough to do that i have no friend emilius but you try to feel compassionately towards me my kind-hearted boy for so many long years my heart has had nothing to feed on but the one hope that is now being realized at last no sympathy between my husband and me on the contrary a horrid unacknowledged enmity which has always kept us apart my mother and father in their time both wretched about my marriage and with good reason my only sister dying in poverty what a life for a childless woman don't let us dwell on it any longer good-bye for the present emilius i beg you will not think i am always wretched when i want to be happy i look to the coming time this melancholy letter added to the depression that weighed on the spirits of emilius it inspired him with vague fears for mrs farnaby in her own interest he would have felt himself tempted to consult rufus without mentioning names if the american had been in london as things were he put the letter back in his pocket with a sigh even mrs farnaby in her sad moments had a consoling prospect to contemplate everybody but me amelius thought his reflections were interrupted by the appearance of an idle young member of the club with whom he was acquainted the newcomer remarked that he looked out of spirits and suggested that they should dine together and amuse themselves somewhere in the evening emilius accepted the proposal any man who offered him a refuge from himself was a friend to him on that day departing from his temperate habits he deliberately drank more than usual the wine excited him for the time and then left him more depressed than ever and the amusements of the evening produced the same result he returned to his cottage so completely disheartened that he regretted the day when he had left tadmore but he kept his appointment the next morning to take leave of regina the carriage was at the door with a luggage-laden cab waiting behind it mr farnaby's ill temper vented itself in predictions that they would be too late to catch the train his harsh voice alternating with regina's meek remonstrances reached the ears of emilius from the breakfast-room i'm not going to wait for the gentleman socialist mr farnaby announced with his hardest sarcasm of tone dear uncle we have a quarter of an hour to spare we have nothing of the sort we want all that time to register the luggage the servant's voice was heard next mr goldenheart miss mr farnaby instantly stepped into the hall good-bye he called to emilius through the open door of the dining-room and passed straight on to the carriage i shan't wait regina he shouted from the doorstep let him go by himself said emilius indignantly as regina hurried into the room oh hush hush dear suppose he heard you no week shall pass without my writing to you promise you will write back emilius one more kiss oh my dear the servant interposed keeping discreetly out of sight i beg your pardon miss my master wishes to know whether you are going with him or not regina waited to hear no more she gave her lover a farewell look to remember her by and ran out that innate depravity which emilius had lately discovered in his own nature let the forbidden thoughts loose in him again as he watched the departing carriage from the door if poor little sally had been in her place he made an effort of virtuous resolution and stopped there what a blackguard a man may be he penitently reflected without suspecting it himself 
he descended the house steps the discreet servant wished him good morning with a certain cheery respect the man was delighted to have seen the last of his hard master for some months to come amelia stopped and turned round smiling grimly he was in such a reckless humour that he was even ready to divert his mind by astonishing a footman richard he said are you engaged to be married richard stared in blank surprise at the strange question and modestly admitted that he was engaged to marry the housemaid next door soon asked emilius swinging his stick as soon as i have saved a little more money sir damn the money cried emilius and struck his stick on the pavement and walked away with a last look at the house as if he hated the sight of it richard watched the departing young gentleman and shook his head ominously as he shut the door end of book 7 chapter 1book 7 Chapter 2 of The Fallen Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Fallen Leaves by Wilkie Collins. Book 7, Chapter 2. Amelius went straight back to the cottage, with the one desperate purpose of reverting to the old plan, and burying himself in his books. Surveying his well-filled shelves with an impatience unworthy of a scholar, Hume's History of England unhappily caught his eye. He took down the first volume. In less than half an hour he discovered that Hume could do nothing for him, Wisely inspired, he turned to the truer history next, which men call fiction. The writings of the one supreme genius, who soars above all other novelists, as Shakespeare soars above all other dramatists, the writings of Walter Scott, had their place of honor in his library. The collection of the Waverley novels at Tadmore had not been complete. Enviable Amelius had still to read Rob Roy. He opened the book. For the rest of the day he was in love with Diana Vernon, and when he looked out once or twice to the garden to rest his eyes, he saw Andrew Fairservice busy over the flower beds. He closed the last page of the noble story as Toff came in to lay the cloth for dinner. The master at table and the servant behind his chair were accustomed to gossip pleasantly during meals. Amelius did his best to carry on the talk as usual but he was no longer in the delightful world of illusion which Scott had opened to him. The hard realities of his own everyday life had gathered round him again. Observing him with unobtrusive attention, the Frenchman soon perceived the absence of the easy humour and the excellent appetite which distinguished his young master at other times. "'May I venture to make a remark, sir?' Toff inquired after a long pause in the conversation. "'Certainly. And may I take the liberty of expressing my sentiments freely? Of course you may. "'Dear sir, you have a pretty little simple dinner to-day,' Toff began. "'Forgive me for praising myself. I am influenced by the natural pride of having cooked the dinner. For soup you have crouton pot. For meat you have turned au à la sauce poivrade. For pudding you have pommes au beurre.' also nice and you hardly eat anything and your amiable conversation falls into a melancholy silence which fills me with regret is it you who are to blame for this no sir it is the life you lead i call it the life of a monk i call it the life of a hermit i say boldly it is the life of all others which is most unsympathetic to a young man like you Pardon the warmth of my expressions, I am eager to make my language the language of utmost delicacy. May I quote a little song? It is in an old, old, old French piece, long since forgotten, called Les Marie Garçons. There are two lines in that song. I have often heard my good father sing them, which I will venture to apply to your case. Amour, delicatesse et gaieté. 
Don bon français, c'est la devise. So you have naturally delicatesse and gait, but the last has for some days been under a cloud. What is wanted to remove that cloud? L'amour, love, as you say in English. Where is the charming woman who is the only ornament wanting to this sweet cottage? Why is she invisible? Remedy that unhappy oversight, sir. You are here in a suburban paradise. I consult my long experience, and I implore you to invite Eve. Ha! You smile. Your lost gaiety returns, and you feel it as I do. Might I propose another glass of claret, and the reappearance on the table of the turn d'eau à la poivrade? It was impossible to be melancholy in this man's company. Amelia sanctioned the return of the turn d'eau, and tried the other glass of claret. My good friend, he said, with something like a return of his old easy way, you talk about charming women and your long experience. Let's hear what your experience has been. For the first time, Toff began to look a little confused. You have honored me, sir, by calling me your good friend, he said. After that, I am sure you will not send me away if I own the truth. No, my heart tells me I shall not appeal to your indulgence in vain. Dear sir, in the holidays which you kindly give me, I provide competent persons to take care of the house in my absence, don't I? One person, if you remember, was a most handsome, engaging young man. He is, if you please, my son, by my first wife, now an angel in heaven. Another person who took care of the house on the next occasion was a little black-eyed boy, a miracle of discretion for his age. He is my son by my second wife, now another angel in heaven. Forgive me, I have not done yet. Some days since, you thought you heard an infant crying downstairs. Like a miserable wretch, I lied. I declared it was the infant in the next house. Ah, uh, sir, it was my own cherubim baby, by my third wife, an angel close by in the Edgware Road, established in a small milliner shop which will expand to great things by and by. The intervals between my marriages are not worthy of your notice. Fugitive caprices, sir, fugitive caprices. To sum it all up, as you say in England, it is not in me to resist the enchanting sex. If my third angel dies, I shall tear my hair, but I shall none the less take a fourth. Take a dozen, if you like, said Emilius. Why should you have kept all this from my knowledge? Toff hung his head. I think it was one of my foreign mistakes, he pleaded. The servants' advertisements in your English newspapers frighten me. How does the most meritorious manservant announce himself when he wants the best possible place? He says he is without encumbrances. Gracious heaven, what a dreadful word to describe the poor, pretty, harmless children. I was afraid, sir, you might have some English objection to my encumbrances. A young man a boy, and a cherubim baby, not to speak of the sacred memories of two women and the charming occasional society of a third, all inextricably enveloped in the life of one amorous, meritorious French person. Surely there was reason for hesitation here. No matter, I bless my stars I know better now, and I withdraw myself from further notice. Permit me to recall your attention to the Rockford cheese and a mouthful of potato salad to correct the richness of him. The dinner was over at last. Amelius was alone again. It was a still evening. Not a breath of wind stirred among the trees in the garden. No vehicles passed along the by-road in which the cottage stood. Now and then, Toff was audible downstairs, singing French songs in a high, cracked voice, while he washed the plates and dishes and set everything in order for the night. Amelius looked at his bookshelves and felt that, after Rob Roy, there was no more reading for him that evening. The slow minutes followed one another wearily. The deadly depression of the earlier hours of the day was stealthily fastening its hold on him again. How might he best resist it? His healthy out-of-door habits at Tadmore suggested the only remedy that he could think of. Be his troubles what they might, his one simple method of resisting them at all other times was his simple method now. He went out for a walk. 
For two hours he rambled about the great northwestern suburb of London. Perhaps he felt the heavy oppressive weather, or perhaps his good dinner had not agreed with him. Anyway, he was so thoroughly worn out that he was obliged to return to the cottage in a cab. Toff opened the door, but not with his customary alacrity. Emilius was too completely fatigued to notice any trifling circumstance. Otherwise he would certainly have perceived something odd in the old Frenchman's withered face. He looked at his master as he relieved him of his hat and coat, with the strangest expression of interest and anxiety, modified by a certain sardonic sense of amusement underlying the more serious emotions. "'A nasty dull evening,' Amelius said wearily. And Toff, always eager to talk at other times, only answered, Yes, sir, and retreated at once to the kitchen regions. The fire was bright, the curtains were drawn, the reading lamp with its ample green shade was on the table, a more comfortable room no man could have found to receive him after a long walk. Reclining at his ease in his chair, Emilius thought of ringing for some restorative brandy and water. While he was thinking, he fell asleep, and while he slept, he dreamed. Was it a dream? He certainly saw the library, not fantastically transformed, but just like what the room really was. So far he might have been wide awake, looking at the familiar objects round him. But after a while, an event happened which set the laws of reality at defiance. Simple Sally, miles away in the home, made her appearance in the library nevertheless. He saw the drawn curtains over the window parted from behind. He saw the girl step out from them and stop, looking at him timidly. She was clothed in the plain dress that he had bought for her, and she looked more charming in it than ever. The beauty of health claimed kindred now in her pretty face, with the beauty of youth, the wan cheeks had begun to fill out, and the pale lips were delicately suffused with their natural rosy red. Little by little her first fears seemed to subside. She smiled and softly crossed the room and stood at his side. After looking at him with a rapt expression of tenderness and delight, she laid her hands on the arm of the chair and said in the quaintly quiet way which he remembered so well, I want to kiss you. She bent over him and kissed him with the innocent freedom of a child. Then she raised herself again and looked backwards and forwards between Amelius and the lamp. The firelight is the best, she said. Darkness fell over the room as she spoke. He saw her no more. He heard her no more. A blank interval followed. There flowed over him the oblivion of perfect sleep. His next conscious sensation was a feeling of cold. He shivered and woke. The impression of the dream was in his mind at the moment of waking. He started as he raised himself in the chair. Was he dreaming still? No, he was certainly awake, and as certainly the room was dark. He looked and looked. It was not to be denied or explained away. There was the fire burning low and leaving the room chilly, and there, just visible on the table, in the flicker of the dying flame, was the extinguished lamp. He mended the fire and put his hand on the bell to ring for Toff and thought better of it. What need had he of the lamplight? He was too weary for reading. He preferred going to sleep again and dreaming again of Sally. Where was the harm in dreaming of the poor little soul so far away from him? The happiest part of his life now was the part of it that was passed in sleep. As the fresh coals began to kindle feebly, he looked again at the lamp. It was odd, to say the least of it, that the light should have accidentally gone out exactly at the right time to realize the fanciful extinction of it in his dream. How was it there was no smell of a burnt-out lamp? He was too lazy or too tired to pursue the question. Let the mystery remain a mystery, and let him rest in peace." He settled himself fretfully in his chair. What a fool he was to bother his head about a lamp, instead of closing his eyes and going to sleep again. The room began to recover its pleasant temperature. He shifted the cushion in the chair so that it supported his head in perfect comfort, and composed himself to rest. 
but the capricious influences of sleep had deserted him he tried one position after another and all in vain it was a mere mockery even to shut his eyes he resigned himself to circumstances and stretched out his legs and looked at the companionable fire of late he had thought more frequently than usual of his past days in the community his mind went back again now to that bygone time the clock on the mantelpiece struck nine they were all at supper at tadmore talking over the events of the day he saw himself again at the long wooden table with shy little mellicent in the chair next to him and his favorite dog at his feet waiting to be fed where was mellicent now it was a sad letter that she had written to him with the strange fixed idea that he was to return to her one day there was something very winning and lovable about the poor creature who had lived such a hard life at home and had suffered so keenly it was a comfort to think that she would go back to the community what happier destiny could she hope for would she take care of his dog for him when she went back they had all promised to be kind to his pet animals in his absence but the dog was fond of mellicent he would be happier with mellicent than with the rest of them and his little tame fawn and his birds how were they doing he had not even written to inquire after them he had been cruelly forgetful of those harmless dumb loving friends in his present solitude in his dreary doubts of the future what would he not give to feel the dog nestling in his bosom and the fawn's little rough tongue licking his hand his heart ached as he thought of it a choking hysterical sensation oppressed his breathing he tried to rise and ring for lights and rouse his manhood to endure and resist it was not to be done where was his courage where was the cheerfulness which had never failed him at other time he sank back in his chair and hid his face in his hands for shame at his own weakness and burst out crying the touch of soft persuasive fingers suddenly thrilled through him his hands were gently drawn away from his face a familiar voice sweet and low said oh don't cry dimly through his tears he saw the well-remembered little figure standing between him and the fire in his unendurable loneliness he had longed for his dog he had longed for his fawn there was the martyred creature from the streets whom he had rescued from nameless horror waiting to be his companion servant friend there was the child victim of cold and hunger still only feeling her way to womanhood innocent of all other aspirations so long as she might fill the place which had once been occupied by the dog and the fawn amelius looked at her with a momentary doubt whether he was waking or sleeping good god he cried am i dreaming again no she said simply you are awake this time let me dry your eyes i know where you put your handkerchief she perched on his knee and wiped away the tears and smoothed his hair over his forehead i was frightened to show myself till i heard you crying she confessed then i thought come he can't be angry with me now and i crept out from behind the curtains there the old man let me in i can't live without seeing you i've tried till i could try no longer i owned it to the old man when he opened the door i said i only want to look at him won't you let me in and he says god bless me here's eve come already i don't know what he meant he let me in that's all i care about he's a funny old foreigner send him away i'm to be your servant now why were you crying i've cried often enough about you no that can't be i can't expect you to cry about me i can only expect you to scold me i know i'm a bad girl she cast one doubtful look at him and hung her head waiting to be scolded amelius lost all control over himself he took her in his arms and kissed her again and again you are a dear good grateful little creature he burst out and suddenly stopped aware too late of the act of imprudence which he had committed he put her away from him he tried to ask severe questions and to administer merited reproof even if he had succeeded sally was too happy to listen to him it's all right now she cried i'm never 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 to go back to the home oh i'm so happy let's light the lamp again she found the match-box on the chimney-piece in a minute more the room was bright 
Amelia sat looking at her, perfectly incapable of deciding what he ought to say or do next. To complete his bewilderment, the voice of the attentive old Frenchman made itself heard through the door in discreetly confidential tones. "'I have prepared an appetizing little supper, sir,' said Toff. "'Be pleased to ring when you and the young lady are ready.'" End of Book 7 Chapter 2book 7 chapter 3 of the fallen leaves this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by rita butros the fallen leaves by wilkie collins book 7 the vanishing hopes chapter 3 Toff's interference proved to have its use. The announcement of the little supper, plainly implying simple Sally's reception at the cottage, reminded Emilius of his responsibilities. He at once stepped out into the passage and closed the door behind him. The old Frenchman was waiting to be reprimanded or thanked, as the case might be, with his head down, his shoulders shrugged up to his ears, and the palms of his hands spread out appealingly on either side of him, a model of mute resignation to circumstances. "'Do you know that you have put me in a very awkward position?' Amelius began. Toff lifted one of his hands to his heart. "'You are aware of my weakness, sir. "'When that charming little creature presented herself at the door, "'sinking with fatigue, I could no more resist her "'than I could take a hop, skip, and jump over the roof of this cottage. "'If I have done wrong, take no account of the proud fidelity "'with which I have served you. "'Tell me to pack up and go, "'but don't ask me to assume a position of severity towards that enchanting miss.' "'It is not in my heart to do it,' said Toff, lifting his eyes with tearful solemnity to an imaginary heaven. "'On my sacred word of honour as a Frenchman, I would die rather than do it.' "'Don't talk nonsense,' Emilius rejoined a little impatiently. "'I don't blame you, but you have got me into a scrape, for all that. "'If I did my duty, I should send for a cab and take her back.' Toff opened his twinkling old eyes in a perfect transport of astonishment. What, he cried, take her back, without rest, without supper, and you call that duty? How inconceivably ugly does duty look when it assumes an inhospitable aspect towards a woman? Pardon me, sir, I must express my sentiments or I shall burst. You will say, perhaps, that I have no conception of duty. Pardon me again. My conception of duty is here. He threw open the door of the sitting-room. In spite of his anxiety, Emilius burst out laughing. The Frenchman's inexhaustible contrivances had transformed the sitting-room into a bedroom for Sally. The sofa had become a snug little white bed. A hairbrush and comb and a bottle of eau de cologne were on the table. A bath stood near the fire with cans of hot and cold water and a railway rug placed under them to save the carpet. "'I dare not presume to contradict you, sir,' said Toff, "'but there is my conception of duty. "'In the kitchen I have another conception keeping warm. "'You can smell it up the stairs. "'Sell me a partridge with the littlest possible dash of garlic in the sauce. "'Oh, sir, let that angel rest and refresh herself. "'Virtuous severity, believe me, is a most horribly unbecoming virtue at your age.' He spoke quite seriously, with the air of a profound moralist asserting principles that did equal honor to his head and his heart. Emilius went back to the library. Sally was resting in the easy chair. Her position showed plainly that she was suffering from fatigue. "'I have had a long, long walk,' she said, "'and I don't know which aches worst, my back or my feet. "'I don't care. I'm quite happy now I'm here.' She nestled herself comfortably in the chair. "'Do you mind my looking at you?' she asked. "'Oh, it's so long since I saw you.' There was a new undertone of tenderness in her voice, innocent tenderness that openly avowed itself. The reviving influences of the life at the home had done much, and had much yet left to do. 
Her wasted face and figure were filling out. Her cheeks and lips were regaining their lovely natural color, as Emilius had seen in his dream. But her eyes in repose still resumed their vacantly patient look, and her manner, with a perceptible increase of composure and confidence, had not lost its quaint childish charm. Her growth from girl to woman was a growth of fine gradations, guided by the unerring deliberation of nature and time. "'Do you think they will follow you here from the home?' Amelius asked. She looked at the clock. "'I don't think so,' she said quietly. "'It's hours since I slipped out by the back door. They have very strict rules about runaway girls, even when their friends bring them back. If you send me back—' She stopped and looked thoughtfully into the fire. "'What will you do if I send you back?' What one of our girls did before they took her in at the home, she jumped into the river, made a hole in the water, that's how she calls it. She's a big, strong girl, and they got her out and saved her. She says it wasn't painful till they brought her to again. I'm little and weak. I don't think they could bring me to life if they tried." Amelius made a futile attempt to reason with her. He even got so far as to tell her that she had done very wrong to leave the home. Sally's answer set all further expostulation at defiance. Instead of attempting to defend herself, she sighed wearily and said, I had no money. I walked all the way here. The well-intended remonstrances of Emilius were lost in compassionate surprise. You poor little soul, he exclaimed, it must be seven or eight miles at least. I dare say, said Sally, it, it don't matter now I've found you. "'But how did you find me? Who told you where I lived?' She smiled and took from her bosom the photograph of the cottage. "'But Mrs. Payson cut off the address,' cried Emilius, bursting out with the truth in the impulse of the moment. Sally turned over the photograph and pointed to the back of the card, on which the photographer's name and address were printed. "'Mrs. Payson didn't think of this,' she said shyly. "'Did you think of it?' Emilius asked." Sally shook her head. I'm too stupid, she replied. The girl who made the hole in the water put me up to it. Have you made up your mind to run away, she says, and I said yes. You go to the man who did the picture, she says. He knows where the place is, I'll be bound. I asked my way till I found him, and he did know, and he told me. He was a good sort. He gave me a glass of beer. He said I looked so tired. I said we'd go and have our portraits taken some day, you and your servant. May I tell the funny old foreigner that he is to go away now I have come to you? The complete simplicity with which she betrayed her jealousy of Toff made Amelia smile. Sally, watching every change in his face, instantly drew her own conclusion. Ah, oh, she said cheerfully, I'll keep your room cleaner than he keeps it. I smelt dust on the curtains when I was hiding from you. Emilius thought of his dream. Did you come out while I was asleep? he asked. Yes, I wasn't frightened of you when you were asleep. I had a good look at you, and I gave you a kiss. She made that confession without the slightest sign of confusion. Her calm blue eyes looked him straight in the face. You got restless, she went on, and I got frightened again. I put out the lamp. I says to myself, if he does scold me, I can bear it better in the dark. Amelius listened, wondering, had he seen drowsily what he thought he had dreamed, or was there some mysterious sympathy between Sally and himself? The occult speculations were interrupted by Sally. May I take off my bonnet and make myself tidy, she asked. Some men might have said no. Amelius was not one of them. The library possessed a door of communication with the sitting-room, the bedchamber occupied by Amelius being on the other side of the cottage. When Sally saw Toff's reconstructed room, she stood at the door in speechless admiration of the vision of luxury revealed to her. From time to time Amelius, alone in the library, heard her dabbling in her bath, and humming the artless old English song from which she had taken her name. Once she knocked at the closed door and made a request through it. There is scent on the table. May I have some? And once Toff knocked at the other door, opening into the passage, and asked when pretty young miss would be ready for supper. 
events went on in the little household as if sally had become an integral part of it already what am i to do emilius asked himself and toff entering at the moment to lay the cloth answered respectfully hurry the young person sir or the salmi will be spoilt she came out from her room walking delicately on her sore feet so fresh and charming that toff absorbed in admiration made a mistake in folding a napkin for the first time in his life champagne of course sir he said in confidence to emilius the salmi of partridge appeared the inspiriting wine sparkled in the glasses toff surpassed himself in all the qualities which made a servant invaluable at a supper table sally forgot the home forgot the cruel streets and laughed and chattered as gaily as the happiest girl living amelius expanding in the joyous atmosphere of youth and good spirits shook off his sense of responsibility and became once more the delightful companion who won everybody's love the effervescent gaiety of the evening was at its climax the awful forms of duty propriety and good sense had been long since laughed out of the room when nemesis goddess of retribution announced her arrival outside by a crashing of carriage wheels and a peremptory ring at the cottage bell there was dead silence amelius and sally looked at each other the experienced toff at once guessed what had happened is it her father or mother he asked of amelius a little anxiously hearing that she had never even seen her father or mother he snapped his fingers joyously and led the way on tiptoe into the hall i have my idea he whispered let us listen a woman's voice high clear and resolute speaking apparently to the coachman was the next audible sound say i come from mrs payson and must see mr golden heart directly sally trembled and turned pale the matron she said faintly oh don't let her in amelius took the terrified girl back to the library toff followed them respectfully asking to be told what a matron was receiving the necessary explanation he expressed his contempt for matrons bent on carrying charming persons into captivity by opening the library door and spitting into the hall having relieved his mind in this way he returned to his master and laid a lank skinny forefinger cunningly along the side of his nose i suppose sir you don't want to see this furious woman he said before it was possible to say anything in reply another ring at the bell announced that the furious woman wanted to see amelius toff read his master's wishes in his master's face not even this emergency could find him unprepared he was as ready to circumvent a matron as to cook a dinner the shutters are up and the curtains are drawn he reminded amelius not a morsel of light is visible outside let them ring we have all gone to bed he turned to sally grinning with impish enjoyment of his own stratagem ha miss what do you think of that there was a third pull at the bell as he spoke ring away mrs matron he cried we are fast asleep wake us if you can the fourth ring was the last a sharp crack revealed the breaking of the bell wire and was followed by the shrill fall of the iron handle on the pavement before the garden gate the gate like the palings was protected at the top from invading cats compose yourself miss said toff if she tries to get over the gate she will stick on the spikes in another moment the sound of retiring carriage wheels announced the defeat of the matron and settled the serious question of receiving sally for the night she sat silent by the window when toff had left the room holding back the curtains and looking out at the murky sky what are you looking for amelius asked i was looking for the stars amelius joined her at the window there are no stars to be seen to-night she let the curtain fall to again i was thinking of night-time at the home she said you see i got on pretty well in the day with my reading and writing i wanted so to improve myself my mind was troubled with the fear of your despising such an ignorant creature as i am so i kept on at my lessons I thought I might surprise you by writing you a pretty letter some day. 
one of the teachers she's gone away ill was very good to me i used to talk to her and when i said a wrong word she took me up and told me the right one she said you would think better of me when you heard me speak properly and i do speak better don't i all this was in the day it was the night that was the hard time to get through when the other girls were all asleep and i had nothing to think of but how far away i was from you i used to get up and put the counterpane round me and stand at the window on fine nights the stars were company to me there were two stars near together that i got to know don't laugh at me i used to think one of them was you and one of them me I wondered whether you would die or I should die before I saw you again, and most always it was my star that went out first. Lord, how I used to cry. It got into my poor stupid head that I should never see you again. I do believe I ran away because of that. You won't tell anybody, will you? It was so foolish. I am ashamed of it now. I wanted to see your star and my star tonight. I don't know why. Oh, I'm so fond of you she dropped on her knees and took his hand and put it on her head it's burning hot she said and your kind hand cools it amelius raised her gently and led her to the door of her room my poor sally you are quite worn out you want rest and sleep let us say good night i will do anything you tell me she answered if mrs payson comes to-morrow you won't let her take me away thank you good night she put her hands on his shoulders with innocent familiarity and lifted herself to him on tiptoe and kissed him as a sister might have kissed him long after sally was asleep in her bed amelia sat by the library fire thinking the revival of the crushed feeling and fancy in the girl's nature so artlessly revealed in her sad little story of the stars that were company to her not only touched and interested him but clouded his view of the future with doubts and anxieties which had never troubled him until that moment the mysterious influences under which the girl's development was advancing were working morally and physically together weeks might pass harmlessly months might pass harmlessly but the time must come when the innocent relations between them would be beset by peril unable as yet fully to realize these truths amelius nevertheless felt them vaguely his face was troubled as he lit the candle at last to go to his bed i don't see my way as clearly as i could wish he reflected how will it end how indeed end of book seven chapter three book seven Chapter Four of The Fallen Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Fallen Leaves by Wilkie Collins. Book Seven The Vanishing Hopes. Chapter Four. At eight o'clock the next morning, Emilius was awakened by Toff. A letter had arrived marked immediate, and the messenger was waiting for an answer. The letter was from Mrs. Payson. She wrote briefly and in formal terms. After referring to the matron's fruitless visit to the cottage on the previous night, Mrs. Payson proceeded in these words, I request you will immediately let me know whether Sally has taken refuge with you and has passed the night under your roof. If I am right in believing that she has done so, I have only to inform you that the doors of the home are henceforth closed to her in conformity with our rules. If I am wrong, it will be my painful duty to lose no time in placing the matter in the hands of the police." Amelius began his reply, acting on impulse as usual. He wrote, vehemently remonstrating with Mrs. Payson on the unforgiving and unchristian nature of the rules at the home. Before he was halfway through his composition, the person who had brought the letter sent a message to say that he was expected back immediately and that he hoped Mr. Goldenheart would not get a poor man into trouble by keeping him much longer. 
Checked in the full flow of his eloquence, Amelius angrily tore up the unfinished remonstrance and matched Mrs. Payson's briefly business-like language by an answer in one line. "'I beg to inform you that you are quite right.' On reflection he felt that the second letter was not only discourteous as a reply to a lady, but also ungrateful as addressed to Mrs. Payson personally. At the third attempt he wrote becomingly as well as briefly. Sally has passed the night here as my guest. She was suffering from severe fatigue. It would have been an act of downright inhumanity to send her away. I regret your decision, but of course I submit to it. You once said you believed implicitly in the purity of my motives. Do me the justice, however you may blame my conduct, to believe in me still. Having dispatched these lines, the mind of Amelius was at ease again. He went into the library and listened to hear if Sally was moving. The perfect silence on the other side of the door informed him that the weary girl was still fast asleep. He gave directions that she was on no account to be disturbed, and sat down to breakfast by himself. While he was still at table, Toff appeared, with profound mystery in his manner, and discreet confidence in the tones of his voice. "'Here's another one, sir,' the Frenchman announced in his master's ear. "'Another one?' Emilius repeated. "'What do you mean?' "'She is not like the sweet little sleeping miss,' Toff explained. "'This time, sir, it's the beauty of the devil himself, as we say in France. "'She refuses to confide in me, and she appears to be agitated. "'Both bad signs. "'Shall I get rid of her before the other miss wakes?' "'Hasn't she got a name?' Amelius asked. "'Toff answered in his foreign accent. Uh, "'One name only, uh, Phoebe. "'Do you mean Phoebe?' "'Have I not said it, sir? "'Show her in directly.' Toff glanced at the door of Sally's room, shrugged his shoulders, and obeyed his instructions. Phoebe appeared, looking pale and anxious. Her customary assurance of manner had completely deserted her. She stopped in the doorway, as if she was afraid to enter the room. "'Come in and sit down,' said Emilius. "'What's the matter?' "'I'm troubled in my mind, sir,' Phoebe answered. I know it's taking a liberty to come to you, but I went yesterday to ask Miss Regina's advice, and found she had gone abroad with her uncle. I have something to say about Mrs. Farnaby, sir, and there's no time to be lost in saying it. I know of nobody but you that I can speak to. Now Miss Regina is away. The footman told me where you lived. She stopped, evidently in the greatest embarrassment. Amelius tried to encourage her. If I can be of any use to Mrs. Farnaby, he said, tell me at once what to do. Phoebe's eyes dropped before his straightforward look as he spoke to her. I must ask you to please excuse my mentioning names, sir, she resumed confusedly. There's a person I'm interested in whom I wouldn't get into trouble for the whole world. He's been misled. I'm sure he's been misled by another person, a wicked, drunken old woman who ought to be in prison if she had her deserts. I'm not free from blame myself. I know I'm not. I listened, sir, to what I oughtn't to have heard, and I told it again, I'm sure in the strictest confidence, and not meaning anything wrong, to the person I've mentioned. Not the old women. I mean the person I'm interested in. I hope you understand me, sir. I wish to speak openly, accepting the names on account of Mrs. Farnaby. Amelius thought of Phoebe's vindictive language the last time he had seen her. He looked towards a cabinet in a corner of the room in which he had placed Mrs. Farnaby's letter. An instinctive distrust of his visitor began to rise in his mind. His manner altered. He turned to his plate and went on with his breakfast. "'Can't you speak to me plainly?' he said. "'Is Mrs. Farnaby in any trouble?' "'Yes, sir. "'And can I do anything to help her out of it?' "'I am sure you can, sir, if you only knew where to find her.' "'I do know where to find her. "'She has written to tell me. "'The last time I saw you, "'you expressed yourself very improperly about Mrs. Farnaby. "'You spoke as if you meant some harm to her. "'I mean nothing but good to her now, sir.' "'Very well, then. Can't you go and speak to her yourself, if I give you the address?' 
Phoebe's pale face flushed a little. I couldn't do that, sir, she answered, after the way Mrs. Farnaby has treated me. Besides, if she knew that I had listened to what passed between her and you... She stopped again, more painfully embarrassed than ever. Emilius laid down his knife and fork. Look here, he said. This sort of thing is not in my way. If you can't make a clean breast of it, let's talk of something else. I'm very much afraid, he went on, with his customary absence of all concealment. You're not the harmless sort of girl I once took you for. What do you mean by what passed between Mrs. Farnaby and me? Phoebe put her handkerchief to her eyes. It's very hard to speak to me so harshly, she said, when I'm sorry for what I've done, and I'm only anxious to prevent harm coming of it. "'What have you done?' cried honest Amelius, weary of the woman's inveterately indirect way of explaining herself to him. The flash of his quick temper in his eyes, as he put that straightforward question, roused a responsive temper in Phoebe which stung her into speaking openly at last. She told Amelius what she had heard in the kitchen as plainly as she had told it to Jervy, with this one difference, that she spoke without insolence when she referred to Mrs. Farnaby. Listening in silence until she had done, Amelius started to his feet, and opening the cabinet, took from it Mrs. Farnaby's letter. He read the letter, keeping his back towards Phoebe, waited a moment thinking, and suddenly turned on the woman with a look that made her shrink in her chair. "'You wretch!' he said. "'You detestable wretch!' In the terror of the moment, Phoebe attempted to leave the room. Amelia stopped her instantly. "'Sit down again,' he said. "'I mean to have the whole truth out of you now.' Phoebe recovered her courage. You have had the whole truth, sir. I could tell you no more if I was on my deathbed. Amelius refused to believe her. There is a vile conspiracy against Mrs. Farnaby, he said. Do you mean to tell me you are not in it? So help me God, sir. I never even heard of it till yesterday. The tone in which she spoke shook the conviction of Amelius. The indescribable ring of truth was in it. "'There are two people who are cruelly deluding and plundering this poor lady,' he went on. "'Who are they?' "'I told you, if you remember, that I couldn't mention names, sir.' Amelius looked again at the letter. After what he had heard, there was no difficulty in identifying the invisible young man alluded to by Mrs. Farnaby with the unnamed person in whom Phoebe was interested. "'Who was he?' As the question passed through his mind, Amelius remembered the vagabond whom he had recognized with Phoebe in the street. There was no doubt of it now. The man who was directing the conspiracy in the dark was Jervy. Amelius would unquestionably have been rash enough to reveal this discovery if Phoebe had not stopped him. His renewed reference to Mrs. Farnaby's letter and his sudden silence after looking at it roused the woman's suspicions. "'If you're planning to get my friend into trouble,' she burst out, "'not another word shall pass my lips.' Even Amelius profited by the warning which that threat unintentionally conveyed to him. "'Keep your own secrets,' he said. "'I only want to spare Mrs. Farnaby a dreadful disappointment, "'but I must know what I am talking about when I go to her. "'Can't you tell me how you found out this abominable swindle?' Phoebe was perfectly willing to tell him, interpreting her long-involved narrative into plain English with the names added. These were the facts related." Mrs. Sowler, bearing in mind some talk which had passed between them on the occasion of a supper, had called at Phoebe's lodgings on the previous day, and had tried to entrap her into communicating what she knew of Mrs. Farnaby's secrets. The trap failing, Mrs. Sowler had tried bribery next, had promised Phoebe a large sum of money to be equally divided between them if she would only speak had declared that Jervy was perfectly capable of breaking his promise of marriage and, leaving them both in the lurch if he once got the money into his own pocket, and had thus informed Phoebe that the conspiracy, which was supposed to have been abandoned, was really in full progress without her knowledge. She had temporized with Mrs. Sowler, being afraid to set such a person openly at defiance, and had hurried away at once to have an explanation with Jervy. 
He was reported to be not at home. Her fruitless visit to Regina had followed, and there, so far as facts were concerned, was an end of the story. Amelius asked her no questions, and spoke as briefly as possible when she had done. "'I will go to Mrs. Farnaby this morning,' was all he said. "'Would you please let me hear how it ends?' Phoebe asked. Amelius pushed his pocket-book and pencil across the table to her, pointing to a blank leaf on which she could write her address. While she was thus employed, the attentive Toff came in, and— with his eye on Phoebe, whispered in his master's ear. He had heard Sally moving about. Would it be more convenient, under the circumstances, if she had her breakfast in her own room? Toff's astonishment was a sight to see when Emilius answered, Certainly not. Let her breakfast here. Phoebe rose to go. Her parting words revealed the double-sided nature that was in her, the good and evil in perpetual conflict which should be uppermost. "'Please don't mention me, sir, to Mrs. Farnaby,' she said. "'I don't forgive her for what she's done to me. I don't say I won't be even with her yet, but not in that way. I won't have her death laid at my door. Oh, but I know her temper, and I say it's as likely as not to kill her or drive her mad if she isn't warned about it in time. Never mind her losing her money. If it's lost, it's lost, and she's got plenty more. She may be robbed a dozen times over, for all I care, but don't let her set her heart on seeing her child and then find it's all a swindle. I hate her, but I can't and won't. Let that go on. Good morning, sir. Amelius was relieved by her departure. For a minute or two, he sat absently stirring his coffee and considering how he might most safely perform the terrible duty of putting Mrs. Farnaby on her guard. Toff interrupted his meditations by preparing the table for Sally's breakfast, and almost at the same moment Sally herself, fresh and rosy, opened her door a little way and looked in. "'You have had a fine long sleep,' said Amelius. "'Have you quite got over your walk yesterday?' "'Oh, yes,' she answered gaily. "'I only feel my long walk now in my feet. "'It hurts me to put my boots on. "'Can you lend me a pair of slippers?' "'A pair of my slippers? "'Why, Sally, you would be lost in them. "'What's the matter with your feet?' "'They're both sore, and I think one of them has got a blister on it. "'Come in, and let's have a look at it.' She came limping in with her feet bare. "'Don't scold me,' she pleaded. "'I couldn't put my stockings on again without washing them, and they're not dry yet.' "'I'll get you new stockings and slippers,' said Amelius. "'Which is the foot with the blister?' "'The left foot,' she answered, pointing to it. End of Book 7 Chapter 4《ハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバー let me see the blister said amelius sally looked longingly at the fire may i warm my feet first she asked they are so cold in those words she innocently deferred the discovery which if it had been made at the moment might have altered the whole after course of events amelius only thought now of preventing her from catching cold he sent toff for a pair of the warmest socks that he possessed and asked if he should put them on for her. She smiled and shook her head and put them on for herself. When they had done laughing at the absurd appearance of the little feet in the large socks, they only drifted farther and farther away from the subject of the blistered foot. Sally remembered the terrible matron and asked if anything had been heard of her that morning. Being told that Mrs. Payson had written, and that the doors of the institution were closed to her, she recovered her spirits, and began to wonder whether the offended authorities would let her have her clothes. Toff offered to go and make the inquiry later in the day, suggesting the purchase of slippers and stockings in the meantime, 
while Sally was having her breakfast. Amelius approved of the suggestion, and Toff set off on his errand with one of Sally's boots for a pattern. The morning had, by that time, advanced to ten o'clock. Amelius stood before the fire talking while Sally had her breakfast. Having first explained the reasons which made it impossible that she should live at the cottage in the capacity of his servant, he astonished her by announcing that he meant to undertake the superintendence of her education himself. They were to be master and pupil, while the lessons were in progress, and brother and sister at other times. And they were to see how they got on together on this plan, without indulging in any needless anxiety about the future. Amelius believed with perfect sincerity that he had hit on the only sensible arrangement under the circumstances, and Sally cried joyously, "'Oh, how good you are to me! The happy life has come at last!' At the hour when those words passed the daughter's lips, the discovery of the conspiracy burst upon the mother in all its baseness and in all its horror." The suspicion of her infamous employer, which had induced Mrs. Sowler to attempt to intrude herself into Phoebe's confidence, led her to make a visit of investigation at Jervie's lodgings later in the day. Informed, as Phoebe had been informed, that he was not at home, she called again some hours afterwards. By that time, the landlord had discovered that Jervie's luggage had been secretly conveyed away, and that his tenant had left him in debt for rent of the two best rooms in the house. No longer in any doubt of what had happened, Mrs. Sowler employed the remaining hours of the evening in making inquiries after the missing man. Not a trace of him had been discovered up to eight o'clock on the next morning. Shortly after nine o'clock, that is to say, towards the hour at which Phoebe paid her visit to Amelius, Mrs. Sowler, resolute to know the worst, made her appearance at the apartments occupied by Mrs. Farnaby. "'I wish to speak to you,' she began abruptly, "'about that young man we both know of. Have you seen anything of him lately?' Mrs. Farnaby, steadily on her guard, deferred answering the question, "'Why do you want to know?' she said." The reply was instantly ready, because I have reason to believe he has bolted with your money in his pocket. He has done nothing of the sort, Mrs. Farnaby rejoined. Has he got your money, Mrs. Sowler persisted? Tell me the truth, and I'll do the same by you. He has cheated me. If you're cheated too, it's your own interest to lose no time in finding him. The police may catch him yet. Has he got your money? The woman was in earnest, in terrible earnest. Her eyes and her voice both bore witness to it. She stood there, the living impersonation of those doubts and fears which Mrs. Farnaby had confessed in writing to Amelius. Her position at that moment was essentially a position of command. Mrs. Farnaby felt it in spite of herself. She acknowledged that Jervie had got the money. "'Did you send it to him?' or give it to him, Mrs. Sowler asked. I gave it to him. When? Yesterday evening. Mrs. Sowler clenched her fists and shook them in impotent rage. He's the biggest scoundrel living, she exclaimed furiously, and you're the biggest fool. Put on your bonnet and come to the police. If you get your money back again before he spent it all, don't forget it was through me." The audacity of the woman's language roused Mrs. Farnaby. She pointed to the door. "'You are an insolent creature,' she said. "'I have nothing more to do with you.' "'You have nothing more to do with me,' Mrs. Sowler repeated. "'You and the young man have settled it all between you, I suppose.' She laughed scornfully. "'I dare say now you expect to see him again?' Mrs. Farnaby was irritated into answering this. I expect to see him this morning, she said, at ten o'clock. And the lost young lady with him? Say nothing about my lost daughter. I won't even hear you speak of her. Mrs. Sowler sat down. Look at your watch, she said. It must be nigh on ten o'clock by this time. You'll make a disturbance in the house if you try to turn me out. I mean to wait here till ten o'clock. On the point of answering angrily, Mrs. Farnaby restrained herself. 
"'You are trying to force a quarrel on me,' she said. "'You shan't spoil the happiest morning of my life. "'Wait here by yourself.' She opened the door that led into her bedchamber and shut herself in. Perfectly impenetrable to any repulse that could be offered to her, Mrs. Sowler looked at the closed door with a sardonic smile and waited. The clock in the hall struck ten. Mrs. Farnaby returned again to the sitting-room, walked straight to the window, and looked out. "'Any sign of him?' said Mrs. Sowler. There were no signs of him. Mrs. Farnaby drew a chair to the window and sat down, her hands turned icy cold. She still looked out into the street. "'I'm going to guess what's happened,' Mrs. Sowler resumed. "'I'm a sociable creature, you know, and I must talk about something. About the money now? Has the young man had his travelling expenses of you to go to foreign parts and bring your girl back with him, eh? I expect that's how it was. You see, I know him so well.' And what happened, if you please, yesterday evening? Did he tell you he'd brought her back and got her at his own place? And did he say he wouldn't let you see her till you paid him his reward as well as his traveling expenses? And did you forget my warning to you not to trust him? I'm a good one at guessing when I try. I see you think so yourself. Any signs of him yet? Mrs. Farnaby looked round from the window. Her manner was completely changed. She was nervously civil to the wretch who was torturing her. "'I beg your pardon, ma'am, if I have offended you,' she said faintly. "'I am a little upset. I am so anxious about my poor child. Perhaps you are a mother yourself. You oughtn't to frighten me. You ought to feel for me.' She paused and put her hand to her head. "'He told me yesterday evening,' she went on, slowly and vacantly, that my poor darling was at his lodgings. He said she was so worn out with the long journey from abroad that she must have a night's rest before she could come to me. I asked him to tell me where he lived and let me go to her. He said she was asleep and must not be disturbed. I promised to go in on tiptoe and only look at her. I offered him more money, double the money, to tell me where she was. He was very hard on me. He only said, "'Wait till ten, tomorrow morning.' and wished me good night. I ran out to follow him and fell on the stairs and hurt myself. The people of the house were very kind to me. She turned her head back towards the window and looked out into the street again. I must be patient, she said. He's only a little late. Mrs. Sowler rose and tapped her smartly on the shoulder. Lies! she burst out. He knows no more where your daughter is than I do, and he's off with your money. The woman's hateful touch struck out a spark of the old fire in Mrs. Farnaby. Her natural force of character asserted itself once more. "'You lie,' she rejoined. "'Leave the room.' The door was opened while she spoke. A respectable woman servant came in with a letter. Mrs. Farnaby took it mechanically and looked at the address. Jervie's feigned handwriting was familiar to her. In the instant when she recognized it, the life seemed to go out of her like an extinguished light. She stood pale and still and silent, with the unopened letter in her hand. Watching her with malicious curiosity, Mrs. Sowler coolly possessed herself of the letter, looked at it, and recognized the writing in her turn. "'Stop!' she cried, as the servant was on the point of going out. "'There's no stamp on this letter. Was it brought by hand? Is the messenger waiting?' The respectable servant showed her opinion of Mrs. Sowler plainly in her face. She replied as briefly and as ungraciously as possible, No. Man or woman was the next question. Am I to answer this person, ma'am? said the servant, looking at Mrs. Farnaby. Answer me instantly, Mrs. Sowler interposed. In Mrs. Farnaby's own interest, don't you see she can't speak to you herself? Well, then, said the servant, it was a man. A man with a squint? Yes. Which way did he go? Towards the square. Mrs. Sowler tossed the letter on the table and hurried out of the room. The servant approached Mrs. Farnaby. You haven't opened your letter yet, ma'am, she said. No, said Mrs. Farnaby vacantly. I haven't opened it yet. I'm afraid it's bad news, ma'am. Yes, I think it's bad news. Is there anything I can do for you? No, thank you. "'Yes, one thing. Open my letter for me, please.' It was a strange request to make. 
the servant wondered and obeyed she was a kind-hearted woman she really felt for the poor lady but the familiar household devil whose name is curiosity and whose opportunities are innumerable prompted her next words when she had taken the letter out of the envelope shall i read it to you ma'am no put it down on the table please i'll ring when i want you the mother was alone alone with her death warrant waiting for her on the table the clock downstairs struck the half hour after ten she moved for the first time since she had received the letter once more she went to the window and looked out it was only for a moment she turned away again with a sudden contempt for herself what a fool i am she said and took up the open letter she looked at it and put it down again why should i read it she asked herself when i know what is in it without reading some framed woodcuts from the illustrated newspapers were hung on the walls one of them represented a scene of rescue from shipwreck a mother embracing her daughter saved by the lifeboat was among the foreground groups the print was entitled the mercy of providence mrs farnaby looked at it with a moment's steady attention providence has its favorites she said i am not one of them after thinking a little she went into her bedroom and took two papers out of her dressing case they were medical prescriptions she turned next to the chimney-piece two medicine bottles were placed on it she took one of them down a bottle of the ordinary size known among chemists as a six-ounce bottle it contained a colorless liquid the label stated the dose to be two tablespoonfuls and bore as usual a number corresponding with a number placed on the prescription she took up the prescription it was a mixture of bicarbonate of soda and prussic acid intended for the relief of indigestion she looked at the date and was at once reminded of one of the very rare occasions on which she had required the services of a medical man there had been a serious accident at a dinner party given by some friends she had eaten sparingly of a certain dish from which some of the other guests had suffered severely it was discovered that the food had been cooked in an old copper saucepan in her case the trifling result had been a disturbance of digestion and nothing more the doctor had prescribed accordingly she had taken but one dose with her healthy constitution she despised physic the remainder of the mixture was still in the bottle she considered again with herself then went back to the chimney-piece and took down the second bottle it contained a colorless liquid also but it was only half the size of the first bottle and not a drop had been taken she waited observing the difference between the two bottles with extraordinary attention in this case also the prescription was in her possession but it was not the original a line at the top stated that it was a copy made by the chemist at the request of a customer it bore the date of more than three years since a morsel of paper was pinned to the prescription containing some lines in a woman's handwriting with your enviable health and strength my dear i should have thought you were the last person in the world to want a tonic however here is my prescription if you must have it be very careful to take the right dose because there's poison in it the prescription contained three ingredients strychnine quinine and nitrohydrochloric acid and the dose was fifteen drops in water mrs farnaby lit a match and burned the lines of her friend's writing as long ago as that she reflected i thought of killing myself why didn't i do it the paper having been destroyed she put back the prescription for indigestion in her dressing case hesitated for a moment and opened the bedroom window it looked into a lonely little courtyard she threw the dangerous contents of the second and smaller bottle out into the yard and then put it back empty on the chimney-piece after another moment of hesitation she returned to the sitting-room with the bottle of mixture and the copied prescription for the tonic strychnine drops in her hand she put the bottle on the table and advanced to the fireplace to ring the bell warm as the room was she began to shiver did the eager life in her feel the fatal purpose that she was meditating and shrink from it instead of ringing the bell she bent over the fire trying to warm herself 
Other women would get relief in crying, she thought. I wish I was like other women. The whole sad truth about herself was in that melancholy aspiration. No relief in tears, no merciful oblivion in a fainting fit for her. The terrible strength of the vital organization in this woman knew no yielding to the unutterable misery that wrung her to the soul. It roused its glorious forces to resist. It held her in a stony quiet with a grip of iron. She turned away from the fire, wondering at herself, What baseness is there in me that fears death? What have I got to live for now? The open letter on the table caught her eye. This will do it, she said, and snatched it up and read it at last. The least I can do for you is to act like a gentleman and spare you unnecessary suspense. You will not see me this morning at ten for the simple reason that I really don't know, and never did know, where to find your daughter. I wish I was rich enough to return the money. Not being able to do that, I will give you a word of advice instead. The next time you confide any secrets of yours to Mr. Goldenheart, take better care that no third person hears you. She read those atrocious lines without any visible disturbance of the dreadful composure that possessed her. Her mind made no effort to discover the person who had listened and betrayed her. To all ordinary curiosities, to all ordinary emotions, she was morally dead already. The one thought in her was a thought that might have occurred to a man. If I only had my hands on his throat, how I could wring the life out of him. As it is... Instead of pursuing the reflection, she threw the letter into the fire and rang the bell. "'Take this at once to the nearest chemist,' she said, giving the strychnine prescription to the servant, "'and wait, please, and bring it back with you.' She opened her desk when she was alone and tore up the letters and papers in it. This done, she took her pen and wrote a letter. It was addressed to Amelius. When the servant entered the room again, bringing with her the prescription made up, the clock downstairs struck eleven. End of Book Seven, Chapter Five. Book Seven, Chapter Six of The Fallen Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros The Fallen Leaves by Wilkie Collins Book 7 The Vanishing Hopes Chapter 6 Toff returned to the cottage with the slippers and the stockings. "'What a time you have been gone,' said Amelius. "'It is not my fault, sir,' Toff explained. "'The stockings I obtained without difficulty.' But the Neil's shoe shop in this neighborhood sold only coarse manufactures and all too large. I had to go to my wife and get her to take me to the right place. See, he exclaimed, producing a pair of quilted silk slippers with blue rosettes. Here is a design that is really worthy of pretty feet. Try them on, miss. Sally's eyes sparkled at the sight of the slippers. She rose at once and limped away to her room. Amelius, observing that she still walked in pain, called her back. I had forgotten the blister, he said. Before you put on the new stockings, Sally, let me see your foot. He turned to Toff. You're always ready with everything, he went on. I wonder whether you have got a needle and a bit of worsted thread. The old Frenchman answered with an air of respectful reproach. Knowing me, sir, as you do, he said, could you doubt for a moment that I mend my own clothes and don my own stockings? He withdrew to his bedroom below and returned with a leather roll. When you are ready, sir, he said, opening the roll at the table and threading the needle while Sally removed the sock from her left foot. She took a chair near the window at the suggestion of Emilius. He knelt down so as to raise her foot to his knee, "'Turn a little more towards the light,' he said. He took the foot in his hand, lifted it, looked at it, and suddenly let it drop back on the floor. A cry of alarm from Sally instantly brought Toff to the window. "'Oh, look!' she cried. "'He's ill!' Toff lifted Amelius to a chair. "'For God's sake, sir!' cried the terrified old man. "'What's the matter?' 
Emilius had turned to the strange ashy paleness which is only seen in men of his florid complexion, overwhelmed by sudden emotion. He stammered when he tried to speak. "'Fetch the brandy,' said Toff, pointing to the liquor case on the sideboard. Sally brought it at once. The strong stimulant steadied Emilius. "'I'm sorry to have frightened you,' he said faintly. "'Sally! Dear, dear little Sally! Go in and get your things on directly. You must come out with me. I'll tell you why afterwards. My God, why didn't I find this out before?' He noticed Toff wondering and trembling. Good old fellow, don't alarm yourself. You shall know about it, too. Go, run, get the first cab you can find. Left alone for a few minutes, he had time to compose himself. He did his best to take advantage of the time. He tried to prepare his mind for the coming interview with Mrs. Farnaby. I must be careful of what I do, he thought, conscious of the overwhelming effect of the discovery on himself. She doesn't expect me to bring her daughter to her. Sally returned to him, ready to go out. She seemed to be afraid of him when he approached her and took her hand. Have I done anything wrong, she asked in her childish way. Are you going to take me to some other home? The tone and look with which she put the question burst through the restraints which Emilius had imposed on himself for her sake. My dear child, he said, can you bear a great surprise? I'm dying to tell you the truth, and I hardly dare do it. He took her in his arms. She trembled piteously. Instead of answering him, she reiterated her question. Are you going to take me to some other home? He could endure it no longer. This is the happiest day of your life, Sally, he cried. I'm going to take you to your mother. He held her close to him and looked at her in dread of having spoken too plainly. She slowly lifted her eyes to him in vacant fear and surprise. She burst into no expression of delight. No overwhelming emotion made her sink fainting in his arms. The sacred associations which gather round the mere name of mother were associations unknown to her. The man who held her to him so tenderly, the hero who had pitied and saved her, was father and mother both to her simple mind. She dropped her head on his breast, her faltering voice told him that she was crying. "'Will my mother take me away from you?' she asked. "'Oh, do promise to bring me back with you to the cottage.' For the moment, and the moment only, Amelius was disappointed in her. The generous sympathies in his nature guided him unerringly to the truer view. He remembered what her life had been. Inexpressible pity for her filled his heart. Oh, my poor Sally, the time is coming when you will not think as you think now. I will do nothing to distress you. You mustn't cry. You must be happy and loving and true to your mother. She dried her eyes. I'll do anything you tell me, she said, as long as you bring me back with you. Amelia sighed and said no more. He took her out with him gravely and silently when the cab was announced to be ready. Double your fare, he said, when he gave the driver his instructions, if you get there in a quarter of an hour. It wanted twenty-five minutes to twelve when the cab left the cottage. At that moment the contrast of feeling between the two could hardly have been more strongly marked. In proportion, as Emilius became more and more agitated, so Sally recovered the composure and confidence that she had lost. The first question she put to him related, not to her mother, but to his strange behavior when he had knelt down to look at her foot. He answered, explaining to her briefly and plainly what his conduct meant. The description of what had passed between her mother and Amelia's interested and yet perplexed her. "'How can she be so fond of me without knowing anything about me for all those years?' she asked. "'Is my mother a lady?' Don't tell her where you found me. She might be ashamed of me. She paused and looked at Emilius anxiously. Are you vexed about something? May I take hold of your hand? Emilius gave her his hand, and Sally was satisfied. As the cab drew up at the house, the door was opened from within. A gentleman, dressed in black, hurriedly came out, looked at Emilius, and spoke to him as he stepped from the cab to the pavement. I beg your pardon, sir. May I ask if you are any relative of the lady who lives in this house? No relative, Emilius answered, only a friend who brings good news to her. 
The stranger's grave face suddenly became compassionate as well as grave. I must speak with you before you go upstairs, he said, lowering his voice as he looked at Sally, still seated in the cab. You will perhaps excuse the liberty I am taking when I tell you that I am a medical man. Come into the hall for a moment and don't bring the young lady with you. Amelius told Sally to wait in the cab. She saw his altered looks and entreated him not to leave her. He promised to keep the house door open so that she could see him while he was away from her, and hastened into the hall. "'I am sorry to say I have bad, very bad news for you,' the doctor began. "'Time is of serious importance. I must speak plainly. You have heard of mistakes made by taking the wrong bottle of medicine. The poor lady upstairs is, I fear, in a dying state. From an accident of that sort, try to compose yourself. You may really be of use to me if you are firm enough to take my place while I am away. Amelia steadied himself instantly. What I can do, I will do, he answered. The doctor looked at him. I believe you, he said. Now listen. In this case, a dose limited to fifteen drops has been confounded with a dose of two tablespoonfuls, and the drug taken by mistake is strychnine. One grain of the poison has been known to prove fatal. She has taken three. The convulsion fits have begun. Antidotes are out of the question. The poor creature can swallow nothing. I have heard of opium as a possible means of relief, and I am going to get the instrument for injecting it under the skin. Not that I have much belief in the remedy, but I must try something. Have you courage enough to hold her, if another of the convulsions comes on in my absence? Will it relieve her if I hold her? Amelius asked. Certainly. Then I promise to do it. Mind, you must do it thoroughly. There are only two women upstairs, both perfectly useless in this emergency. If she shrieks to you to be held, exert your strength. Take her with a firm grasp. If you only touch her, I can't explain it, but it is so, you will make matters worse. The servant ran downstairs while he was speaking. Don't leave us, sir. I'm afraid it's coming on again. This gentleman will help you while I am away, said the doctor. One word more, he went on, addressing Amelius. In the intervals between the fits she is perfectly conscious, able to listen and even to speak. If she has any last wishes to communicate, make good use of the time. She may die of exhaustion at any moment. I will be back directly. He hurried to the door. Take my cab, said Amelius, and save time. But the young lady, leave her to me. He opened the cab door and gave his hand to Sally. It was done in a moment. The doctor drove off. Amelia saw the servant waiting for them in the hall. He spoke to Sally, telling her, considerately and gently, what he had heard before he took her into the house. I had such good hopes for you, he said, and it has come to this dreadful end. Have you courage to go through with it if I take you to her bedside? You will be glad one day, my dear, to remember that you cheered your mother's last moments on earth. Sally put her hand in his. I will go anywhere, she said softly, with you. Amelius led her into the house. The servant, in pity for her youth, ventured on a word of remonstrance. Oh, sir, you're not going to let the poor young lady see that dreadful sight upstairs. You mean well, Amelius answered, and I thank you. If you knew what I know, you would take her upstairs too. show the way. Sally looked at him in silent awe as they followed the servant together. He was not like the same man. His brows were knit, his lips were fast set. He held the girl's hand in a grip that hurt her. The latent strength of will in him, that reserved resolution, so finely and firmly entwined in the natures of sensitively organized men, was rousing itself to meet the coming trial. The doctor would have doubly believed in him if the doctor had seen him at that moment. They reached the first floor landing. Before the servant could open the drawing-room door, a shriek ran frightfully through the silence of the house. The servant drew back and crouched, trembling, on the upper stairs. At the same moment the door was flung open and another woman ran out, wild with terror. "'I can't bear it!' she cried, and rushed up the stairs, blind to the presence of strangers and the panic that possessed her. Amelius entered the drawing-room with his arm round Sally, holding her up. 
as he placed her in a chair the dreadful cry was renewed he only waited to rouse and encourage her by a word and a look and ran into the bedroom for an instant and an instant only he stood horror-struck in the presence of the poisoned woman the fell action of the strychnine wrung every muscle in her with the torture of convulsion her hands were fast clenched her head was bent back her body rigid as a bar of iron was arched upwards from the bed resting on the two extremities of the head and the heels the staring eyes the dusky face the twisted lips the clenched teeth were frightful to see he faced it after the one instant of hesitation he faced it before she could cry out again his hands were on her the whole exertion of his strength was barely enough to keep the frenzied throbs of the convulsion as it reached its climax from throwing her off the bed through the worst of it he was still equal to the trust that had been placed in him still faithful to the work of mercy little by little he felt the lessening resistance of the rigid body as the paroxysm began to subside he saw the ghastly stare die out of her eyes and the twisted lips relax from their dreadful grin the tortured body sank and rested the perspiration broke out on her face her languid hands fell gently over on the bed for a while the heavy eyelids closed then opened again feebly she looked at him do you know me he asked bending over her and she answered in a faint whisper Amelius he knelt down by her and kissed her hand can you listen if i tell you something she breathed heavily her bosom heaved under the suffocating oppression that weighed upon it as he took her in his arms to raise her in the bed sally's voice reached him in low imploring tones from the next room oh let me come to you i'm so frightened here by myself he waited before he told her to come in looking for a moment at the face that was resting on his breast a gray shadow was stealing over it. A cold and clammy moisture struck a chill through him as he put his hand on her forehead. He turned towards the next room. The girl had ventured as far as the door. He beckoned to her. She came in timidly and stood by him and looked at her mother. Emilia signed to her to take his place. "'Put your arms round her,' he whispered. "'Oh, Sally, tell her who you are in a kiss.' the girl's tears fell fast as she pressed her lips on her mother's cheek the dying woman looked at her with a glance of helpless inquiry then looked at amelius the doubt in her eyes was too dreadful to be endured arranging the pillows so that she could keep her raised position in the bed he signed to sally to approach him and removed the slipper from her left foot as he took it off he looked again at the bed looked and shuddered in a moment more it might be too late with his knife he ripped up the stocking and lifting her on the bed put her bare foot on her mother's lap your child your child he cried i found your own darling for god's sake rouse yourself look she heard him she lifted her feebly declining head she looked she knew for one awful moment the sinking vital forces rallied and hurled back the hold of death her eyes shone radiant with the divine light of maternal love an exulting cry of rapture burst from her slowly very slowly she bent forward until her face rested on her daughter's foot with a faint sigh of ecstasy she kissed it the moments passed and the bent head was raised no more the last beat of the heart was a beat of joy. End of Book Seven, Chapter Six. Book Eight, Chapter One of The Fallen Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE FALLEN LEAVES BY WILKIE COLLINS BOOK Eight: DAME NATURE DECIDES CHAPTER ONE The day which had united the mother and daughter, only to part them again in this world forever, had advanced to evening. Amelius and Sally were together again in the cottage, sitting by the library fire. The silence in the room was uninterrupted. 
On the open desk, near Amelius, lay the letter which Mrs. Farnaby had written to him on the morning of her death. He had found the letter, with the envelope unfastened, on the floor of the bedchamber, and had fortunately secured it before the landlady and the servant had ventured back to the room. The doctor, returning a few minutes afterwards, had warned the two women that a coroner's inquest would be held in the house, and had vainly cautioned them to be careful of what they said or did in the interval. Not only the subject of the death, but a discovery which had followed, revealing the name of the ill-fated woman marked on her linen, and showing that she had used an assumed name in taking the lodgings as Mrs. Ronald, became the gossip of the neighborhood in a few hours. Under these circumstances, the catastrophe was made the subject of a paragraph in the evening journals, the name being added for the information of any surviving relatives who might be ignorant of the sad event. If the landlady had found the letter, that circumstance also would in all probability have formed part of the statement in the newspapers, and the secret of Mrs. Farnaby's life and death would have been revealed to the public view. I can trust you, and only you, she wrote to Amelius, to fulfill the last wishes of a dying woman. You know me, and you know how I looked forward to the prospect of a happy life in retirement with my child. The only hope that I lived for has proved to be a cruel delusion. I have only this morning discovered, beyond the possibility of doubt, that I have been made the victim of wretches who have deliberately lied to me from the first to last. If I had been a happier woman, I might have had other interests to sustain me under this frightful disaster. As I am, death is my one refuge left." My suicide will be known to no creature but yourself. Some years since, the idea of self-destruction, concealed under the disguise of a common mistake, presented itself to my mind. I kept the means, very simple means, by me, thinking I might end in that way after all. When you read this, I shall be at rest forever. You will do what I have yet to ask of you, in merciful remembrance of me. I am sure of that. You have a long life before you, Amelius. My foolish fancy about you and my lost girl still lingers in my mind. I still think it may be just possible that you may meet with her in the course of years. If this does happen, I implore you, by the tenderness and pity that you once felt for me, to tell no human creature that she is my daughter, and, if John Farnaby is living at the time, I forbid you, with the authority of a dying friend, to let her see him, or to let her know even that such a person exists. Are you at a loss to account for my motives? I may make the shameful confession which will enlighten you, now I know that we shall never meet again. My child was born before my marriage, and the man who afterwards became my husband, a man of low origin, I should tell you, was the father. He had calculated on this disgraceful circumstance to force my parents to make his fortune by making me his wife. I now know what I only vaguely suspected before, that he deliberately abandoned his child, as a likely cause of hindrance and scandal in the way of his prosperous career in life. Do you now think I am asking too much when I entreat you never even to speak to my lost darling of this unnatural wretch? As for my own fair fame, I am not thinking of myself. With death close at my side, I think of my poor mother, and of all that she suffered and sacrificed to save me from the disgrace that I had deserved. For her sake, not for mine, keep silence to friends and enemies alike if they ask you who my girl is with the one exception of my lawyer. Years since, I left in his care the means of making a small provision for my child, on the chance that she might live to claim it. You can show him this letter as your authority, in case of need. Try not to forget me, Amelius, but don't grieve about me. I go to my death as you go to your sleep when you are tired. I leave you my grateful love. You have always been good to me. There is no more to write. I hear the servant returning from the chemist's bringing with her only release from the hard burden of life without hope. May you be happier than I have been. Goodbye. So she parted from him forever. But the fatal association of the unhappy woman's sorrows with the life and fortune of Amelius was not at an end yet. He had neither hesitation nor misgiving in resolving to show a natural respect to the wishes of the dead. Now that the miserable story of the past had been unreservedly disclosed to him, he would have felt himself bound in honor, even without instructions to guide him, to keep the discovery of the daughter a secret for the mother's sake. With that conviction, he had read the distressing letter. With that conviction, he now rose to provide for the safe keeping of it under lock and key. Just as he had secured the letter in a private drawer of his desk, Toff came in with a card, 
and announced that a gentleman wished to see him. Amelius, looking at the card, was surprised to find on it the name of Mr. Melton. Some lines were written on it in pencil. I have called to speak with you on a matter of serious importance. Wondering what his middle-aged rival could want with him, Amelius instructed Toff to admit the visitor. Sally started to her feet, with her customary distrust of strangers. May I run away before he comes in? she asked. If you like, Amelius answered quietly. She ran to the door of her room at the moment when Toff appeared again, announcing the visitor. Mr. Melton entered just before she disappeared. He saw the flutter of her dress as the door closed behind her. I fear I am disturbing you, he said, looking hard at the door. He was perfectly dressed. His hat and gloves were models of what such things ought to be. He was melancholy and courteous, blandly distrustful of the flying skirts which he had seen at the door. When Emilius offered him a chair, he took it with a mysterious sigh, mournfully resigned to the sad necessity of sitting down. "'I won't prolong my intrusion on you,' he resumed. "'You have no doubt seen the melancholy news in the evening papers?' "'I haven't seen the evening papers,' Emilius answered. "'What news do you mean?' Mr. Melton leaned back in his chair, and expressed emotions of sorrow and surprise, in a perfect state of training, by gently raising his smooth white hands. "'Oh, dear, dear! This is very sad. I had hoped to find you in full possession of the particulars, reconciled, as we must all be, to the inscrutable ways of providence. Permit me to break it to you as gently as possible. I came here to inquire if you had heard yet from Miss Regina.' Understand my motive. There must be no misapprehension between us on that subject. There is a very serious necessity. Pray follow me carefully. I say, a very serious necessity for my communicating immediately with Miss Regina's uncle. And I know of nobody who is so likely to hear from their travelers, so soon after their departure, as yourself. You are, in a certain sense, a member of the family. Stop a minute, said Emilius. I beg your pardon? said Mr. Melton politely, at a loss to understand the interruption. I didn't at first know what you meant, Amelius explained. You put it, if you will forgive me for saying so, in rather a roundabout way. If you are alluding, all this time, to Mrs. Farnaby's death, I must honestly tell you that I know of it already. The bland self-possession of Mr. Melton's face began to show signs of being ruffled. He had been, in a manner, deluded into exhibiting his conventionally fluent eloquence, in the choicest modulations of a sonorous voice, and it wounded his self-esteem to be placed in his present position. "'I understood you to say,' he remarked stiffly, "'that you had not seen the evening newspapers.' "'You are quite right,' Amelius rejoined. "'I have not seen them.' "'Then may I inquire?' Mr. Melton proceeded. "'How you became informed of Mrs. Farnaby's death?' Amelius replied with his customary frankness. "'I went to call on the poor lady this morning,' he said." knowing nothing of what had happened. I met the doctor at the door, and I was present at her death. Even Mr. Melton's carefully trained composure was not proof against the revelation that now opened before him. He burst out with an exclamation of astonishment, like an ordinary man. Good heavens! What does this mean? Amelius took it as a question addressed to himself. I'm sure I don't know, he said quietly. Mr. Melton, misunderstanding Amelius on his side, interpreted those innocent words as an outbreak of vulgar interruption. Pardon me, he said coldly. I was about to explain myself. You will presently understand my surprise. After seeing the evening paper, I went at once to make inquiries at the address mentioned. In Mr. Farnaby's absence, I felt bound to do this as his old friend. I saw the landlady, and with her assistance, the doctor also. Both these persons spoke of a gentleman who had called that morning, accompanied by a young lady, and who had insisted on taking the young lady upstairs with him. Until you mentioned just now that you were present at the death, I had no suspicion that you were the gentleman. Surprise on my part was, I think, only natural. I could hardly be expected to know that you were in Mrs. Farnaby's confidence about the place of her retreat. And with regard to the young lady, I am still quite at a loss to understand... If you understand that the people at the house told you the truth, as far as I am concerned, Amelius interposed, I hope that will be enough. With regard to the young lady, I must beg you to excuse me for speaking plainly. I have nothing to say about her, to you, or to anybody. Mr. Melton rose with the utmost dignity, 
and the fullest possession of his vocal resources. Permit me to assure you, he said, with frigidly fluent politeness, that I have no wish to force myself into your confidence. One remark I will venture to make. It is easy enough, no doubt, to keep your own secrets when you are speaking to me. You will find some difficulty, I fear, in pursuing the same course when you are called upon to give evidence before the coroner. I presume you know that you will be summoned as a witness at the inquest? I left my name and address with the doctor for that purpose, Emilius rejoined as composedly as ever, and I am ready to bear witness to what I saw at poor Miss Farnaby's bedside. But if all the coroners in England questioned me about anything else, I should say to them just what I have said to you. Mr. Melton smiled with well-bred irony. We shall see, he said. In the meantime, I presume I may ask you, in the interests of the family, to send me the address on the letter as soon as you hear from Miss Regina. I have no other means of communicating with Mr. Farnaby. In respect to the melancholy event, I shall add that I have undertaken to provide for the funeral, and to pay any little outstanding debts, and so forth. As Mr. Farnaby's old friend and representative, the conclusion of the sentence was interrupted by the entrance of Toff with a note, and an apology for his intrusion. I beg your pardon, sir. The person is waiting. She says it's only a receipt to sign. The box is in the hall. Amelius examined the enclosure. It was a formal document, acknowledging the receipt of Sally's clothes, returned to her by the authorities at the home. As he took a pen to sign the receipt, he looked toward the door of Sally's room. Mr. Melton, observing the look, prepared to retire. I am only interrupting you, he said. You have my address on my card. Good evening. On his way out, he passed an elderly woman waiting in the hall. Toff, hastening before him to open the garden gate, was saluted by the gruff voice of a cabman outside. The lady whom he had driven to the cottage had not paid him his right fare. He meant to have the money, or the lady's name and address, and summon her. Quietly crossing the road, Mr. Melton heard the woman's voice next. She had got her receipt, and had followed him out. In the dispute about fares and distances that ensued, the contending parties more than once mentioned the name of the home, and of the locality in which it was situated. Possessing this information, Mr. Melton looked in at his club, consulted a directory under the heading of Charitable Institutions, and solved the mystery of the vanishing petticoats at the door. He had discovered an inmate of the Asylum for Lost Woman in the home of the man to whom Regina was engaged to be married. The next morning's post brought to Emilius a letter from Regina. It was dated from a hotel in Paris. Her dear uncle had overestimated his strength. He had refused to stay and rest for the night at Boulogne, and had suffered so severely from the fatigue of the long journey that he had been confined to his bed since his arrival. The English physician consulted had declined to say when he would be strong enough to travel again. The constitution of the patient must have received some serious shock. He was brought very low. Having carefully reported the new medical opinion, Regina was at liberty to indulge herself, next, in expressions of affection, and to assure Emilius of her anxiety to hear from him as soon as possible. But, in this case again, the dear uncle's convenience was still the first consideration. She reverted to Mr. Farnaby in making her excuses for a hurriedly written letter. The poor invalid suffered from depression of spirits. His great consolation in his illness was to hear his niece read to him. He was calling for her, indeed, at that moment. The inevitable postscript warmed into a mild effusion of fondness. How I wish you could be with us, but alas, it cannot be. Emilius copied the address on the letter and sent it to Mr. Melton immediately. It was then the twenty-fourth day of the month. The tidal train did not leave London early that morning, and the inquest was deferred to suit other pressing engagements of the coroner until the twenty-sixth. Mr. Melton decided, after his interview with Emilius, that the emergency was sufficiently serious to justify him in following his telegram to Paris. It was clearly his duty, as an old friend, to mention to Mr. Farnaby what he had discovered at the cottage, as well as what he had heard from the landlady and the doctor, leaving it to the uncle's discretion to act as he thought right in the interests of the niece. Whether that course of action might not also serve the interest of Mr. Melton himself, in the character of an unsuccessful suitor for Regina's hand, he did not stop to inquire. Beyond his duty it was, for the present at least, not his business to look. That night, the two gentlemen held a private consultation in Paris, the doctor having previously certified that his patient was incapable of supporting the journey back to London under any circumstances. 
The question of the formal proceedings rendered necessary by Mrs. Farnaby's death having been discussed and disposed of, Mr. Milton next entered on the narrative which the obligations of friendship imperatively demanded from him. To his astonishment and alarm, Mr. Farnaby started up in the bed like a man panic-stricken. "'Do you say?' he stammered as soon as he could speak. "'You mean to make inquiries about that... that girl?' "'I certainly thought it desirable, bearing in mind Mr. Goldenheart's position in your family.' Do nothing of the sort. Say nothing to Regina or to any living creature. Wait till I get well again, and leave me to deal with it. I am the proper person to take it in hand. Don't you see that for yourself? And look here. There may be questions asked at the inquest. Some impudent scoundrel on the jury may want to pry into what doesn't concern him. The moment you're back in London, get a lawyer to represent us. The sharpest fellow that can be had for money. Tell him to stop all prying questions. Who the girl is, and what made that cursed young socialist Goldenheart take her upstairs with him. All that sort of thing has nothing to do with the manner in which my wife met her death. You understand? I look to you, Melton, to see yourself that this is done. The less said at that infernal inquest, the better. In my position, it's an exposure that my enemies will make the most of as it is. I'm too ill to go into the matter any further. No, I don't want Regina. Go to her in the sitting-room and tell the courier to get you something to eat and drink. And, I say, for God's sake, don't be late for the Boulogne train tomorrow morning. Left to himself, he gave full vent to his fury. He cursed Emilius with oaths that are not to be written. He had burnt the letter which Mrs. Farnaby had written to him, on leaving him forever. But he had not burnt out of his memory the words which that letter contained. With his wife's language vividly present to his mind, he could arrive at but one conclusion after what Mr. Melton had told him. Amelius was concerned in the discovery of his deserted daughter. Amelius had taken the girl to her dying mother's bedside. With his idiotic socialist notions, he would be perfectly capable of owning the truth, if inquiries were made. The unblemished reputation which John Farnaby had built up by the self-seeking hypocrisy of a lifetime was at the mercy of a visionary young fool, who believed that rich men were created for the benefit of the poor, and who proposed to regenerate society by reviving the obsolete morality of the primitive Christians. Was it possible for him to come to terms with such a person as this? There was not an inch of common ground on which they could meet. He dropped back on his pillow in despair, and lay for a while frowning and biting his nails. Suddenly he sat up again in the bed, and wiped his moist forehead, and heaved a heavy breath of relief. Had his illness obscured his intelligence? How was it he had not seen at once the perfectly easy way out of the difficulty which was presented by the facts themselves? Here is a man, engaged to marry my niece who has been discovered keeping a girl at his cottage, who even had the audacity to take her upstairs with him when he made a call on my wife. Charge him with it in plain words, break off the engagement publicly in the face of society, and, if the profligate scoundrel tries to defend himself by telling the truth, who will believe him, when the girl was seen running out of his room, and when he refused, on the questions being put to him, to say who she was? So, in ignorance of his wife's last instructions to Emilius, in equal ignorance of the compassionate silence which an honorable man preserves when a woman's reputation is at his mercy. The wretch needlessly plotted and planned to save his usurped reputation, seeing all things, as such men invariably do, through the foul light of his own inbred baseness and cruelty. He was troubled by no retributive emotions of shame or remorse in contemplating the second sacrifice to his own interests of the daughter whom he had deserted in her infancy. If he felt any misgivings, they related wholly to himself. His head was throbbing, his tongue was dry. A dread of increasing his illness shook him suddenly. He drank some of the lemonade at his bedside, and lay down to compose himself to sleep. It was not to be done. There was a burning in his eyeballs. There was a wild, irregular beating in his heart, which kept him awake. In some degree, at least, retribution seemed to be on the way to him already. Mr. Melton, delicately administering sympathy and consolation to Regina, whose affectionate nature felt keenly the calamity of her aunt's death. Mr. Melton, making himself modestly useful by reading aloud certain devotional poems much prized by Regina, was called out of the room by the courier. "'I have just looked in at Mr. Farnaby, sir,' said the man, "'and I am afraid he is worse.' The physician was sent for. He thought so seriously of the change in the patient that he obliged Regina to accept the services of a professed nurse. When Mr. Melton started on his return journey the next morning, he left his friend in a high fever. End of Book 8, Chapter 1 Recording by Todd
Book Eight, Chapter Two of The Fallen Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fallen Leaves by Wilkie Collins. Book Eight, Chapter Two. The inquiry into the circumstances under which Mrs. Farnaby had died was held in the forenoon of the next day. Mr. Melton surprised Emilius by calling for him and taking him to the inquest. The carriage stopped on the way, and a gentleman joined them, who was introduced as Mr. Melton's legal adviser. He spoke to Emilius about the inquest, stating, as his excuse, for asking certain discreet questions, that his object was to suppress any painful disclosures. On reaching the house, Mr. Melton and his lawyer said a few words to the coroner downstairs, while the jury were assembling on the floor above. The first witness examined was the landlady. After deposing to the date at which the late Mrs. Farnaby had hired her lodgings, and verifying the statements which had appeared in the newspapers, she was questioned about the life and habits of the deceased. She described her late lodgers as a respectable lady, punctual in her payments, and quietly and orderly in her way of life. She received letters, but saw no friends. On several occasions, an old woman was admitted to speak with her, and these visits seemed to be anything but agreeable to the deceased. Asked if she knew anything of the old woman, or of what had passed at the interviews described, the witness answered both questions in the negative. When the woman called, she always told the servant to announce her as the nurse. Mr. Melton was next examined, to prove the identity of the deceased. He declared that he was quite unable to explain why she had left her husband's house under an assumed name. Asked if Mr. and Mrs. Farnaby had lived together on affectionate terms, he acknowledged that he had heard, at various times, of a want of harmony between them, but was not acquainted with the cause. Mr. Farnaby's high character and position in the commercial world spoke for themselves. The restraints of a gentleman guided him in his relations with his wife. The medical certificate of his illness in Paris was then put in, and Mr. Melton's examination came to an end. The chemist who had made up the prescription was the third witness. He knew the woman who brought it to his shop to be in the service of the first witness examined, an old customer of his, and a highly respected resident in the neighborhood. He made up all the prescriptions himself in which poisons were conspicuous ingredients, and he had affixed to the bottle a slip of paper bearing the word poison printed in large letters. The bottle was produced and identified, and the directions in the prescription were shown to have been accurately copied on the label. The general sensation of interest was excited by the appearance of the next witness, the woman's servant, it was anticipated that her evidence would explain how the fatal mistake about the medicine had occurred. After replying to the formal inquiries, she proceeded as follows. When I answered the bell, at the time I have mentioned, I found the disease standing at the fireplace. There was a bottle of medicine on the table, by her writing desk. It was a much larger bottle than that which the last witness identified, and it was more than three parts full of some colorless medicine. The deceased gave me a prescription to take to the chemist, with instructions to wait and bring back the physic. She said, I don't feel at all well this morning. I thought of trying some of this medicine, pointing to the bottle by her desk. But I am not sure it is the right thing for me. I think I want a tonic. The prescription I have given you is a tonic. I went out at once to our chemist and got it. I found her writing a letter when I came back, but she finished it immediately and pushed it away from her. When I put the bottle I had brought from the chemist on the table... She looked at the other larger bottle which she had by her, and she said, You will think me very undecided. I have been doubting, since I sent you to the chemist, whether I had not better begin with this medicine here, before I try the tonic. It's a medicine for the stomach, and I fancy it's only indigestion that's the matter with me after all. I said, You ate but a poor breakfast, ma'am, this morning. It isn't for me to advise, but as you seem to be in doubt about yourself, wouldn't it be better to send for a doctor? She shook her head and said she didn't want to have a doctor if she could possibly help it. I'll try this medicine for indigestion first, she says, and if that doesn't relieve me, we will see what is to be done later in the day. While we were talking, the tonic was left in its sealed paper cover, just as I had brought it from the shop. She took up the bottle containing the stomach medicine, and read the directions on it. Two tablespoons by measure glass twice a day. I asked her if she had a measure glass, and she said yes, and sent me to her bedroom to look for it. I couldn't find it. While I was looking, I heard her cry out, and ran back to the drawing room to see what was the matter. Oh, she says, how clumsy I am, I've broken the bottle. She held up the bottle of the stomach medicine and showed it to me, broken just below the neck. 
Go back to the bedroom, she says, and see if you can find an empty bottle. I don't want to waste the medicine if I can help it. There was only one empty bottle in the bedroom, a bottle on the chimney piece. I took it to her immediately. She gave me the broken bottle, and while I poured the medicine into the bottle which I had found in the bedroom, she opened the paper which covered the tonic I had brought from the chemist. When I had done, and the two bottles were together on the table, the bottle that I had filled and the bottle that I had brought from the chemist, I noticed that they were both of the same size, and that both had a label pasted on them, marked poison. I said to her, You must take care, ma'am. You don't want to make any mistake. The two bottles are so exactly alike. I can easily prevent that, she says, and dipped her pen in the ink, and copied the directions on the broken bottle onto the label of the bottle I had just filled. There, she said. Now I hope your mind's at ease. She spoke cheerfully, as if she was joking with me. Then she said, But where's the measure glass? I went back to the bedroom to look for it, and couldn't find it again. She changed all at once upon that. She became quite angry, and walked up and down in a fume, abusing me for my stupidity. It was very unlike her. On all other occasions, she was a most considerate lady. I made allowances for her. She had been very much upset earlier in the morning when she had received a letter, which she told me herself contained bad news. Yes, another person was present at the time, the same woman that my mistress told you of. The woman looked at the address on the letter, and seemed to know who it was from. I told her a squint-eyed man had brought it to the house, and then she left directly. I don't know where she went, or the address at which she lives, or who the messenger was who brought the letter. As I have said, I made allowances for the deceased lady. I went downstairs without answering, and got a tumbler and a tablespoon to serve instead of the measure glass. When I came back with the things, she was still walking about in a temper. She took no notice of me. I left the room again quietly, seeing she was not in a state to be spoken to. I saw nothing more of her until we were alarmed by hearing her scream. We found the poor lady on the floor in a kind of fit. I ran out and fetched the nearest doctor. That is the whole truth, on my oath, and this is all I know about it. The landlady was recalled at the request of the jury, and questioned again about the old woman. She could give no information. Being asked next if any letters or papers belonging to, or written by, the deceased lady had been found, she declared that, after the strictest search, nothing had been discovered but two medical prescriptions. The writing desk was empty. The doctor was the next witness. He described the state in which he found the patient on being called to the house. The symptoms were those of poisoning by strychnine. Examination of the prescriptions and the bottles, aided by the servant's information, convinced him that a fatal mistake had been made by the deceased, the nature of which he explained to the jury as he had already explained it to Emilius. Having mentioned the meeting with Emilius at the house door, and the events which had followed, he closed his evidence by stating the result of the post-mortem examination, proving that the death was caused by the poison called strychnine. The landlady and the servant were examined again. They were instructed to inform the jury exactly of the time that had elapsed from the moment when the servant had left the deceased alone in the drawing room to the time when the screams were first heard. Having both given the same evidence on this point, they were next asked whether any person, beside the old woman, had visited the deceased lady, or had on any pretense obtained access to her in the interval. Both swore positively that there had not even been a knock at the house door in the interval and that the area gate was locked, and the key in possession of the landlady. This evidence placed it beyond the possibility of doubt that the deceased had herself taken the poison. The question whether she had taken it by accident was the only question left to decide when Emilius was called as the next witness. The lawyer retained by Mr. Melton to watch the case on behalf of Mr. Farnaby had hitherto not interfered. It was observed that he paid the closest attention to the inquiry at the stage which it had now reached. Emilius was nervous at the outset. The early training in America, which had hardened him to face an audience and speak with self-possession on social and political subjects, had not prepared him for the very difficult ordeal of a first appearance as a witness. Having answered the customary inquiries, he was so painfully agitated in describing Mrs. Farnaby's sufferings that the coroner suspended the examination for a few minutes, to give him time to control himself. He failed, however, to recover his composure until the narrative part of his evidence had come to an end. When the critical questions, bearing on his relations with Mrs. Farnaby, began, the audience noticed that he lifted his head and looked and spoke for the first time, like a man with a settled resolution in him, sure of himself. The questions proceeded. Was he, in Mrs. Farnaby's confidence, on the subject of her domestic differences with her husband? Did those differences lead to her withdrawing herself from her husband's roof? 
did Mrs. Farnaby inform him of the place of her retreat? To these three questions the witness, speaking quite readily in each case, answered yes. Asked next what the nature of the domestic differences had been, whether they were likely to affect Miss Farnaby's mind seriously, why she had passed under an assumed name, and why she had confided the troubles of her married life to a young man like himself, only introduced to her a few months since, the witness simply declined to reply to the inquiries addressed to him. The confidence Mrs. Farnaby placed in me, he said to the coroner, was a confidence which I gave her my word of honor to respect. When I have said that, I hope the jury will understand that I owe it to the memory of the dead to say no more. There was a murmur of approval among the audience, instantly checked by the coroner. The foreman of the jury rose, and remarked that scruples of honor were out of place at a serious inquiry of that sort. Hearing this, the lawyer saw his opportunity and got to his legs. I represent the husband of the deceased lad, he said. Mr. Goldenheart has appealed to the law of honor to justify him in keeping silence. I am astonished that there is a man to be found in this assembly who fails to sympathize with him. But as there appears to be such a person present, I ask permission, sir, to put a question to the witness. It may, or may not, satisfy the foreman of the jury, but it will certainly assist the object of the present inquiry. The coroner, after a glance at Mr. Melton, permitted the lawyer to put his question in these terms. Did your knowledge of Mrs. Farnaby's domestic troubles give you any reason to apprehend that they might urge her to commit suicide? Certainly not, Amelius answered. When I called on her, on the morning of her death, I had no apprehension whatever of her committing suicide. I went to the house as a bearer of good news, and I said so to the doctor when he first spoke to me. The doctor confirmed this. The foreman was silenced, if not convinced. One of his brother jurymen, however, feeling the force of example, interrupted the proceedings by assailing Emilius with another question. We have heard that you were accompanied by a young lady at the time you have mentioned, and that you took her upstairs with you. We want to know what business the young lady had in the house. The lawyer interfered again. I object to that question, he said. The purpose of the inquest is to ascertain how Mrs. Farnaby met with her death. What has the young lady to do with it? The doctor's evidence has already told us that she was not at the house until after he had been called in, and the deadly action of the poison had begun. I appeal, sir, to the law of evidence, and to you as the presiding authority to enforce it. Mr. Goldenheart, who is acquainted with the circumstances of the deceased lady's life, has declared on his oath that there was nothing in those circumstances to inspire him with any apprehension of her committing suicide. The evidence of the servant at the lodgings points plainly to the conclusion already arrived at by the medical witness that the death was the result of a lamentable mistake, and of that alone. Is our time to be wasted in irrelevant questions, and are the feelings of the surviving relatives to be cruelly lacerated to no purpose to satisfy the curiosity of strangers? A strong expression of approval from the audience followed this. The lawyer whispered to Mr. Melton, It's all right. Order being restored, the coroner ruled that the juryman's question was not admissible, and that the servant's evidence, taken with the statements of the doctor and the chemist, was the only evidence for the consideration of the jury. Summing up to this effect, he recalled Emilius, at the request of the foreman, to inquire if the witness knew anything of the old lady who had been frequently alluded to in the course of the proceedings. Emilius could answer this question as honestly as he answered the questions preceding it. He neither knew the woman's name, nor where she was to be found. The coroner inquired, with a touch of irony, if the jury wished the inquest to be adjourned under existing circumstances. For the sake of appearances, the jury consulted together. But the luncheon hour was approaching. The servant's evidence was undeniably clear and conclusive. The coroner, in summing up, had requested them not to forget that the deceased had lost her temper with the servant, and that an angry woman might well make a mistake which would be unlikely in her cooler moments. All these influences led the jury irrepressibly over the obstacles of obstinacy on the way to submission. After a needless delay, they returned a verdict of death by misadventure. The secret of Mrs. Farnaby's suicide remained inviolate. The reputation of her vile husband stood as high as ever, and the future life of Amelius was, from that fatal moment, turned irrevocably into a new course. End of Book 8, Chapter 2 Recording by Todd Book 8, Chapter 3 of The Fallen Leaves This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recorded by Raquel Olea. The Fallen Leaves by Wilk Collins. Book 8, Chapter 3. On the conclusion of the proceedings, Mr. Melton, having no further need of Emilius or the lawyer, drove away by himself. But he was too inveterately polite to omit making his excuses for leaving them in a hurry. He expected, he said, to find a telegram from Paris, waiting at his house. Amelius only delayed his departure to ask the landlady if the day of the funeral was settled. Hearing that it was arranged for the next morning, he thanked her and returned at once to the cottage. Sally was awaiting his arrival to complete some purchases of mourning for her unhappy mother, Toff's wife being in attendance to take care of her. She was curious to know how the inquest had ended. In answering her question, Amelius was careful to warn her if her companion made any inquiries, only to say that she had lost her mother under very sad circumstances. The two having left the cottage, he instructed Toff to let in a stranger, who was to call by a previous appointment, and to close the door to everyone else. In a few minutes, the expected person, a young man, who gave the name of Moorcross, made his appearance, and sorely puzzled the old Frenchman. He was well-dressed, his manner was quiet and self-possessed, and yet he did not look like a gentleman. In fact, he was a policeman of the higher order, in plain clothes. Being introduced to the library, he spread out on the table some sheets of manuscript in the handwriting of Amelius with notes in red ink on the margin, made by himself. I understand, sir, he began, that you have reasons for not bringing this case to trial in a court of law. I am sorry to say, Amelius answered, that I dare not consent to the exposure of a public trial for the sake of persons living and dead. For the same reason, I have written the account of the conspiracy with certain reserves. I hope I have not thrown any needless difficulties in your way. Certainly not, sir. But I should wish to ask what you propose to do in case I discover the people concerned in the conspiracy. Amelius owned very reluctantly that he could do nothing with the old woman who had been the accomplice, unless, he added, I can induce her to assist me in bringing the man to justice for other crimes which I believe him to have committed. Meaning the man named Jervy, sir, in this statement? Yes. I have reason to believe that he has been obliged to leave the United States after committing some serious offense. I beg your pardon for interrupting you, sir. It is serious enough to charge him with under the treaty between the two countries? I don't doubt it's serious enough. I have telegraphed to the persons who formerly employed him for the particulars. Mind this. I will stick at no sacrifice to make that scoundrel suffer for what he has done. In those plain words, Emilius revealed, as frankly as usual, the purpose that was in him. The terrible remembrances associated with Mrs. Farnaby's last moments had kindled. In his just and generous nature, a burning sense of wrong inflicted on the poor, heartbroken creature who had trusted and loved him. The unendurable thought that the wretch who had tortured her, robbed her, and driven her to her death had escaped with impunity literally haunted him night and day. Eager to provide for Sally's future, he had followed Mrs. Farnaby's instructions and had seen the lawyer privately during the period that had elapsed between the death and the inquest. Hearing that there were formalities to be complied with, which would probably cause some delay, he had at once announced his determination to employ the interval in attempting the pursuit of Jervy. The lawyer, after vainly pointing out the serious objections to the course proposed, so far yielded to the irresistible earnestness and good faith of Amelius as to recommend him to a competent man who could be trusted not to deceive him. The same day, the man had received a written statement of the case, 
and he had now arrived to report the result of his first proceedings to his employer. One thing I want to know, before you tell me anything else, Emilius resumed, is my written description of Jervy plain enough to help you find him? It is plain, sir, that some of the older men in our office have recognized him by it under another name than the name you give him. Does that add to the difficulty of tracking him? He has been a long time away from England, sir, and it's by no means easy to trace him on that account. I have been to the young woman named Phoebe in your statement to find out what she can tell me about him. She's ready enough, in the intervals of crying, to help us lay our hands on the man who has deserted her. It's the old story of a fellow getting a girl's secrets and a girl's money under pretense of marrying her. At one time, she's furious with him, and at another, she's ready to cry her eyes out. I got some information from her. It's not much, but it may help us. The name of the old woman who has been the go-between in the business is Mrs. Sowler, known to the police as an inveterate drunkard, and worse. I don't think there will be much difficulty in tracing Mrs. Sowler. As for Jervy, if the young woman is to be believed, and I think she is, there's little doubt that he has got the money from the lady mentioned in my instructions here, and that he is bolted with the sum about him. Wait a bit, sir. I haven't done with my discoveries yet. I asked the young woman, of course, if she had his photograph. He's a sharp fellow. She had it, but he got it away from her, on the pretense of getting her a better one before he took himself off. Having missed this chance, I asked next if she knew where he lived last. She directed me to the place, and I have had a talk with the landlord. He tells me of a squint-eyed man who was a good deal about the house doing Jervy's dirty work for him. If I am not misled by the description, I think I know the man. I have my own notion of what he's capable of doing, if he gets a chance, and I propose to begin by finding our way to him and using him as a means of tracing Jervy. It's only right to tell you that it may take some time to do this, for which reason I have to propose, in the meanwhile trying a shorter way to the end in view. Do you object, sir, to the expense of sending a copy of your description of Jervy to every police station in London? I object to nothing which may help find him. Do you think the police have got him anywhere? You forget, sir, that the police have no orders to take him. What I'm speculating on is the chance that he has got the money about him, say, in small banknotes, for convenience of changing them, you know. Well, well, sir, the people he lives among, the squint-eyed man, for instance, don't stick at trifles. If any of them have found out that Jervy's purse is worth having, you mean they would rob him? And murder him too, sir, if he's tried to resist. Emilius started to his feet. Send round those police stations without losing another minute, he said, and let me hear what the answer is the instant you receive it. Suppose I get the answer late at night, sir. I don't care when you get it, night or day, dead or living. I will undertake to identify him. Here's a duplicate key of the garden gate. Come this way, and I'll show you where my bedroom is. If we are all in bed, tap at the window, and I will be ready for you at a moment's notice. On that understanding, Moorcross left the cottage. The day when the mortal remains of Mrs. Farnaby were laid at rest was a day of heavy rain. Mr. Melton and two or three other old friends were the attendants at the funeral. When the coffin was borne into the damp and reeking burial ground, a young man and a woman were the only persons, besides the sexton and his assistants, who stood by the open grave. Mr. Melton, recognizing Emilius, was at a loss to understand who his companion could be. It was impossible to suppose that he would profane that solemn ceremony by bringing to it the lost woman at the cottage. The thick black veil of the person with him hid her face from view. No visible expression of grief escaped her. When the last sublime words of the burial service had been read, those two mourners were left after the others had all departed, still standing together by the grave. Mr. Melton decided on mentioning the circumstance confidentially when he wrote to his friend in Paris. Telegrams from Regina 
in reply to his telegrams from London, had informed him that Mr. Farnaby had felt the benefit of the remedies employed, and was slowly on the way to recovery. It seemed likely that he would, in no long time, take the right course for the protection of his niece. For the enlightenment which might or might not come with that time, Mr. Melton was resigned to wait, with the disciplined patience to which he had been mainly indebted for his success in life. "'Always remember your mother tenderly, my child,' said Amelius, as they left the burial ground. "'She was sorely tried, poor thing, in her lifetime, and she loved you very dearly. "'Do you know anything of my father?' Sally asked timidly. "'Is he still living?' "'My dear, you will never see your father. "'I must be all that the kindest father and mother could have been to you now. "'Oh, my poor little girl!' She pressed his arm to her as she held it. "'Why should you pity me?' she said. "'Haven't I got you?' They passed the day together quietly at the cottage. Amelius took down some of his books and pleased Sally by giving her his first lessons. Soon after ten o'clock she withdrew at the usual early hour to her room. In her absence he sent for Toff intending to warn him not to be alarmed if he heard footsteps in the garden after they had all gone to bed. The old servant had barely entered the library when he was called away by the bell at the outer gate. Amelius, looking into the hall, discovered Moorcross and signed to him eagerly to come in. The police officer closed the door cautiously behind him. He had arrived with news that Jervie was found. End of Book 8, Chapter 3 Recorded by Raquel Olea. Book 8, Chapter 4 of The Fallen Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Raquel Olea. The Fallen Leaves by Wilkie Collins Book 8, Chapter 4 Where has he been found? Emilius asked, snatching up his hat. There's no hurry, sir, Moorcross answered quietly. When I had the honor of seeing you yesterday, you said you meant to make Jervie suffer for what he had done. Somebody else has saved you the trouble. He was found this evening in the river. Drowned? Stabbed in three places, sir, and put out of the way in the river. That's the surgeon's report. Robbed of everything he possessed. That's the police report, after searching his pockets. Emilius was silent. It had not entered into his calculation that crime breeds crime, and that the criminal might escape him under that law. For the moment, he was conscious of a sense of disappointment, revealing plainly that the desire for vengeance had mingled with the higher motives which animated him. He felt uneasy and ashamed, and longed as usual to take refuge in action from his own unwelcome thoughts. "'Are you sure it is the man?' he asked. "'My description may have misled the police. I should like to see him myself.' "'Certainly, sir. While we are about it, if you feel any curiosity to trace Jervie's ill-gotten money, there's a chance, from what I have heard, of finding the man with the squint. The people at our place think it's likely he may have been concerned in the robbery if he hasn't committed the murder. In an hour after, under the guidance of Moorcross, Emilius passed through the dreary doors of a dead house, situated on the southern bank of the Thames, and saw the body of Jervie stretched out on a stone slab. The guardian who held the lantern, inured to such horrible sights, declared that the corpse could not have been in the water more than two days. To anyone who had seen the murdered man, the face, undisfigured by injury or any kind, was perfectly recognizable. Emilius knew him again, dead, as certainly as he had known him again living, when he was waiting for Phoebe in the street. "'If you're satisfied, sir,' said Moorcross, the inspector at the police station is sending a sergeant to look after walleyes, 
the name they give hereabouts to the man suspected of the robbery. We can take the sergeant with us in the cab, if you like. Still keeping on the southern bank of the river, they drove for a quarter of an hour in a westerly direction and stopped at a public house. The sergeant of police went in by himself to make the first inquiries. We are a day too late, sir, he said to Amelius on returning to the cab. Walleyes was here last night and Mother Sowler with him, judging by the description. Both of them drunk and the woman the worse of the two. The landlord knew nothing more about it, but there's a man at the bar tells me he heard of them this morning, still drinking at the dairy. The dairy, Amelius repeated. Moorcross interposed with the necessary explanation. An old house, sir, which once stood by itself in the fields. It was a dairy a hundred years ago, and it has kept the name ever since, though it's nothing but a low lodging house now. One of the worst places on this side of the river, the sergeant added. The landlord's a returned convict. Sly as he is, we shall have him again yet, for receiving stolen goods. There's every sort of thief among his lodgers, from a pickpocket to a housebreaker. It's my duty to continue the inquiry, sir. But a gentleman like you will be better, I should say, out of such a place as that. Still disquieted by the sight that he had seen in the dead house, and by the associations which that sight had recalled, Amelius was ready for any adventure which might relieve his mind. Even the prospect of a visit to a thieves' lodging house was more welcome to him than the prospect of going home alone. If there's no serious objection to it, he said, I own I should like to see the place. You'll be safe enough with us, the sergeant replied, if you don't mind filthy people and bad language. All right, sir. Cabman, drive by the dairy. Their direction was now towards the south, through a perfect labyrinth of mean and dirty streets. Twice the driver was obliged to ask his way. On the second occasion, the sergeant, putting his head out of the window to stop the cab, cried, Hello! There's something up! They got out in front of a long, low, rambling house, a complete contrast to the modern buildings about it. Late as the hour was, a mob had assembled in front of the door. The police were on the spot, keeping the people in order. Moorcross and the sergeant pushed their way through the crowd, leading Amelius between them. "'Something wrong, sir, in the back kitchen,' said one of the policemen, answering the sergeant while he opened the street door. A few yards down the passage there was a second door, with a man on the watch by it. "'There's a nice to-do downstairs,' the man announced, recognizing the sergeant and unlocking the door with a key, which he took from his pocket. "'The landlord at the dairy knows his lodgers, sir,' Moorcross whispered to Amelius." The place is kept like a prison. As they passed through the second door, a frantic voice startled them, shouting in fury from below. An old man came hobbling up the kitchen stairs, his eyes wild with fear, his long gray hair all tumbled over his face. Oh, Lord, have you got the tools for breaking open the door? He asked, wringing his dirty hands in an agony of supplication. She'll set the house afire! She'll kill my wife and daughter. The sergeant pushed him contemptuously out of the way and looked round for Amelius. It's only the landlord, sir. Keep near Moorcross and follow me. They descended the kitchen stairs, the frantic cries below growing louder and louder at every step they took, and made their way through the thieves and vagabonds crowding together in the passage. Passing on their right hand, a solid oak door fast closed. They reached an open, wicked gate of iron which led into a stone-paved yard. A heavy, barred window was now visible in the back wall of the house, raised three or four feet from the pavement of the yard. The room within was illuminated by a blaze of gaslight. More policemen were here, keeping back more inquisitive lodgers. Among the spectators was a man with a hideous outward squint, holding by the window bars in a state of drunken terror. The sergeant looked at him and beckoned to one of the policemen. Take him to the station. I shall have something to say to Walleyes when he's sober. Now then, stand back all of you, and let's see what's going on in the kitchen. He took Amelius by the arm and led him to the window. Even the sergeant started when the scene inside met his view. By God, he cried, it's Mother Sowler herself.
It was Mother Sowler. The horrible woman was trampling round and round in the middle of the kitchen, like a beast in a cage, raving in the dreadful drink madness called delirium tremens. In the farthest corner of the room, barricaded behind the table, the landlord's wife and daughter crouched in terror of their lives. The gas turned full on, blazed high enough to blacken the ceiling, and showed the heavy bolts shot at the top and bottom of the solid door. Nothing less than a battering ram could have burst that door in from the outer side. An hour's work with the file would have failed to break a passage through the bars over the window. How did she get in there? the sergeant asked. Run downstairs and bolted herself in while the missus and the youngin were cooking, was the answering cry from the people in the yard. As they spoke, another vain attempt was made to break in the door from a passage. The noise of the heavy blows redoubled the frenzy of the terrible creature in the kitchen, still trampling round and round under the blazing gaslight. Suddenly, she made a dart at the window and confronted the men looking in from the yard. Her staring eyes were bloodshot. A purple-red flush was over her face. Her hair waved wildly about her, turned away in places by her own hands. Cats! she screamed, glaring out of the window. Millions of cats, all their mouths wide open, spitting at me. Fire! Fire to scare away the cats! She searched furiously in her pocket and tore out a handful of loose papers. One of them escaped and fluttered downward to a wooden press under the window. Amelius was nearest and saw it plainly as it fell. Good heavens, he exclaimed. It's a banknote. Walleye's money! shouted the thieves in the yard. She's going to burn Walleye's money. The mad woman turned back to the middle of the kitchen, leapt up at the gas burner, and set fire to the banknotes. She scattered them flaming all round her on the kitchen floor. Away with you, she shouted, shaking her fists at the visionary multitude of cats. Away with you, up the chimney. Away with you, out the window. She sprang back to the window, with her crooked fingers twisted in her hair, The snakes, she shrieked. The snakes are hissing again in my hair. The beetles are crawling all over my face. She tore at her hair. She scraped her face with long black nails that lacerated the flesh. Amelius turned away, unable to endure the sight of her. Moorcross took his place, eyed her steadily for a moment, and saw the way to end it. A quarter of gin, he shouted. Quick, before she leaves the window. In a minute, he had the pewter measure in his hand and tapped at the window. Gin, Mother Sowler, break the window and have a drop of gin. For a moment, the drunken mastered her own dreadful visions at the sight of the liquor. She broke a pane of glass with her clenched fist. The door, cried Moorcross to the panic-stricken women barricaded behind the table. The door, he reiterated as he handed the gin in through the bars. The elder woman was too terrified to understand him. Her bolder daughter crawled under the table, rushed across the kitchen, and drew the bolts. As the mad woman turned to attack her, the room was filled with men headed by the sergeant. Three of them were barely enough to control the frantic wretch and bind her hand and foot. When Amelius entered the kitchen, after she had been conveyed to the hospital, a five-pound note on the press, secured by one of the police, and a few frail black ashes scattered thinly on the kitchen floor were the only relics left of the ill-gotten money. After inquiry, patiently pursued in more than one direction, failed to throw any light on the mystery of Jervie's death. Moorcross's report to Amelius towards the close of the investigation was little more than ingenious guesswork. It seems pretty clear, sir, in the first place, that Mother Sowler must have overtaken Walleye's after he had left the letter at Mrs. Farnaby's lodgings. In the second place, we are justified, as I shall show you directly, in assuming that she told him of the money in Jervie's possession, and that the two succeeded in discovering Jervie, no doubt through Walleye's superior knowledge of his master's movements. The evidence concerning the banknotes proved this. We know, by the examination of the people at the dairy, that Walleyes took from his pocket a handful of notes when they refused to send for liquor without having the money first. We are also informed that the breaking out of the drink madness in Mother Sowler showed itself in her snatching the notes out of his hand and trying to strangle him 
before she ran down into the kitchen and bolted herself in. Lastly, Mrs. Farnaby's bankers have identified the note saved from the burning as one of the 45-pound notes paid to her check. So much for the tracing of the money. I wish I could give an equally satisfactory account of the tracing of the crime. We can make nothing of Wallace's. He declares that he didn't even know Jervy was dead till we told him, and he swears he found the money dropped in the street. It is needless to say that this last assertion is a lie. Opinions are divided among us as to whether he is answerable for the murder as well as the robbery, or whether there was a third person concerned in it. My own belief is that Jervy was drugged by the old woman, with a young woman very likely used as a decoy in some house by the riverside and then murdered by walleyes in cold blood. We have done our best to clear the matter up, and we have not succeeded. The doctors give us no hope of any assistance from Mother Sowler. If she gets over the attack, which is doubtful, they say she will die to a certainty of liver disease. In short, my own fear is that this will prove to be one more of those murders which are mysterious to the police as well as the public. The report of the case excited some interest, published in the newspapers in conspicuous type. Meddlesome readers wrote letters, offering complacently stupid suggestions to the police. After a while, another crime attracted general attention, and the murder of Jervy disappeared from the public memory, among other forgotten murders of modern times. End of Book 8, Chapter 4 Recorded by Raquel Olea. Book 8, Chapter 5 of The Fallen Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. THE FALLEN LEAVES by Wilkie Collins Book 8 Dame Nature Decides Chapter 5 The last dreary days of November came to their end. No longer darkened by the shadows of crime and torment and death, the life of Amelius glided insensibly into the peaceful byways of seclusion brightened by the companionship of Sally. The winter days followed one another in a happy uniformity of occupations and amusements. There were lessons to fill up the morning and walks to occupy the afternoon, and in the evenings sometimes reading, sometimes singing, sometimes nothing but the lazy luxury of talk. In the vast world of London, with its monstrous extremes of wealth and poverty, and its all-permeating malady of life at fever heat, there was one supremely innocent and supremely happy creature. Sally had heard of heaven, attainable on the hard condition of first paying the debt of death, I have found a kinder heaven, she said one day. It is here in the cottage, and Emilius has shown me the way to it. Their social isolation was at this time complete. They were two friendless people, perfectly insensible to all that was perilous and pitiable in their own position. They parted with a kiss at night, and they met again with a kiss in the morning, and they were as happily free from all mistrust of the future as a pair of birds. No visitors came to the house, the few friends and acquaintances of Emilius, forgotten by him, forgot him in return. Now and then, Toff's wife came to the cottage and exhibited the cherubim baby. Now and then, Toff himself, a musician among his other accomplishments, brought his fiddle upstairs and sang modestly, A little music helps to pass the time played to the young master and mistress the cheerful, tinkling tunes of the old vaudevilles of France. They were pleased with these small interruptions when they came, and they were not disappointed when the days passed and the baby and the vaudevilles were hushed in absence and silence. 
So the happy winter time went by, and the howling winds brought no rheumatism with them, and even the tax-gatherer himself, looking in at this earthly paradise, departed without a curse when he left his little paper behind him. Now and then, at long intervals, the outer world intruded itself in the form of a letter. Regina wrote, always with the same placid affection, always entering into the same minute narrative of the slow progress of dear uncle's return to health. He was forbidden to exert himself in any way. His nerves were in a state of lamentable irritability. I dare not even mention your name to him, dear Amelius. It seems I cannot think why to make him, oh, so unreasonably angry. I can only submit and pray that he may soon be himself again. Amelius wrote back, always in the same considerate and gentle tone, always laying the blame of his dull letters on the studious uniformity of his life, he preserved, with a perfectly easy conscience, the most absolute silence on the subject of Sally. While he was faithful to Regina, what reason had he to reproach himself with the protection that he offered to a poor motherless girl? When he was married, he might mention the circumstances under which he had met with Sally, and leave the rest to his wife's sympathy. One morning, the letters with the Paris postmark were varied by a few lines from Rufus. Every morning, my bright boy, I get up and say to myself, well, I reckon it's about time to take the route for London, and every morning, if you'll believe me, I put it off till next day. Whether it's in the good feeding, expensive I admit, but when your cook helps you to digest instead of hindering you, a man of my dyspeptic nation is too grateful to complain. Or whether it's in the air, which reminds me, I do assure you, of our native atmosphere at Cool Spring, Massachusetts, is more than I can tell with a hard steel pen on a leaf of flimsy paper. You have heard the saying, when a good American dies, he goes to Paris. Maybe sometimes he's smart enough to discount his own death and rationally enjoy the future time in the present. This, you see, is a poetic light. But, mercy be praised, the moral of my residence in Paris is plain. If I can't go to Emilius, Emilius must come to me. Note the address, Grand Hotel, and pack up like a good boy on receipt of this. Memorandum. The brown miss is here. I saw her taking the air in a carriage and raised my hat. She looked the other way. British, eminently British, but there I bear no malice. I am her most obedient servant, and yours affectionately, Rufus. Postscript, I want you to see some of our girls at this hotel, the genuine American material, sir, perfected by worth. Another morning brought with it a few sad lines from Phoebe. After what had happened, she was quite unable to face her friends. She had no heart to seek employment in her own country. Her present life was too dreary and too hopeless to be endured. A benevolent lady had made her an offer to accompany a part of emigrants to New Zealand, and she had accepted the proposal. Perhaps among the new people she might recover her self-respect and her spirits, and live to be a better woman. Meanwhile, she bade Mr. Goldenheart farewell, and asked his pardon for taking the liberty of wishing him happy with Miss Regina. Amelius wrote a few kind lines to Phoebe, and a cordial reply to Rufus, making the pursuit of his studies his excuse for remaining in London. After this, there was no further correspondence. The mornings succeeded each other, and the postman brought no more news from the world outside. But the lessons went on, and the teacher and pupil were as inconsiderately happy as ever in each other's society, observing with inexhaustible interest the progress of the mental development of Sally, Amelius was slow to perceive the physical development which was unobtrusively keeping pace with it. He was absolutely ignorant of the part which his own influence was taking in the gradual and delicate process of change. Ere long, the first forewarnings of the coming disturbance in their harmless relations toward each other began to show themselves. 
Ere long there were signs of a troubled mind in Sally which were mysteries to Amelius and subjects of wonderment, sometimes even trials of temper to the girl herself. One day she looked in from the door of her room in her white dressing gown and asked to be forgiven if she kept the lessons of the morning waiting for a little while. "'Come in,' said Amelius, "'and tell me why.' She hesitated. You won't think me lazy if you see me in my dressing gown? Of course not. Your dressing gown, my dear, is as good as any other gown. A young girl like you looks best in white. She came in with her work basket and her indoor dress over her arm. Amelius laughed. Why haven't you put it on? he asked. She sat down in a corner and looked at her work basket instead of looking at Amelius. It doesn't fit me so well as it did, she answered. I am obliged to alter it. Amelius looked at her, at the charming youthful figure that had filled out, at the softly rounded outline of the face with no angles and hollows in it now. Is it the dressmaker's fault? he asked slyly. Her eyes were still on the basket. It's my fault, she said. You remember what a poor little skinny creature I was when you first saw me? I... You won't like me the worse for it, will you? I am getting fat. I don't know why. They say happy people get fat. Perhaps that's why. I'm never hungry and never frightened and never miserable now. She stopped. Her dress slipped from her lap to the floor. Don't look at me, she said, and suddenly put her hands over her face. Amelia saw the tears finding their way through the pretty, plump fingers, which he remembered so shapeless and so thin. He crossed the room and touched her gently on the shoulder. "'My dear child, have I said anything to distress you?' "'Nothing.' "'Then why are you crying?' "'I don't know.' She hesitated, looked at him, and made a desperate effort to tell him what was in her mind. "'I'm afraid you'll get tired of me.' There's nothing about me to make you pity me now. You seem to be not quite the same. No, it isn't that. I don't know what's come to me. I'm a greater fool than ever. Give me my lesson, Amelius. Please give me my lesson. Amelius produced the books in some little surprise at Sally's extraordinary anxiety to begin her lessons, while the unaltered dress lay neglected on the carpet at her feet. A discreet abstract of the history of England, published for the use of young persons, happened to be at the top of the books. The system of education under Amelius recognized the laws of chance. They began with the history because it turned up first. Sally read aloud, and Sally's master explained obscure passages and corrected occasional errors of pronunciation as she went on. On that particular morning there was little to explain and nothing to correct. "'Am I doing it well today?' Sally inquired on reaching the end of her task. "'Very well indeed.' She shut the book and looked at her teacher. "'I wonder how it is,' she resumed, "'that I get on so much better with my lessons here than I did at the home, "'and yet it's foolish of me to wonder. "'I get on better because you are teaching me, of course.' but I don't feel satisfied with myself. I'm the same helpless creature. I feel your kindness and can't make any return to you. For all my learning, I should like... She left the thought in her unexpressed and opened her copy book. I'll do my writing now, she said, in a quiet, resigned way. Perhaps I may improve enough some day to keep your accounts for you. She chose her pen a little absently and began to write. Amelius looked over her shoulder and laughed. She was writing his name. He pointed to the copper plate copy on the top line, presenting an undeniable moral maxim in characters beyond the reach of criticism. Change is a law of nature. There, my dear, you are to copy that till you're tired of it, said the easy master, and then we'll try Overleaf, another copy beginning with letter D. Sally laid down her pen. I don't like change is a law of nature, she said, knitting her pretty eyebrows into a frown. I looked at those words yesterday, and they made me miserable at night. 
I was foolish enough to think that we should always go on together as we go on now, till I saw that copy. I hate the copy. It came to my mind when I was awake in the dark, and it seemed to tell me that we were going to change some day. That's the worst of learning. One knows too much, and then there's an end of one's happiness. Thoughts come to you when you don't want them. I thought of the young lady we saw last week in the park. She spoke gravely and sadly. The bright contentment which had given a new charm to her eyes since she had been at the cottage died out of them as Amelius looked at her. What had become of her childish manner and her artless smile? He drew his chair nearer to her. What young lady do you mean, he asked. Sally shook her head and traced lines with her pen on the blotting paper. Oh, you can't have forgotten her. A young lady riding on a grand white horse. All the people were admiring her. I wonder you cared to look at me after that beautiful creature had gone by. Ah, uh, She knows all sorts of things that I don't. She doesn't sound a note at a time on the piano, and as often as not the wrong one. She can say her multiplication table and knows all the cities of the world. I dare say she's almost as learned as you are. If you had her living here with you, wouldn't you like it better than only having me? She dropped her arms on the table and laid her head on them wearily. The dreadful streets, she murmured in low tones of despair. Why did I think of the dreadful streets on the night I met with you after I had seen the young lady? Oh, Amelius, are you tired of me? Are you ashamed of me? She lifted her head again before he could answer, and controlled herself by a sudden effort of resolution. I don't know what's the matter with me this morning, she said, looking at him with a pleading fear in her eyes. Never mind my nonsense. I'll do the copy. She began to write the unendurable assertion that change is a law of nature, with trembling fingers and fast-heaving breath. Amelius took the pen gently out of her hand. His voice faltered as he spoke to her. "'We will give up the lessons for today, Sally. You have had a bad night's rest, my dear, and you are feeling it, that's all. Do you think you are well enough to come out with me and try if the air will revive you a little?' She rose and took his hand and kissed it. I believe if I was dying I should get well enough to go out with you. May I ask one little favor? Do you mind if we don't go into the park today? What has made you take a dislike to the park, Sally? We might meet the beautiful young lady again, she answered with her head down. I don't want to do that. We will go wherever you like, my child. You shall decide, not I. She gathered up her dress from the floor and hurried away to her room without looking back at him as usual when she opened the door. Left by himself, Amelia sat at the table, mechanically turning over the lesson books. Sally had perplexed and even distressed him. His capacity to preserve the harmless relations between them depended mainly on the mute appeal which the girl's ignorant innocence unconsciously addressed to him. He felt this vaguely without absolutely realizing it. By some mysterious process of association which he was unable to follow, a saying of the wise elder brother at Tadmor revived in his memory while he was trying to see his way through the difficulties that beset him. "'You will meet with many temptations, Emilius, when you leave our community,' the old man had said at parting, "'and most of them will come to you through women.' Be especially on your guard, my son, if you meet with a woman who makes you feel truly sorry for her. She is on the high road to your passions, through the open door of your sympathies, and all the more certainly if she is not aware of it herself. Amelius felt the truth expressed in those words, as he had never felt it yet. There had been signs of a changing nature in Sally for some little time past but they had expressed themselves too delicately to attract the attention of a man unprepared to be on the watch. Only on that morning they had been marked enough to force themselves on his notice. Only on that morning she had looked at him and spoken to him as she had never looked or spoken before. 
he began dimly to see the danger for both of them to which he had shut his eyes thus far where was the remedy what ought he to do those questions came naturally into his mind and yet his mind shrank from pursuing them he got up impatiently and busied himself in putting away the lesson books a small duty hitherto always left to toff it was useless his mind dwelt persistently on sally while he moved about the room he still saw the look in her eyes he still heard the tone of her voice when she spoke of the young lady in the park the words of the good physician whom he had consulted about her recurred to his memory now the natural growth of her senses has been stunted like the natural growth of her body by starvation terror exposure to cold and other influences inherent in the life that she has led and then the doctor had spoken of nourishing food pure air and careful treatment all the life in short which she had led at the cottage and had predicted that she would develop into an intelligent and healthy young woman again he asked himself what ought i to do he turned aside to the window and looked out an idea occurred to him how would it be if he summoned courage enough to tell her that he was engaged to be married no setting aside his natural dread of the shock that he might inflict on the poor grateful girl who had only known happiness under his care the detestable obstacle of mr farnaby stood immovably in his way sally would be sure to ask questions about his engagement and would never rest until they were answered it had been necessarily impossible to conceal her mother's name from her the discovery of her father if she heard of regina and regina's uncle would be simply a question of time what might such a man be not capable of doing what new act of treachery might he not commit if he found himself claimed by the daughter whom he had deserted even if the expression of mrs farnaby's last wishes had not been sacred to amelius this consideration alone would have kept him silent for sally's sake he now doubted for the first time if he had calculated wisely in planning to trust sally's sad story after his marriage to the sympathies of his wife the jealousy that she might naturally feel of a young girl who was an object of interest to her husband did not present the worst difficulty to contend with she believed in her uncle's integrity as she believed in her religion what would she say what would she do if the innocent witness to farnaby's infamy was presented to her if amelius asked the protection for sally which her own father had refused to her in her infancy and if he said as he must say your uncle is the man and yet what prospect could he see but the prospect of making the disclosure when he looked to his own interest next and thought of his wedding day again the sinister figure of farnaby confronted him how could he receive the wretch whom regina would innocently welcome to the house there would be no longer a choice left it would be his duty to himself to tell his wife the terrible truth and what would be the result he recalled the whole course of his courtship and saw farnaby always on a level with himself in regina's estimation in spite of his natural cheerfulness in spite of his inbred courage his heart failed him when he thought of the time to come as he turned away from the window sally's door opened she joined him ready for the walk her spirits had rallied assisted by the cheering influence of dressing to go out her charming smile brightened her face in sheer desperation reckless of what he did or said amelius held out both hands to welcome her that's right sally he cried look pleased and pretty my dear let's be happy while we can and let the future take care of itself end of book eight dame nature decides chapter five book eight chapter six of the fallen leaves this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Fallen Leaves by Wilkie Collins. Book 8. Dame Nature Decides. Chapter 6. The capricious influences which combine to make us happy are never so certain to be absent influences as when we are foolish enough to talk about them. Amelius had talked about them. When he and Sally left the cottage, the road which led them away from the park was also the road which led them past a church. The influences of happiness left them at the church door. Rows of carriages were in waiting. Hundreds of idle people were assembled about the church steps. The thunderous music of the organ rolled out through the open doors. A grand wedding with choral service was in course of celebration. Sally begged Amelius to take her in to see it. They tried the front entrance and found it impossible to get through the crowd. A side entrance and a fee to a verger succeeded better. They obtained space enough to stand on with a view of the altar. The bride was a tall buxom girl, splendidly dressed. She performed her part in the ceremony with the most unruffled composure. The bridegroom exhibited an instructive spectacle of aged nature, sustained by art. His hair, his complexion, his teeth, his breast, his shoulders, and his legs showed what the wig-maker, the valet, the dentist, the tailor, and the hosier can do for a rich old man, who wishes to present a juvenile appearance while he is buying a young wife. No less than three clergymen were present, conducting the sale. The demeanor of the rich congregation was worthy of the glorious bygone days of the golden calf. So far as could be judged by appearances, one old lady in a pew close to the place at which Amelius and Sally were standing seemed to be the only person present who was not favorably impressed by the ceremony. "'I call it disgraceful,' the old lady remarked to a charming young person seated next to her. But the charming young person, being the legitimate product of the present time, had no more sympathy with questions of sentiment than a hottentot. "'How can you talk so, Grandmama?' she rejoined. "'He has twenty thousand a year, and that lucky girl will be mistress of the most splendid house in London.' "'I don't care,' the old lady persisted. "'It's not the less a disgrace to everybody concerned in it. "'There is many a poor friendless creature, driven by hunger to the streets, "'who has a better claim to our sympathy than that shameless girl, "'selling herself in the house of God. "'I'll wait for you in the carriage. "'I won't see any more of it.' "'Sally touched Amelius. "'Take me out,' she whispered faintly. He supposed that the heat in the church had been too much for her. Are you better now, he asked, when they got into the open air. She held fast by his arm. Let's get farther away, she said. That lady is coming after us. I don't want her to see me again. I am one of the creatures she talked about. Is the mark of the streets on me, after all you have done to rub it out? The wild misery in her words presented another development in her character which was entirely new to Amelius. "'My dear child,' he remonstrated, "'you just stress me when you talk in that way. God knows the life you are leading now.' But Sally's mind was still full of her own acutely painful sense of what the lady had said. "'I saw her,' she burst out. "'I saw her look at me while she spoke.' "'And she thought you better worth looking at than the bride, and quite right, too,' Amelius rejoined. "'Come, come, Sally, be like yourself. You don't want to make me unhappy about you, I am sure.' He had taken the right way with her. She felt that simple appeal, and asked his pardon with all the old charm in her manner and her voice. For the moment she was simple Sally again. They walked on in silence. When they had lost sight of the church, Amelius felt her hand beginning to tremble on his arm. A mingled expression of tenderness and anxiety showed itself in her blue eyes as they looked up at him. "'I am thinking of something else now,' she said. "'I am thinking of you. May I ask you something?' Amelius smiled. The smile was not reflected as usual in Sally's face. 
It's nothing particular, she explained in an odd, hurried way. The church put it into my head. You... Uh, she hesitated and tried it under another form. Will you be married yourself, Emilius, one of these days? He did his best to evade the question. I am not rich, Sally, like the old gentleman we have just seen. Her eyes turned away from him. She sighed softly to herself. You will be married some day, she said. Will you do one kind thing more for me, Emilius, when I die? You remember my reading in the newspaper of the new invention for burning the dead and my asking you about it? You said you thought it was better than burying, and you had a good mind to leave directions to be burnt instead of buried when your time came. When my time has come, will you leave other directions about yourself if I ask you? My dear, you are talking in a very strange way. If you will have it that I am to be married some day, what has that to do with your death? It doesn't matter, Amelius. When I have nothing left to live for, I suppose it's as likely as not I may die. Will you tell them to bury me in some quiet place, away from London, where there are very few graves? And when you leave your directions, don't say you are to be burnt. Say, when you have lived a long, long life, and enjoyed all the happiness you have deserved so well, say you are to be buried, and your grave is to be near mine. I should like to think of the same trees shading us, and the same flowers growing over us. No, don't tell me I'm talking strangely again. I can't bear it. I want you to humor me and be kind to me about this. Do you mind going home? I'm feeling a little tired, and I know I'm poor company for you today. The talk flagged at dinner time, though Toff did his best to keep it going. In the evening, the excellent Frenchman made an effort to cheer the two dull young people. He came in confidentially with his fiddle and said he had a favor to ask. I possess some knowledge, sir, of the delightful art of dancing. Might I teach young Miss to dance? You see, if I may venture to say so, the other lessons are oh, most useful, most important, the other lessons, but they are just a little serious. Something to relieve her mind, sir, if you will forgive me for mentioning it. I plead for innocent gaiety. Let us dance. He played a few notes on the fiddle and placed his right foot in position and waited amiably to begin. Sally thanked him and made the excuse that she was tired. She wished Amelius good night without waiting until they were alone together and for the first time without giving him the customary kiss. Toff waited until she had gone and approached his master on tiptoe with a low bow. May I take the liberty of expressing an opinion, sir? A young girl who rejects the remedy of the fiddle presents a case of extreme gravity. Don't despair, sir. It is my pride and pleasure to be never at a loss where your interests are concerned. This is, I think, a matter for the ministrations of a woman. If you have confidence in my wife, I venture to suggest a visit from Madame Toff. He discreetly retired and left his master to think about it. The time passed, and Amelius was still thinking, and still as far as ever from arriving at a conclusion, when he heard a door opened behind him. Sally crossed the room before he could rise from his chair. Her cheeks were flushed, her eyes were bright, her hair fell loose over her shoulders. She dropped at his feet and hid her face on his knees. "'I'm an ungrateful wretch,' she burst out. "'I never kissed you when I said good night.' With the best intentions, Amelius took the worst possible way of composing her. He treated her trouble lightly. "'Perhaps you forgot it,' he said. She lifted her head and looked at him with the tears in her eyes. "'I'm bad enough,' she answered, "'but not so bad as that. "'Oh, don't laugh. There's nothing to laugh at. "'Have you done with liking me? "'Are you angry with me for behaving so badly all day "'and bidding you good night as if you were tough? You shan't be angry with me. She jumped up and sat on his knee and put her arms round his neck. I haven't been to bed, she whispered. I was too miserable to go to sleep. I don't know what's been the matter with me today. I seem to be losing the little sense I ever had. Oh, if I could only make you understand how fond I am of you. 
and yet i've had bitter thoughts as if i was a burden to you and i had done a wrong thing in coming here and you would have told me so only you pitied the poor wretch who had nowhere else to go she tightened her hold round his neck and laid her burning cheek against his face oh amelius my heart is sore kiss me and say good night sally he was young he was a man for a moment he lost his self-control he kissed her as he had never kissed her yet then he remembered he recovered himself he put her gently away from him and led her to the door of her room and closed it on her in silence for a little while he waited alone the interval over he rang for toff do you think your wife would take miss sally as an apprentice he asked toff looked astonished whatever you wish sir my wife will do her knowledge of the art of dressmaking is words failed him to express his wife's immense capacity as a dressmaker he kissed his hand in mute enthusiasm and blew the kiss in the direction of madame toff's establishment however he proceeded i ought to tell you one thing sir the business is small small very small but we are all in the hands of providence the business will improve one day he lifted his shoulders and lifted his eyebrows and looked perfectly satisfied with his wife's prospects i will go and speak to madame toff myself to-morrow morning amelius resumed it's quite possible that i may be obliged to leave london for a little while and i must provide in some way for miss sally don't say a word about it to her yet toff and don't look miserable if i go away i shall take you with me good-night toff with his handkerchief halfway to his eyes recovered his native cheerfulness i am invariably sick at sea sir he said but no matter i will attend you to the uttermost ends of the earth so honest amelius planned his way of escape from the critical position in which he found himself he went to his bed troubled by anxieties which kept him waking for many weary hours where was he to go to when he left sally if he could have known what had happened on that very day on the other side of the channel he might have decided in spite of the obstacle of mr farnaby on surprising regina by a visit to paris end of book the eighth chapter six book eight Chapter 7 of The Fallen Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Fallen Leaves by Wilkie Collins. Book 8 Dame Nature Decides. Chapter 7 on the morning when emilius and sally in london entered the church to look at the wedding rufus in paris went to the champs elysees to take a walk he had advanced halfway up the magnificent avenue when he saw regina for the second time taking her daily drive with an elderly woman in attendance on her rufus took off his hat again perfectly impenetrable to the cold reception which he had already experienced greatly to his surprise regina not only returned his salute but stopped the carriage and beckoned to him to speak to her looking at her more closely he perceived signs of suffering in her face which completely altered her expression as he remembered it her magnificent eyes were dim and red she had lost her rich colour her voice trembled as she spoke to him have you a few minutes to spare she asked the whole day if you like miss rufus answered she turned to the woman who accompanied her wait here for me elizabeth i have something to say to this gentleman with those words she got out of the carriage rufus offered her his arm she put her hand in it as readily as if they had been old friends let us take one of the side paths she said they are almost deserted at this time of day i am afraid i surprise you very much i can only trust to your kindness to forgive me for passing you without notice the last time we met perhaps it may be some excuse for me that i am in great trouble 
It is just possible you may be able to relieve my mind. I believe you know I am engaged to be married. Rufus looked at her with a sudden expression of interest. Is this about Amelius, he asked? She answered him almost inaudibly, Yes. Rufus still kept his eyes fixed on her. I don't wish to say anything, miss, he explained, but if you have any complaint to make of Amelius, I should take it as a favor if you would look me straight in the face and mention it plainly. In the embarrassment which troubled Regina at that moment, he had preferred the two requests of all others with which it was most impossible for her to comply. She still looked obstinately on the ground, and, instead of speaking of Amelius, she diverged to the subject of Mr. Farnaby's illness. "'I am staying in Paris with my uncle,' she said. "'He has had a long illness, but he is strong enough now to speak to me of things that have been on his mind for some time past. He has so surprised me, he has made me so miserable about Amelius.' She paused and put her handkerchief to her eyes. Rufus said nothing to console her. He waited doggedly until she was ready to go on. "'You know Amelius well,' she resumed. "'You are fond of him. You believe in him, don't you? Do you think he is capable of behaving basely to any person who trusts him? Is it likely, is it possible he could be false and cruel to me?' The mere question roused the indignation of Rufus. "'Whoever said that of him, miss?' told you a lie. I answer for my boy as I answer for myself. She looked at him at last with a sudden expression of relief. I said so too, she rejoined. I said some enemy had slandered him. My uncle won't tell me who he is. He positively forbids me to write to Emilius. He tells me I must never see Emilius again. He is going to write and break off the engagement. Oh, it's too cruel, too cruel." Thus far they had been walking on slowly, but now Rufus stopped, determined to make her speak plainly. "'Take a word of advice from me, miss,' he said. "'Never trust anybody by halves. There's nothing I'm not ready to do to set this matter right. But I must know what I'm about first. What's said against Amelius? Out with it, no matter what tis. I'm old enough to be your father, and I feel for you accordingly. I do.' The thorough sincerity of tone and manner which accompanied those words had its effect. Regina blushed and trembled, but she spoke out. "'My uncle says Amelius has disgraced himself and insulted me. My uncle says there is a person, a girl, living with him.' She stopped with a faint cry of alarm. Her hand, still resting on the arm of Rufus, felt him start as the allusion to the girl passed her lips. "'You have heard of it,' she cried. "'Oh, God, help me! It's true!' "'True?' Rufus repeated with stern contempt. "'What's come to you? Haven't I told you already it's a lie? I'll answer to it. Amelius is true to you. Will that do? No? You're an obstinate one, miss, that you are? Well, it's due to the boy that I should set him right with you, if words will do it. You know how he's been brought up at Tadmore. Bear that in mind, and now you shall have the truth of it, on the word of an honest man. Without further preface, he told her how Amelius had met with Sally, insisting strongly on the motives of pure humanity by which his friend had been actuated. Regina listened with an obstinate expression of distrust, which would have discouraged most men. Rufus persisted, nevertheless, and to some extent at least succeeded in producing the right impression. When he reached the close of the narrative, when he asserted that he had himself seen Amelius confide the girl unreservedly to the care of a lady who was a dear and valued friend of his own, and when he declared that there had been no after-meeting between them and no written correspondence, then at last Regina owned that he had not encouraged her to trust in the honor of Amelius without reason to justify him. But even under these circumstances there was a residue of suspicion still left in her mind. She asked for the name of the lady to whose benevolent assistance Amelius had been indebted. Rufus took out one of his cards and wrote Mrs. Payson's name and address on it. 
"'Your nature, my dear, is not quite so confiding as I could have wished to see it,' he said, quietly handing her the card. "'But we can't change our natures, can we? And you're not bound to believe a man like me without witnesses to back him. Write to Mrs. Payson and make your mind easy, and, while we are about it, tell me where I can telegraph to you tomorrow. I'm off to London by the night mail.' "'Do you mean you are going to see Amelius?' "'That is so. I'm too fond of Amelius to let this trouble rest where tis now. I've been away from him, here in Paris, for some little time, and you may tell me, and quite right too, I can't answer for what may have been going on in my absence. No. Now we are about it, we'll have it out. I mean to see Amelius and see Mrs. Payson to-morrow morning. Just tell your uncle to hold his hand before he breaks off your marriage, and wait for a telegram from me.' "'Well, and this is your address, is it? "'I know the hotel, a nice lookout on the Tuileries Gardens, "'but a bad seller of wine, as I hear. "'I'm at the Grand Hotel myself, "'if there's anything else that troubles you before evening. "'Now, I look at you again. "'I reckon there's something more to be said, "'if you'll only let it find its way to your tongue. "'No, it ain't thanks. "'We'll take the gratitude for granted "'and get to what's behind it. "'There's your carriage, and the good lady looks tired of waiting. "'Well, now?' "'It's only one thing,' Regina acknowledged, with her eyes on the ground again. "'Perhaps when you go to London you may see the—' "'The girl?' "'Yes. It's not likely. Say I do see her. What then?' Regina's color began to show itself again. "'If you do see her,' she said, "'I beg and entreat you won't speak of me in her hearing. "'I should die of the shame of it "'if she thought herself asked to give him up out of pity for me. "'Promise I am not to be brought forward. "'Promise you won't even mention my having spoken to you about it. "'On your word of honor. "'Rufus gave her his promise without showing any hesitation or making any remark.' but when she shook hands with him on returning to the carriage, he held her hand for a moment. "'Please to excuse me, miss, if I ask one question,' he said, in tones too low to be heard by any other person. "'Are you really fond of Amelius?' "'I am surprised you should doubt it,' she answered. "'I am more, much more, than fond of him.' Rufus handed her silently into the carriage, "'Fond of him, are you?' he thought, as he walked away by himself. "'I reckon it's a sort of fondness that don't wear well and won't stand washing.'" End of Book 8, Chapter 7「Book 8, Chapter 8 of The Fallen Leaves – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros The Fallen Leaves by Wilkie Collins Book 8 Dame Nature Decides Chapter 8 Early the next morning, Rufus rang at the cottage gate. Well, Mr. Frenchman, and how do you get along, and how's Amelius? Toff, standing before the gate, answered with the utmost respect, but showed no inclination to let the visitor in. "'Amelius has his intervals of laziness,' Rufus proceeded. "'I bet he's in bed.' "'My young master was up and dressed an hour ago, sir. He has just gone out.' "'That is so, is it? Well, I'll wait till he comes back.' He pushed by Toff and walked into the cottage. "'Your foreign ceremonies are clean thrown away on me,' he said." as Toff tried to stop him in the hall. I'm the American savage, and I'm used up with traveling all night. Here's a little order for you. Whiskey, bitters, lemon, and ice. I'll take a cocktail in the library. Toff made a last desperate effort to get between the visitor and the door. I beg your pardon, sir, a thousand times. I must most respectfully entreat you to wait." Before he could explain himself, Rufus, with the most perfect good humor, pulled the old man out of his way. "'What's troubling this venerable creature's mind?' he inquired of himself. "'Does he think I don't know my way in?' 
He opened the library door and found himself face to face with Sally. She had risen from her chair, hearing voices outside, and hesitating whether to leave the room or not. They confronted each other on either side of the table in silent dismay. For once Rufus was so completely bewildered that he took refuge in his customary form of greeting before he was aware of it himself. "'How do you find yourself, miss? I take pleasure in renewing our acquaintance.' "'Thunder! That's not it. I reckon I'm off my head. Do me the favor, young woman, to forget every word I've said to you. If any mortal creature had told me I should find you here, I should have said twas a lie, and I should have been the liar. That makes a man feel bad, I can tell you. No, don't slide off, if you please, into the next room. That won't set things right, no how.' sit you down again now i'm here i have something to say i'll speak first to mr frenchman listen to this old sir if i happen to want a witness standing in the doorway i'll ring the bell for the present i can do without you bong sure as we say in your country he proceeded to shut the door on toff and his remonstrances "'I protest, sir, against acts of violence unworthy of a gentleman,' cried Toff, struggling to get back again. "'Be as angry as you please in the kitchen,' Rufus answered, persisting in closing the door. "'I won't have a noise up here. If you know where your master is, go and fetch him, and the sooner the better.' He turned back to Sally and surveyed her for a while in terrible silence. She was afraid to look at him. Her eyes were on the book which she had been reading when he came in. "'You look to me,' Rufus remarked, "'as if you had been settled here for a time. "'Never mind your book now. "'You can go back to your reading "'after we've had a word or two together first. He reached out his long arm and pulled the book to his own side of the table. Sally innocently silenced him for the second time. He opened the book and discovered the New Testament.' "'It's my lesson, if you please, sir. I'm to learn it where the pencil mark is before Amelius comes back.' She offered her poor little explanation, trembling with terror. In spite of himself, Rufus began to look at her less sternly. "'So you call him Amelius, do you?' he said. "'I note that miss as an unfavorable sign to begin with. "'How long, if you please?' "'Has Amelius turned schoolmarm for your young ladyship's benefit. "'Don't you understand? "'Well, you're not the only inhabitant of Great Britain "'who don't understand the English language. "'I'll put it plainer. "'When I last saw Amelius, you were learning your lessons at the home. "'What ill wind, miss, blew you in here? "'Did Amelius fetch you, or did you come of your own accord "'without waiting to be whistled for?' He spoke coarsely, but not ill-humouredly. Sally's pretty downcast face was pleading with him for mercy, and, as he felt with supreme contempt for himself, was not altogether pleading in vain. "'If I guessed that you ran away from the home,' he resumed, "'should I guess right?' She answered with a sudden accession of confidence. "'Don't blame Amelia,' she said. "'I did run away. I couldn't live without him.' "'You don't know how you can live, young one, till you've tried the experiment. "'Well, and what did they do at the home? "'Did they send after you to fetch you back?' "'They wouldn't take me back. "'They sent my clothes here after me. "'Ah, those were the rules, I reckon. "'I begin to see my way to the end of it now. "'Emilius gave you house room?' "'She looked at him proudly. "'He gave me a room of my own,' she said. His next question was the exact repetition of the question which he had put to Regina in Paris. The only variety was in the answer that he received. "'Are you fond of Amelius?' "'I would die for him.' Rufus had hitherto spoken, standing. He now took a chair. "'If Amelius had not been brought up at Tadmore,' he said, "'I should take my hat and wish you good morning. "'As things are, a word more may be a word in season. "'Your lessons here seem to have agreed with you, miss. "'You're a different sort of girl to what you were when I last saw you.' "'She surprised him by receiving that remark in silence. "'The color left her face. "'She sighed bitterly. "'The sigh puzzled Rufus.' He held his opinion of her in suspense until he had heard more. 
you said just now you would die for amelius he went on eyeing her attentively i take that to be a woman's hysterical way of mentioning that she feels interest in amelius are you fond enough of him to leave him if you could only be persuaded that leaving him was for his good she abruptly left the table and went to the window when her back was turned to rufus she spoke am i a disgrace to him she asked in tones so faint that he could barely hear them i have had my fears of it before now if he had been less fond of amelius his natural kindness of heart might have kept him silent even as it was he made no direct reply you remember how you were living when amelius first met with you was all he said the sad blue eyes looked at him in patient sorrow the low sweet voice answered yes only a look and a word only the influence of an instant and in that instant rufus's last doubts of her vanished don't think i say it reproachfully my child i know it was not your fault i know you are to be pitied and not blamed she turned her face towards him pale quiet and resigned pitied and not blamed she repeated am i to be forgiven he shrank from answering her there was silence you said just now she went on that i looked like a different girl since you last saw me i am a different girl i think of things that i never thought of before some change i don't know what has come over me oh my heart does hunger so to be good i do so long to deserve what emilius has done for me you have got my book there emilius gave it to me we read in it every day if christ had been on earth now is it wrong to think that christ would have forgiven me no my dear it's right to think so and while i live if i do my best to lead a good life and if my last prayer to god is to take me to heaven shall i be heard you will be heard my child i don't doubt it but you see you have got the world about you to reckon with and the world has invented a religion of its own there's no use looking for it in this book of yours it's a religion with the pride of property at the bottom of it and a veneer of benevolent sentiment at the top it will be very sorry for you and very charitable towards you in short it will do everything for you except taking you back again she had her answer to that Amelius has taken me back again, she said. Amelius has taken you back again, Rufus agreed, but there is one thing he's forgotten to do. He has forgotten to count the cost. It seems to be left to me to do that. Look here, my girl, I own I doubted you when I first came into this room, and I'm sorry for it, and I beg your pardon. I do believe you're a good girl. I couldn't say why if I was asked, but I do believe in it for all that. I wish there was no more to be said, but there is more, and neither you nor I must shirk it. Public opinion won't deal as tenderly with you as I do. Public opinion will make the worst of you and the worst of Amelius. While you're living here with him, there's no disguising it. You're innocently in the way of the boy's prospects in life. I don't know whether you understand me. She had turned away from him. She was looking out of the window once more. I understand you, she answered. On the night when Amelius met with me, he did wrong to take me away with him. He ought to have left me where I was. Wait a bit. That's as far from my meaning as far can be. There's a lookout for everybody, and if you'll trust me, I'll find a lookout for you. She paid no heed to what he said. Her next words showed that she was pursuing her own train of thought. I am in the way of his prospects in life, she resumed. You mean that he might be married some day, but for me. Rufus admitted it cautiously. The thing might happen, was all he said. And his friends might come and see him, she went on, her face still turned away, and her voice sinking into dull, subdued tones. Nobody comes here now. You see, I understand you. When shall I go away? I had better not say good-bye, I suppose. It would only distress him. I could slip out of the house, couldn't I? Rufus began to feel uneasy. He was prepared for tears, but not for such resignation as this. 
After a little hesitation, he joined her at the window. She never turned towards him. She still looked out straight before her. Her bright young face had turned pitiably rigid and pale. He spoke to her very gently, advising her to think of what he had said and to do nothing in a hurry. She knew the hotel at which he stayed when he was in London, and she could write to him there. If she decided to begin a new life in another country, he was wholly and truly at her service. He would provide a passage for her in the same ship that took him back to America. At his age, and known as he was in his own neighborhood, there would be no scandal to fear. He could get her reputably and profitably employed in work which a young girl might undertake. "'I'll be as good as a father to you, my poor child,' he said. "'Don't think you're going to be friendless if you leave Emilius. "'I'll see to that. "'You shall have honest people about you "'and innocent pleasure in your new life.' "'She thanked him, still with the same dull, tearless resignation. "'What will the honest people say?' she asked, "'when they know who I am. "'They have no business to know who you are, "'and they shan't know it.' "'Ah, it comes back to the same thing,' she said. You must deceive the honest people, or you can do nothing for me. Amelius had better have left me where I was. I disgraced nobody. I was a burden to nobody there. Cold and hunger and ill-treatment can sometimes be merciful friends in their way. If I had been left to them, they would have laid me at rest by this time. She turned to Rufus before he could speak to her. I'm not ungrateful, sir. I'll think of it, as you say, and I'll do all that a poor foolish creature can do to be worthy of the interest you take in me. She lifted her hand to her head with a momentary expression of pain. I've got a dull kind of aching here, she said. It reminds me of my old life, when I was sometimes beaten on the head. May I go and lie down a little by myself? Rufus took her hand and pressed it in silence. She looked back at him as she opened the door of her room. "'Don't distress, Amelius,' she said. "'I can bear anything but that.' Left alone in the library, Rufus walked restlessly to and fro, driven by a troubled mind. "'I was bound to do it,' he thought, "'and I ought to be satisfied with myself. "'I'm not satisfied. "'The world is hard on women, "'and the rights of property is a darned bad reason for it.' The door from the hall was suddenly thrown open. Amelius entered the room. He looked flushed and angry. He refused to take the hand that Rufus offered to him. "'What's this I hear from Toff? It seems that you forced your way in when Sally was here. There are limits to the liberties that a man may take in his friend's house.' "'That's true,' said Rufus quietly. "'But when a man hasn't taken liberties, there don't seem much to be said.' "'Sally was at the home when I last saw you, "'and nobody told me I should find her in this room. "'You might have left the room when you found her here. "'You have been talking to her. "'If you have said anything about Regina... "'I have said nothing about Miss Regina. "'You have a hot temper of your own, Emilius. "'Wait a bit and let it cool. "'Never mind my temper. "'I want to know what you have been saying to Sally. "'Stop. I'll ask Sally herself.' "'He crossed the room to the inner door and knocked. "'Come in here, my dear. I want to speak to you.' The answer reached him faintly through the door. "'I have got a bad headache, Amelius. Please let me rest a little.' He turned back to Rufus and lowered his voice, but his eyes flashed. He was more angry than ever. "'You had better go,' he said. "'I can guess how you have been talking to her. I know what her headache means.' Any man who distresses that dear little affectionate creature is a man whom I hold as my enemy. I spit upon all the worldly considerations which pass muster with people like you. No sweeter girl than poor Sally ever breathed the breath of life. Her happiness is more precious to me than words can say. She is sacred to me. And I have just proved it. I have just come from a good woman who will teach her an honest way of earning her bread. Not a breath of scandal shall blow on her. If you or any people like you think I will consent to cast her adrift on the world or consign her to a prison under the name of a home, you little know my nature and my principles. Here, he snatched up the New Testament from the table and shook it at Rufus, here are my principles and I'm not ashamed of them. Rufus took up his hat. 
There's one thing you'll be ashamed of, my son, when you're cool enough to think about it, he said. You'll be ashamed of the words you have spoken to a friend who loves you. I'm not a bit angry myself. You remind me of that time on board the steamer when the quartermaster was going to shoot the bird. You made it up with him, and you'll come to my hotel and make it up with me. And then we'll shake hands and talk about Sally. If it's not taking another liberty, I'll trouble you for a light. He helped himself to a match from the box on the chimney-piece, lit his cigar, and left the room. He had not been gone half an hour before the better nature of Emilius urged him to follow Rufus and make his apologies, but he was too anxious about Sally to leave the cottage until he had seen her first. The tone in which she had answered him when he knocked at her door suggested to his sensitive apprehension that there was something more serious the matter with her than a mere headache. For another hour he waited patiently on the chance that he might hear her moving in her room. Nothing happened. No sound reached his ears except the occasional rolling of carriage wheels on the road outside. His patience began to fail him as the second hour moved on. He went to the door and listened, and still heard nothing. A sudden dread struck him that she might have fainted. He opened the door a few inches and spoke to her. There was no answer. He looked in. The room was empty. He ran into the hall and called to Toff. Was she by any chance downstairs? No. Or out in the garden? No. Master and man looked at each other in silence. Sally was gone. End of Book 8 Chapter 8book eight chapter nine of the fallen leaves this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by rita boutros the fallen leaves by wilkie collins book eight dame nature decides chapter nine Toff was the first who recovered himself. "'Courage, sir,' he said. "'With a little thinking we shall find a way to find her. "'That rude American man who talked with her this morning "'may be the person who has brought this misfortune on us.' Amelius waited to hear no more. There was the chance at least that something might have been said which had induced her to take refuge with Rufus. He ran back to the library to get his hat. Toff followed his master with another suggestion. "'One word more, sir, before you go. If the American men cannot help us, we must be ready to try another way. Permit me to accompany you as far as my wife's shop. I propose that she shall come back here with me and examine poor little Mrs. Bedroom. We will wait, of course, for your return before anything is done. In the meantime, I entreat you not to despair. It is at least possible that the means of discovery may be found in the bedroom." They went out together, taking the first cab that passed them. Amelius proceeded alone to the hotel. Rufus was in his room. "'What's gone wrong?' he asked, the moment Amelius opened the door. "'Shake hands, my son, and smother up that little trouble between us in silence. "'Your face alarms me, it does. What of Sally?' Amelia started at the question. "'Isn't she here?' he asked. Rufus drew back. The mere action said no before he answered in words. "'Have you seen nothing of her? Heard nothing of her?' "'Nothing. Steady now. Meet it like a man and tell me what has happened.' Amelia told him in two words. "'Don't suppose I'm going to break out again as I did this morning,' he went on. "'I'm too wretched and too anxious to be angry.' Only tell me, Rufus, have you said anything to her? Rufus held up his hand. I see what you're driving at. It will be more to the purpose to tell you what she said to me. From first to last, Amelius, I spoke kindly to her, and I did her justice. Give me a minute to rummage my memory. After brief consideration, he carefully repeated the substance of what had passed between Sally and himself during the latter part of the interview between them. "'Have you looked about in her room?' he inquired when he had done. "'There might be a trifling something to help you left behind her there.' 
Emilius told him of Toff's suggestion. They returned together at once to the cottage. Madame Toff was waiting to begin the search. The first discovery was easily made. Sally had taken off one or two little trinkets, presents from Emilius, which she was in the habit of wearing, and had left them wrapped up in paper on the dressing-table. No such thing as a farewell letter was found near them. The examination of the wardrobe came next, and here a startling circumstance revealed itself. Every one of the dresses which Emilius had presented to her was hanging in its place. They were not many, and they had all on previous occasions been passed in review by Toff's wife. She was absolutely certain that the complete number of the dresses was there in the bedroom. Sally must have worn something in place of her new clothes. What had she put on? Looking round the room, Emilius noticed in a corner the box in which he had placed the first new dress that he had purchased for Sally on the morning after they had met. He tried to open the box. It was locked, and the key was not to be found. The ever-ready Toff fetched a skewer from the kitchen and picked the lock in two minutes. On lifting the cover, the box proved to be empty. The one person present who understood what this meant was Emilius. He remembered that Sally had taken her old threadbare clothes away with her in the box when the angry landlady had insisted on his leaving the house. I want to look at them sometimes, the poor girl had said, and think how much better off I am now. In those miserable rags she had fled from the cottage after hearing the cruel truth. He had better have left me where I was, she had said. Cold and hunger and ill-treatment would have laid me at rest by this time. Emilius fell on his knees before the empty box in helpless despair. The conclusion that now forced itself on his mind completely unmanned him. She had gone back, in the old dress, to die under the cold, the hunger, and the horror of the old life. Rufus took his hand and spoke to him kindly. He rallied and dashed the tears from his eyes and rose to his feet. "'I know where to look for her,' was all he said, and I must do it alone. He refused to enter into any explanation or to be assisted by any companion. "'This is my secret and hers,' he answered. "'Go back to your hotel, Rufus, and pray that I may not bring news which will make a wretched man of you for the rest of your life.' With that he left them. In another hour he stood once more on the spot at which he and Sally had met. The wild bustle and uproar of the costermonger's night market no longer rioted round him. The street by daylight was in a state of dreary repose. Slowly pacing up and down from one end to another, he waited with but one hope to sustain him, the hope that she might have taken refuge with the two women who had been her only friends in the dark days of her life. Ignorant of the place in which they lived, he had no choice but to wait for the appearance of one or other of them in the street. He was quiet and resolved. For the rest of the day, and for the whole of the night, if need be, his mind was made up to keep steadfastly on the watch. When he could walk no longer, he obtained rest and refreshment in the cook-shop which he remembered so well, sitting on a stool near the window, from which he could still command a view of the street. The gas-lamps were alight, and the long winter's night was beginning to set in, when he resumed his weary march from end to end of the pavement. As the darkness became complete, his patience was rewarded at last. Passing the door of a pawnbroker's shop, he met one of the women, face to face, walking rapidly with a little parcel under her arm. She recognized him with a cry of joyful surprise. "'Oh, sir, how glad I am to see you, to be sure. You've come to look after Sally, haven't you? Yes, yes, she's safe in our poor place, but in such a dreadful state. Off her head, clean off her head, talks of nothing but you. I'm in the way of his prospects in life. Over and over and over again, she keeps on saying that. Don't be afraid. Jenny's at home taking care of her. She wants to go out hot and wild with a kind of fever on her she wants to go out she asked if it rained the rain may kill me in these ragged clothes she says and then i shan't be in the way of his prospects in life we tried to quiet her by telling her it didn't rain but it was no use she was as eager as ever to go out 
I may get another blow on the bosom, she says, and maybe it will fall on the right place this time. No, there's no fear of the brute who used to beat her. He's in prison. Don't ask to see her just yet, sir. Please don't. I'm afraid you would only make her worse if I took you to her now. I wouldn't dare to risk it. You see, we can't get her to sleep, and we thought of buying something to quiet her at the chemist's. Yes, sir, it would be better to get a doctor to her, but I wasn't going to the doctor. If I must tell you, I was obliged to take the sheets off the bed to raise a little money. I was going to the pawnbroker's. She looked at the parcel under her arm and smiled. I may take the sheets back again, now I've met with you, and there's a good doctor lives close by. I can show you the way to him. Oh, how pale you do look. Are you very much tired? It's only a little way to the doctor. I've got an arm at your service. But you mightn't like to be seen waiting with such a person as me. Mentally and physically, Emilius was completely prostrated. The woman's melancholy narrative had overwhelmed him. He could neither speak nor act. He mechanically put his purse in her hand and went with her to the house of the nearest medical man. The doctor was at home, mixing drugs in his little surgery. After one sharp look at Emilius, he ran into a back parlor and returned with a glass of spirits. "'Drink this, sir,' he said, "'unless you want to find yourself on the floor in a fainting fit, and don't presume again on your youth and strength to treat your heart as if it were made of cast iron.' He signed to Emilius to sit down and rest himself, and turned to the woman to hear what was wanted of him. After a few questions, he said she might go, promising to follow her in a few minutes, when the gentleman would be sufficiently recovered to accompany him. "'Well, sir, are you beginning to feel like yourself again?' He was mixing a composing draught while he addressed Emilius in those terms. "'You may trust that poor wretch who has just left us to take care of the sick girl,' he went on, in the quaintly familiar manner which seemed to be habitual with him. "'I don't ask how you got into her company. It's no business of mine. But I am pretty well acquainted with the people in my neighborhood, and I can tell you one thing, in case you're anxious. The woman who brought you here, barring the one misfortune of her life, is as good a creature as ever breathed, and the other one who lives with her is the same. When I think of what they're exposed to, well, I take to my pipe and compose my mind in that way. My early days were all passed as a ship's surgeon. I could get them both respectable employment in Australia if I only had the money to fit them out. They'll die in the hospital like the rest if something isn't done for them. In my hopeful moments, I sometimes think of a subscription. What do you say? Will you put down a few shillings to set the example? I will do more than that, Emilius answered. I have reasons for wishing to befriend both those two poor women, and I will gladly engage to find the outfit. The familiar old doctor held out his hand over the counter. You're a good fellow, if ever there was one yet, he burst out. I can show references which will satisfy you that I am not a rogue. In the meantime, let's see what is the matter with this little girl. You can tell me about her as we go along. He put his bottle of medicine in his pocket and his arm in the arm of Emilius, and so led the way out. When they reached the wretched lodging house in which the women lived, he suggested that his companion would do well to wait at the door. I'm used to sad sights. It would only distress you to see the place. I won't keep you long waiting. He was as good as his word. In little more than ten minutes, he joined Emilius again in the street. Don't alarm yourself, he said. The case is not so serious as it looks. The poor child is suffering under a severe shock to the brain and nervous system caused by that sudden and violent distress you hinted at. My medicine will give her the one thing she wants to begin with, a good night's sleep. Amelius asked when she would be well enough to see him. Ah, my young friend, it's not so easy to say just yet. I could answer you to better purpose tomorrow. Won't that do? Must I venture on a rash opinion? She ought to be composed enough to see you in three or four days, and when that time comes, it's my belief you will do more than I can do to set her right again. Emilius was relieved, but not quite satisfied yet. He inquired if it was not possible to remove her from that miserable place. 
quite impossible without doing her serious injury they have got money to go on with and i have told you already she will be well taken care of i will look after her myself to-morrow morning go home and get to bed and eat a bit of supper first and make your mind easy come to my house at twelve o'clock noon and you will find me ready with my references and my report of the patient surgeon pinfold blackacre buildings there's the address good night end of book eight chapter nine book eight chapter ten of the fallen leaves this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Fallen Leaves by Wilkie Collins. Book 8. Dame Nature Decides. Chapter 10. After Amelius had left him, Rufus remembered his promise to communicate with Regina by telegraph. With his strict regard for truth, it was no easy matter to decide on what message he should send. To inspire Regina, if possible, with his own unshaken belief in the good faith of Amelius, appeared on reflection to be all that he could honestly do under present circumstances. With an anxious and foreboding mind, he dispatched his telegram to Paris in these terms, be patient for a while and do justice to A. He deserves it. Having completed his business at the telegraph office, Rufus went next to pay his visit to Mrs. Payson. The good lady received him with a grave face and a distant manner, in startling contrast to the customary warmth of her welcome. I used to think you were a man in a thousand, she began abruptly, and I find you are no better than the rest of them. If you have come to speak to me about that blackguard young socialist, understand, if you please, that I am not so easily imposed upon as Miss Regina. I have done my duty. I have opened her eyes to the truth, poor thing. Ah, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Rufus kept his temper with his habitual self-command. It's possible you may be right, he said quietly, but the biggest rascal living has a claim to an explanation when a lady puzzles him. Have you any particular objection, old friend, to tell me what you mean? The explanation was not of a nature to set his mind at ease. Regina had written, by the mail which took Rufus to England, repeating to Mrs. Payson what had passed at the interview in the Champs-Élysées, and appealing to her sympathy for information and advice. Receiving the letter that morning, Mrs. Payson, acting on her own generous and compassionate impulses, had already answered it and sent it to the post. Her experience of the unfortunate persons received at the home was far from inclining her to believe in the innocence of a runaway girl, placed under circumstances of temptation. As an act of justice towards Regina, she enclosed to her the letter in which Amelius had acknowledged that Sally had passed the night under his roof. I believe I am only telling you the shameful truth, Mrs. Payson had written, when I add that the girl has been an inmate of Mr. Goldenheart's cottage ever since. If you can reconcile this disgraceful state of things with Mr. Rufus Dingwell's assertion of his friend's fidelity to his marriage engagement, I have no right and no wish to make any attempt to alter your opinion." but you have asked for my advice, and I must not shrink from giving it. I am bound, as an honest woman, to tell you that your uncle's resolution to break off the engagement represents the course that I should have taken myself if a daughter of my own had been placed in your painful and humiliating position. There was still ample time to modify this strong expression of opinion by the day's post. Rufus appealed vainly to Mrs. Payson to reconsider the conclusion at which she had arrived. 
a more charitable and considerate woman within the limits of her own daily routine it would not be possible to find but the largeness of mind which having long and trustworthy experience of a rule can nevertheless understand that other minds may have equal experience of the exception to the rule was one of the qualities which had not been included in the moral composition of mrs payson she held firmly to her own narrowly conscientious sense of her duty stimulated by a natural indignation against amelius who had bitterly disappointed her against rufus who had not scrupled to take up his defence the two old friends parted in coldness for the first time in their lives rufus returned to his hotel to wait there for news from amelius the day passed and the one visitor who enlivened his solitude was an american friend and correspondent connected with the agency which managed his affairs in england the errand of this gentleman was to give his client the soundest and speediest advice relating to the investment of money having indicated the safe and solid speculation the visitor added a warning word relating to the plausible and dangerous investments of the day for instance he said there's that bank started by farnaby no need to warn me against farnaby rufus interposed i wouldn't take shares in his bank if he made me a present of them the american friend looked surprised surely he exclaimed you can't have heard the news already they don't even know it yet on the stock exchange rufus explained that he had only spoken under the influence of personal prejudice against mr farnaby what's in the wind now he asked he was confidentially informed that a coming storm was in the wind in other words that a serious discovery had been made at the bank some time since the directors had advanced a large sum of money to a man in trade under mr farnaby's own guarantee the man had just died and examination of his affairs showed that he had only received a few hundred pounds on condition of holding his tongue the bulk of the money had been traced to mr farnaby himself and had all been swallowed up by his newspaper his patent medicine and his other rotten speculations apart from his own proper business you may not know it the american friend concluded but the fact is farnaby rose from the dregs his bankruptcy is only a question of time he will drop back to the dregs and quite possibly make his appearance to answer a criminal charge in a court of law i hear that melton whose credit has held up the bank lately is off to see his friend in paris they say farnaby's niece is a handsome girl and melton is sweet on her awkward for melton rufus listened attentively in signing the order for his investments he privately decided to stir no further for the present in the matter of his young friend's marriage engagement for the rest of the day and evening he still waited for amelius and waited in vain it was drawing near to midnight when toff made his appearance with a message from his master amelius had discovered sally and had returned in such a state of fatigue that he was only fit to take some refreshment and to go to his bed he would be away from home again on the next morning but he hoped to call at the hotel in the course of the day observing toff's face with grave and steady scrutiny rufus tried to extract some further information from him but the old frenchman stood on his dignity in a state of immovable reserve you took me by the shoulder this morning sir and spun me round he said i do not desire to be treated a second time like a teetotum for the rest it is not my habit to intrude myself into my master's secrets it's not my habit rufus coolly rejoined to bear malice i beg to apologize sincerely sir for treating you like a teetotum and i offer you my hand toff had got as far as the door he instantly returned with the dignity which a frenchman can always command in the serious emergencies of his life you appeal to my heart and my honor sir he said i bury the events of the morning in oblivion and i do myself the honor of taking your hand 
as the door closed on him rufus smiled grimly you're not in the habit of intruding yourself into your master's secrets he repeated if emilius reads your face as i read it he'll look over his shoulder when he goes out to-morrow and ten to one he'll see you behind him in the distance Late on the next day, Emilius presented himself at the hotel. In speaking of Sally, he was unusually reserved, merely saying that she was ill and under medical care, and then changing the subject. Struck by the depressed and anxious expression of his face, Rufus asked if he had heard from Regina. No. A longer time than usual had passed since Regina had written to him. I don't understand it, he said sadly. I suppose you didn't see anything of her in Paris. Rufus had kept his promise not to mention Regina's name in Sally's presence, but it was impossible for him to look at Emilius without plainly answering the question put to him, for the sake of the friend whom he loved. I'm afraid there's trouble coming to you, my son, from that quarter. With those warning words, he described all that had passed between Regina and himself. "'Some unknown enemy of yours has spoken against you to her uncle,' he concluded. "'I suppose you have made enemies, my poor old boy, since you have been in London.' "'I know the man,' Emilius answered. "'He wanted to marry Regina before I met with her. His name is Melton.' Rufus started. I heard only yesterday he was in Paris with Farnaby, and that's not the worst of it, Emilius. There's another of them making mischief, a good friend of mine, who has shown a twist in her temper that has taken me by surprise after twenty years' experience of her. I reckon there's a drop of malice in the composition of the best woman that ever lived, and the men only discover it when another woman steps in and stirs it up. Wait a bit, he went on, when he had related the result of his visit to Mrs. Payson. I have telegraphed to Miss Regina to be patient and to trust you. Don't you write to defend yourself till you hear how you stand in her estimation after my message. Tomorrow's post may tell. Tomorrow's post did tell. Two letters reached Emilius from Paris, one from Mr. Farnaby, curt and insolent, breaking off the marriage engagement, the other from Regina, expressed with great severity of language. Her weak nature, like all weak natures, ran easily into extremes, and, once roused into asserting itself, took refuge in violence as a shy person takes refuge in audacity. Only a woman of larger and firmer mind would have written of her wrongs in a more just and more moderate tone. Regina began without any preliminary form of address. She had no heart to upbraid Amelius and no wish to speak of what she was suffering to a man who had but too plainly shown that he had no respect for himself and neither love nor pity even for her. In justice to herself, she released him from his promise and returned his letters and his presents. Her own letters might be sent in a sealed packet addressed to her at her uncle's place of business in London. She would pray that he might be brought to a sense of the sin that he had committed, and that he might yet live to be a worthy and a happy man. For the rest, her decision was irrevocable. His own letter to Mrs. Payson condemned him, and the testimony of an old and honored friend of her uncle proved that his wickedness was no mere act of impulse, but a deliberate course of infamy and falsehood continued over many weeks. From the moment when she made that discovery, he was a stranger to her, and she now bade him farewell. "'Have you written to her?' Rufus asked when he had seen the letters." Amelius reddened with indignation. He was not aware of it himself, but his look and manner plainly revealed that Regina had lost her last hold on him. Her letter had inflicted an insult, not a wound. He was outraged and revolted. The deeper and gentler feelings, the emotions of a grieved and humiliated lover, had been killed in him by her stern words of dismissal and farewell. 
Do you think I would allow myself to be treated in that way without a word of protest, he said to Rufus? I have written, refusing to take back my promise. I declare on my word of honor that I have been faithful to you and to my engagement. That was how I put it. And I scorn the vile construction which your uncle and his friend have placed upon an act of Christian mercy on my part. I wrote more tenderly before I finished my letter, feeling for her distress, and being anxious above all things not to add to it. We shall see if she has love enough left for me to trust my faith and honor, instead of trusting false appearances. I will give her time. Rufus considerately abstained from expressing any opinion. He waited until the morning when a reply might be expected from Paris, and then he called at the cottage. Without a word of comment, Emilius put a letter into his friend's hand. It was his own letter to Regina returned to him. On the back of it there was a line in Mr. Farnaby's handwriting. If you send any more letters, they will be burnt unopened. In those insolent terms the wretch wrote, with bankruptcy and exposure hanging over his head. Rufus spoke plainly upon this. "'There's an end of it now,' he said. "'That girl would never have made the right wife for you, Amelius. "'You're well out of it. "'Forget that you ever knew these people, and let us talk of something else. "'How is Sally?' "'At that ill-timed inquiry, Amelius showed his temper again. "'He was in a state of nervous irritability, which made him apt to take offence, "'where no offence was intended.' "'Oh, you needn't be alarmed,' he answered petulantly. "'There's no fear of the poor child coming back to live with me. "'She is still under the doctor's care.' "'Rufus passed over the angry reply without notice "'and patted him on the shoulder. "'I spoke of the girl,' he said, "'because I wanted to help her, "'and I can help her if you will let me. "'Before long, my son, "'I shall be going back to the United States. "'I wish you would go with me.' "'And desert Sally?' cried Emilius. "'Nothing of the sort. Before we go, I'll see that Sally is provided for to your satisfaction. Will you think of it to please me?' Emilius relented. "'Anything to please you,' he said. Rufus noticed his hat and gloves on the table, and left him without saying more. "'The trouble with Emilius,' he thought, as he closed the cottage gate, "'is not over yet.' End of Book 8, Chapter 10《Book 8, Chapter 11 of The Fallen Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Fallen Leaves by Wilkie Collins. Book 8. Dame Nature Decides. Chapter 11. The day on which worthy old Surgeon Pinfold had predicted that Sally would be in a fair way of recovery had come and gone, and still the medical report to Emilius was the same. You must be patient, sir. She is not well enough to see you yet. Toff, watching his young master anxiously, was alarmed by the steadily progressive change in him for the worse, which showed itself at this time. Now sad and silent, and now again bitter and irritable, he had deteriorated physically as well as morally, until he really looked like the shadow of his former self. He never exchanged a word with his faithful old servant except when he said mechanically, "'Good morning,' or "'Good night.' Toff could endure it no longer. At the risk of being roughly misinterpreted, he followed his own kindly impulse and spoke. "'May I own to you, sir,' he said, with perfect gentleness and respect, "'that I am indeed heartily sorry to see you so ill.' Emilius looked up at him sharply. "'You servants always make a fuss about trifles. I am a little out of sorts, and I want a change, that's all.' Perhaps I may go to America. You won't like that. I shan't complain if you look out for another situation. The tears came into the old man's eyes. Never, he answered fervently. My last service, sir, if you send me away, shall be my dearly loved service here. 
all that was most tender in the nature of Emilius was touched to the quick. "'Forgive me, Toff,' he said. "'I am lonely and wretched, and more anxious about Sally than words can tell. There can be no change in my life until my mind is easy about that poor little girl. But if it does end in my going to America, you shall go with me. I wouldn't lose you, my good friend, for the world.' Toff still remained in the room, as if he had something left to say. Entirely ignorant of the marriage engagement between Emilius and Regina, and of the rupture in which it had ended, he vaguely suspected nevertheless that his master might have fallen into an entanglement with some lady unknown. The opportunity of putting the question was now before him. He risked it in a studiously modest form. "'Are you going to America to be married, sir?' Emilius eyed him with a momentary suspicion. "'What has put that in your head?' he asked. "'I don't know, sir,' Toff answered humbly, "'unless it was my own vivid imagination. "'Would there be anything very wonderful in a gentleman of your age and appearance "'conducting some charming person to the altar?' Emilius was conquered once more. He smiled faintly. "'Enough of your nonsense, Toff. I shall never be married. Understand that.' Toff's withered old face brightened slyly. He turned away to withdraw, hesitated, and suddenly went back to his master. "'Have you any occasion for my services, sir, for an hour or two? he asked. "'No. Be back before I go out myself. Be back at three o'clock.' "'Thank you, sir. My little boy is below. If you want anything in my absence.' The little boy, dutifully attending Toff to the gate, observed with grave surprise that his father snapped his fingers gaily at starting, and hummed the first bars of the Marseillaise. "'Something is going to happen,' said Toff's boy on his way back to the house. "'From the Regent's Park to Blackacre Buildings is almost a journey from one end of London to the other.' Assisted for part of the way by an omnibus, Toff made the journey and arrived at the residence of Surgeon Pinfold with the easy confidence of a man who knew thoroughly well where he was going and what he was about. The sagacity of Rufus had correctly penetrated his intentions. He had privately followed his master and had introduced himself to the notice of the surgeon with a mixture of motives in which pure devotion to the interests of Emilius played the chief part. His experience of the world told him that Sally's departure was only the beginning of more trouble to come. "'What is the use of me to my master?' he had argued, "'except to spare him trouble in spite of himself.' Surgeon Pinfold was prescribing for a row of sick people seated before him on a bench. "'You're not ill, are you?' he said sharply to Toff. "'Very well, then. Go into the parlour and wait.' The patients being dismissed, Toff attempted to explain the object of his visit— but the old naval surgeon insisted on clearing the ground by means of a plain question first. Has your master sent you here, or is this another private interview like the last? It is all that is most private, Toff answered. My poor master is wasting away in unrelieved wretchedness and suspense. Something must be done for him. Oh, dear and good sir, help me in this most miserable state of things. Tell me the truth about Miss Sally. Old Pinfold put his hands in his pockets and leaned against the parlor wall, looking at the Frenchman with a complicated expression in which genuine sympathy mingled oddly with a quaint sense of amusement. "'You're a worthy chap,' he said, "'and you shall have the truth. "'I have been obliged to deceive your master "'about this troublesome young Sally. "'I have stuck to it that she is too ill to see him "'or to answer his letters. "'Both lies. "'There is nothing the matter with her now "'but a disease that I can't cure, "'the disease of a troubled mind. "'She's got it into her head "'that she has everlastingly degraded herself "'in his estimation,' by leaving him and coming here. It's no use telling her, what, mind you, is perfectly true, that she was all but out of her senses and not in the least responsible for what she did at the time when she did it. She holds to her own opinion, nevertheless. 
what can he think of me but that i have gone back willingly to the disgrace of my old life i should throw myself out of the window if he came into the room that's how she answers me and what makes matters worse still she's breaking her heart about him all the time the poor wretch is so eager for any little word of news about his health and his doings that it's downright pitiable to see her i don't think her fevered little brain will bear it much longer and hang me if i can tell what to do next to set things right the two women her friends have no sort of influence over her when i saw her this morning she was ungrateful enough to say why didn't you let me die how your master got among these unfortunate people is more than i know and is no business of mine i only wish he had been a different sort of man before i knew him as well as i know him now i predicted like a fool that he would be just the person to help us in managing the girl i have altered my opinion he's such a glorious fellow so impulsive and so tender-hearted that he would be certain in her present excited state to do her more harm than good do you know if he is going to be married toff listening thus far in silent distress suddenly looked up why do you ask me sir it's an idle question i dare say old pinfold remarked sally persists in telling us she's in the way of his prospects in life and it's got somehow into her perverse little head that his prospects in life mean his marriage and she's in the way of that hello are you going already i want to go to miss sally sir i believe i can say something to comfort her do you think she will see me are you the man who has got the nickname of toff she sometimes talks about toff yes sir yes i am theophile le blonde otherwise toff where can i find her sergeant pinfold rang a bell my errand boy is going past the house to deliver some medicine he answered it's a poor place but you'll find it neat and nice enough thanks to your good master he's helping the two women to begin life again out of this country and while they're waiting their turn to get a passage they've taken an extra room and hired some decent furniture by your master's own wish oh here's the boy he'll show you the way one word before you go what do you think of saying to sally i shall tell her for one thing sir that my master is miserable for want of her sergeant pinfold shook his head that won't take you very far on the way to persuading her you will make her miserable too and there's about all you will get by it toff lifted his indicative forefinger to the side of his nose suppose i tell her something else sir suppose i tell her my master is not going to be married to anybody she won't believe you know anything about it she will believe for this reason said toff gravely i put the question to my master before i came here and i have it from his own lips that there is no young lady in the way and that he is not positively not going to be married if i tell miss sally this sir how do you say it will end will you bet me a shilling it has no effect on her i won't bet a farthing follow the boy and tell young sally i have sent her a better doctor than i am while toff was on his way to sally toff's boy was disturbing emilius by the announcement of a visitor the card sent in bore this inscription brother balkwell from tadmor emilius looked at the card and ran into the hall to receive the visitor with both hands held out in hearty welcome oh i am so glad to see you he cried come in and tell me all about tadmor brother balkwell acknowledged the enthusiastic reception offered to him by a stare of grim surprise he was a dry hard old man with a scrubby white beard a narrow wrinkled forehead and an obstinate lipless mouth fitted neither by age nor temperament to be the intimate friend of any of his younger brethren among the community but at that saddest time of his life the heart of emilius warmed to any one who reminded him of his tranquil and happy days at tadmor even this frozen old socialist now appeared to him for the first time under the borrowed aspect of a welcome friend 
Brother Bockwell took the chair offered to him and opened the proceedings in solemn silence by looking at his watch. Twenty-five minutes past two, he said to himself, and put the watch back again. Are you pressed for time? Emilius asked. Much may be done in ten minutes, Brother Balkwell answered, in a Scotch accent which had survived the test of half a lifetime in America. I would have you know I am in England on a mission from the community, with a list of twenty-seven persons in all, whom I am appointed to confer with on matters of varying importance. Yours, friend Emilius, is a matter of minor importance. I can give you ten minutes." He opened a big black pocket-book stuffed with a mass of letters, and, placing two of them on the table before him, addressed Emilius as if he was making a speech at a public meeting. "'I have to request your attention to certain proceedings of the Council at Tadmore, bearing date the 3rd of December last, and referring to a person under sentence of temporary separation from the community, along with yourself—' "'Melicent!' Emilius exclaimed." we have no time for interruptions brother bockwell remarked the person is sister mellicent and the business before the council was to consider a letter under her signature received december second said letter he proceeded taking up one of his papers is abridged as follows by the secretary to the council in substance the writer states first that the married sister under whose protection she has been living at new york is about to settle in england with her husband appointed to manage the branch of his business established in london second that she meaning sister mellicent has serious reasons for not accompanying her relatives to england and has no other friends to take charge of her welfare if she remains in new york third that she appeals to the mercy of the council under these circumstances to accept the expression of her sincere repentance for the offence of violating a rule and to permit a friendless and penitent creature to return to the only home left to her her home at tadmore no friend emilius we have no time for expressions of sympathy the first half of the ten minutes has nearly expired i have further to notify you that the question was put to the vote in this form is it consistent with the serious responsibility which rests on the council to consider the remission of any sentence justly pronounced under the book of rules the result was very remarkable the votes for and against being equally divided in this event as you know our laws provide that the decision rests with the elder brother who gave his vote thereupon for considering the remission of the sentence and moved the next resolution that the sentence be remitted accordingly carried by a small majority whereupon sister mellicent was received again at tadmore ah the dear old elder brother cried emilius always on the side of mercy brother balkwell held up his hand in protest you seem to have no idea he said of the value of time do be quiet as travelling representative of the council i am further instructed to say that the sentence pronounced against yourself stands duly remitted in consequence of the remission of the sentence against sister mellicent you likewise are free to return to tadmor at your own will and pleasure but attend to what is coming friend emilius the council holds to its resolution that your choice between us and the world shall be absolutely unbiased in the fear of exercising even an indirect influence we have purposely abstained from corresponding with you with the same motive we now say that if you do return to us it must be with no interference on our part we inform you of an event that has happened in your absence and we do no more he paused and looked again at his watch time proverbially works wonders time closed his lips Amelius replied with a heavy heart. The message from the council had recalled him from the remembrance of Melisande to the sense of his own position. My experience of the world has been a very hard one, he said. I would gladly go back to Tadmore this very day, but for one consideration. He hesitated. The image of Sally was before him. The tears rose in his eyes. He said no more brother bockwell driven hard by time got on his legs and handed to emilius the second of the two papers which he had taken out of his pocket-book 
here is a purely informal document he said being a few lines from sister mellicent which i was charged to deliver to you be pleased to read it as quickly as you can and tell me if there is any reply there was not much to read the good people here emilius have forgiven me and let me return to them i am living happily now dear in my remembrances of you i take the walks that we once took together and sometimes i go out in the boat on the lake and think of the time when i told you my sad story your poor little pet creatures are under my care the dog and the fawn and the birds all well and waiting for you with me my belief that you will come back to me remains the same unshaken belief that it has been from the first once more i say it you will find me the first to welcome you when your spirits are sinking under the burden of life and your heart turns again to the friends of your early days until that time comes think of me now and then good-bye i am waiting said brother balkwell taking his hat in his hand amelius answered with an effort thank her kindly in my name he said that is all his head drooped while he spoke he fell into thought as if he had been alone in the room but the emissary from tadmor warned by the minute hand on the watch recalled his attention to passing events you would do me a kindness said brother balkwell producing a list of names and addresses if you could put me in the way of finding the person named eighth from the top it's getting on towards twenty minutes to three the address thus pointed out was at no great distance on the northern side of the regent's park emilius still silent and thoughtful acted willingly as a guide please thank the council for their kindness to me he said when they reached their destination brother balkwell looked at friend emilius with a calm inquiring eye i think you'll end in coming back to us he said i'll take the opportunity when i see you at tadmor of making a few needful remarks on the value of time Amelius went back to the cottage to see if Toff had returned in his absence before he paid his daily visit to Surgeon Pinfold. He called down the kitchen stairs. Are you there, Toff? And Toff answered briskly, At your service, sir. The sky had become cloudy and threatened rain. Not finding his umbrella in the hall, Amelius went into the library to look for it. As he closed the door behind him, Toff and his boy appeared on the kitchen stairs, both walking on tiptoe, and both evidently on the watch for something. Emilius found his umbrella, but it was characteristic of the melancholy change in him that he dropped languidly into the nearest chair, instead of going out at once with the easy activity of happier days. Sally was in his mind again. He was rousing his resolution to set the doctor's commands at defiance and to insist on seeing her, come what might of it. He suddenly looked up. A slight sound had startled him. It was a faint rustling sound, and it came from the sadly silent room which had once been Sally's. He listened and heard it again. He sprang to his feet. His heart beat wildly. He opened the door of the room. She was there. Her hands were clasped over her fast-heaving breast. She was powerless to look at him, powerless to speak to him, powerless to move towards him until he opened his arms to her. Then all the love and all the sorrow in the tender little heart flowed outward to him in a low murmuring cry. She hid her blushing face on his bosom. The rosy color softly tinged her neck, the unspoken confession of all she feared and all she hoped. It was a time beyond words. They were silent in each other's arms. But under them, on the floor below, the stillness in the cottage was merrily broken by an outburst of dance music, with a rhythmical thump-thump of feet, keeping time to the cheerful tune. Toff was playing his fiddle, and Toff's boy was dancing to his father's music. End of Book 8 Chapter 11